Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Madison Terman and others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, 2nd Edition. Lewis M. Terman, assisted by Bird T. Baldwin. Edith Bronson, James C. DeVos, Florence Fuller, Florence L. Goodenow, Truman Lee Kelly, Margaret Lima, Helen Marshall, Albert H. Moore, A. S. Robenheimer, G. M. Rooch, Raymond L. Willoughby, Jenner Benson Wyman, Dorothy Hazeltine Yates, Stanford University Press, Stanford University, California, 1926. Preface It should go without saying that a nation's resource of intellectual talent are among the most precious it will ever have. The origin of genius, the natural laws of its development, and the environmental influences by which it may be affected for good or ill are scientific problems of almost unequaled importance for human welfare. Many philosophers and scientists, from Plato to Aristotle to the present day, have recognized the truth of this. A number of factors, however, have worked together to postpone until our own time the inauguration of research in this field. Among these may be mentioned the following. 1. The influence of current beliefs, partaking of the nature of superstitions, regarding the essential nature of the great man, who has commonly been regarded by the masses as qualitatively set off from the rest of mankind, the product of supernatural causes, and moved by forces which are not to be explained by the natural laws of human behaviour. 2. The widespread belief, highly less superstitious in its origin, that intellectual precocity is pathological. 3. The vigorous growth of democratic sentiment in Western Europe and America during the last few hundred years, which has necessarily tended to encourage an attitude unfavourable to a just appreciation of native individual differences in human endowment. And 4 the tidy birth of the biological sciences, particularly genetics, psychology, and education. The publication of Galton's Hereditary Genius in 1869 marks the beginning of a new era. Since that date, the interest in individual differences and their causes has grown until these promise to become national issues on such problems as selective immigration, the evils of differential birth rates, special training for the gifted, and the economic reward of creative talent, both scientific and popular interest along these lines, has been greatly intensified by recent developments in the psychological methods of measuring intelligence, which have furnished conclusive proof that native differences in endowment are a universal phenomenon, and that it is possible to evaluate them. Educators, especially, have been quick to appreciate the practical significance of such differences, first for the training of backward and defective children, and more recently, for the education of the gifted. Twice in the last four years, the National Society for the Study of Education has devoted a yearbook to the gifted child. The problems of genius are chiefly three. Its nature, its origin, and its cultivation. This volume is concerned primarily with the nature of genius, insofar as this is indicated by the mental and physical traits of intellectually superior children. On the origin of such children, it is only a few facts or rather general nature to present, for it has thus far not been possible to make a thoroughgoing study of the hereditary of our subjects. On the education of the gifted, it is hoped that the data presented throw a considerable light, since educational procedure to be sound must always be based upon analysis of the raw material with which it deals. Before the present investigation was undertaken, no large group of gifted children had ever been studied. A positive knowledge of the physical, mental, and personality traits of such children has been extremely limited, and until this knowledge is available, there can be no basis for intelligent educational procedure. It is hardly too much to say that this field at present is the darkest Africa of education. To what extent genius can be created or destroyed by right or wrong training is entirely unknown. The purpose of the present investigation has been, therefore, 
to determine in what respects the typical gifted child differs from the typical child of normal mentality. Data have been collected on more than 1,400 children, each of whom ranks well within the top 1% of the unselected school population of corresponding age. The greater part of this report, however, is devoted to 643 such children, who constitute a typical group, for whom the data at hand are most extensive. Less extensive material was reported for a second group of 309 subjects, chapter 19, making a total, in round numbers, of nearly 1,000 gifted subjects for whom data have been analysed. On many points, control data have been secured for 600 to 800 unselected children. The aim has been to collect, so far as possible, information of objective nature. Although it has not seemed wise to reject, altogether, methods subject to the influence of the personal equation. In the main, however, the conclusions are based upon well-defined experimental procedures which can be repeated ad libitum for purposes of verification or refutation. Whatever erroneous conclusions have been drawn from the data at hand, it would be vain to hope that such have been altogether avoided should in time be corrected. To Miss Florence Goodenell who served for one year as chief field assistant and for two years as chief research assistant, the author's indebtedness is very great. Also to Professor Truman Lee Kelly for his assistance in statistical treatment of data. To the entire staff, whose names will be found on the title page of this book, the author expresses his deep obligations. Last, but far from least, he would express his gratitude and thanks for the hearty spirit of cooperation which has been almost universally shown by the parents, teachers, and school officials. But for their willing sacrifices of time and labour in the collection of data, the investigation would have been entirely impossible. In Volume 2, Dr. Catherine M. Cox sets forth the results of a parallel study of the early mental traits of 300 geniuses. It is believed that the two volumes will yield many interesting and instructive comparisons. Two other publications should be mentioned which supplement these studies. They are 1. Children's Reading, A Guide for Parents and Teachers, by Lewis M. Terman and Margaret Lima, Appleton, 1925. 2. An Experimental Study of Some of the Behavioural Traits of the Potentially Delinquent Boy, by Dr. A. S. Robenheimer, Psychological Monographs, 1925. These, like the present volumes, were made possible by appropriations from the Commonwealth Fund. Lewis M. Terman, Stanford University, January 15, 1925. Preface to the Second Edition It was hardly expected that the first edition of this study would be exhausted within a year and a half of its publication. That a second edition is called for at this time is encouraging evidence of a widespread and growing interest in the educational and social problems relating to the conservation of human talent. I am glad to avail myself of this opportunity to express my appreciation of the reception which Volume 1 has been accorded, and of the interest which has been shown in the projected series as a whole. The most important changes which have been made in this edition have to do with the interpretation of data presented in Chapter 6 on the size of families from which our gifted children come. In the first edition, unfortunately, the treatment on this point was at fault because of neglect to take account of childless marriages and of celibacy. The result was a material overestimate of the fertility of our gifted families. The revised treatment shows that the fertility index of the stratum of the California population with which we are here concerned has decreased by 50% within a single generation and that it is at present far below the figure which will permit the maintenance of the stock. Throughout the text, numerous minor changes have been made, chiefly of typographical nature. I am indebted to the reorganized Stanford University Press for many such typographical rearrangements which have improved the appearance of the book. Lewis M. Terman, Stanford University, December 1st, 1926. End of preface. Section 1 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Mazin Terman. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information on to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children Chapter 1 History and Description of the Investigation Preliminary Exploration This research may be said to have had its beginning during the years of the writer's graduate study, 1902 to 1905. He first became interested in the psychology of genius in a study of leadership which he made in 1902 to 1903 under the direction of Professor E. H. Lindley of Indiana University. While a student at Clark University, he reviewed in 1903 to 1904 the medical psychological literature on precocious children, and the following year carried out as a doctor's dissertation an experimental study of some of the mental processes of seven bright and seven dull boys. However slight the positive contribution of these studies, they had at least introduced their author to the literature on the psychology of genius and gave a keen realisation of the fact that the field was a promising one for experimental investigation. When in 1910 it became possible for the writer to return to the problem, the progress which Binet and others had made in the field of mentality testing had created an entirely new situation. For certain ages, at least, it was at last possible to determine with some degree of approximation the brightness of a given child, and compared with that of unselected children of his own age. The importance of Binet's work for later studies of intelligence can hardly be overestimated. It has not yet received, and possibly may never receive, from psychologists the appreciation which it deserves. Critical ability, unfortunately, is far more common than ability to create. And to the critical psychologists, the imperfections and crudities of Binet's methods, both in their practical and their theoretical aspects, have often been more evident than their remarkable originality. More than anyone else, it was Binet who taught us where to search among mental functions for significant intellectual differences. It was he who gave us our first successive intelligence scale and demonstrated the actuality of an age development through successive hierarchies of intelligences. That the term mental age, which resulted from the latter concept, has often been misinterpreted and misused, does not detract from the importance of his contribution. The fact is that, previous to the publication of Binet's 1908 scale, the significance of age differences in intelligence was very little understood. Psychologists were not aware of the extraordinary and detailed similarity that may exist between a dull child of 12 years and a normal average child of 8. No one recognised the significance for future mental development of a given degree of retardation or acceleration. As one who had worked experimentally upon the diagnosis of intellectual differences in the pre-scale period, the present writer had perhaps more reason than most psychologists to appreciate the value of Binet's contribution. He is willing to admit that after spending four or five hours a day for several months in administering an extended series of well-selected intelligence tests individually to 14 boys, he was unable, notwithstanding the large individual differences in performance which these tests clearly revealed, to render a judgment as to the prognostic significance of the differences found. By the Binet scale, it would have been possible to make a more meaningful diagnosis after a one-hour test of each child, and it would now even be possible to do so after a single hour spent in testing the 14 boys by a group test. The advance is due, one, to the demonstrated validity of the concept of mental retardation and mental acceleration, and two, to the convenient and readily comprehensible method suggested by Binet for evaluating degrees of retardation and acceleration in terms of normal mental age units. Previous to 1908, it was impossible for any psychologist, after devoting any amount of time to intelligence tests of 10 or 20 children of different ages, to make a valid comparison of the intellectual abilities found. This is now possible for even a well-trained normal school graduate. The value of the Binet method in the identification of the intellectually gifted became immediately evident to the writer when Mr. H. G. Childs he made trial of the 1908 scale. It was obvious that children who showed marked acceleration in mental age were, 
by any reasonable criterion brighter than children who tested at or below the chronological age. A little later, Stern suggested looking toward the use of an intelligence ratio or quotient, refined still further the method of Binet, and made possible more accurate comparisons of children of different ages. In 1911, more or less systematic work was begun at Stanford University in the collection of data on children who had made exceptionally high scores in a mental test. In 1913 and 1914, three schools in San Francisco were sifted for bright children, and in 1915 certain data were published on 31 cases testing above 125 intelligence quotient, IQ. Ratings on several traits were secured from the teachers, who also filled out a brief information schedule for each child. Some of the results of this explorative study were out of line with the writer's expectations, and a contradiction to earlier views which he had published on the supposed evils of precocity. It was obvious that these children did not, as a group, possess the traits which had been popularly supposed to characterize intellectually precocious children, such as sickliness, eccentricity, one-sidedness, and lack of social adaptability. In passing, it may be noted that one of the bright children tested in 1911 has taken his PhD degree and is, 1924, an instructor in a great western university. That another has just completed his work for the degree of SCD, and that another is studying in the universities of Europe. In 1916, the methods used were considerably revised. The teacher's information schedule was enlarged. A similar information schedule was prepared for the parent to fill out, and ratings on 20 traits were secured both from parents and from teachers. With the assistance of Margaret Hopwood Hubbard, data were taken on 59 cases, most of whom had an intelligence quotient above 140. The main results of this study have been published elsewhere and need not be summarised here. The writer's tentative conclusions of 1915 were fully supported. The establishment by Stanford University of a research fellowship for the study of gifted children in 1919 was the occasion for further revision of method and stimulus to renew search for cases. The information schedules were materially improved and interest blank was arranged for the child to fill out. By the spring of 1921, approximately 150 cases testing for the most part above 140 IQ had been located, and for 121, considerable supplementary data had been secured. The results for these 121 cases have not been published, but it may be stated that they suggested the following tentative conclusions. 1. There is probably a somewhat higher incidence of intellectual superiority among boys than among girls. 2. In physical growth and general health, gifted children as a group excel unselected children of the same age. 3. Gifted children who attend school are on the average accelerated about one year and a half, compared with unselected children. But on an average, there are about two grades below what which corresponds to their mental development. 4. Only a very small minority of intellectually gifted children have been subjected to forced culture or otherwise pushed in their development. 5. Heredity is superior. 50% of the fathers belong to the professional groups, not one to the unskilled group. 6. There is an apparent excess of Jewish cases and deficiency of cases from the Italian, Portuguese and Mexican groups living in the vicinity of Stanford University. 7. Trait ratings on social data give no evidence that gifted children tend more often than others to be lacking in social adaptability or leadership. However, they are probably less superior in social, emotional and psychological traits than intellectual and full traits. During the academic year 1920-21, Mrs. Jesse Chase Fenton served as full-time assistant on the Gifted Children Fellowship. Her services did much to lay the foundation for the more extensive investigation which was to follow. Besides collecting considerable data on the social traits of a group of 100 intellectually superior children, she assisted in the preparation of a report on a gifted young poet, 
and in a summary of recent literature on genius. Perhaps the most valuable thing gained from the work to this point was the experience. Intimate acquaintance with a considerable number of gifted children had shown we need of certain kind of home and school data, and successive revisions of information schedules for the use of parents and teachers had shown what methods were likely to be most dependable in gathering such data. As for conclusions having a statistical basis, none could be established except on a far larger number of cases. This is especially true for comparisons involving age, race, school grade, occupational class, etc. It is clear that for such purposes it will be necessary to locate 500 or 1,000 cases by a method which will ensure that the group selected will be reasonably representative of intellectually gifted children. The present study. The task of locating the desired number of cases and of securing the necessary tests and supplementary data was of course far too costly to be financed out of the ordinary budget of a university department. Fortunately, early in 1921, the directors of the Commonwealth Fund made a grant of $20,300 to Stanford University to continue and extend the research. The purposes of the grant, as indicated in the formal application, which the author submitted under the date of February 23, 1921, were as follows. 1. To increase the number of gifted subjects to approximately 1,000. 2. To secure at least two intelligence tests of each subject. 3. To secure measures of school achievement in at least four or five of the school subjects. 4. In the case of a small number of cases, to give tests of specialised ability. 5. Revision of the methods of securing trait ratings and social data. And 6. Follow up of the subjects for a period of at least 10 years. In 1922, before the end of the first year's work, an additional grant of $14,000 was received from the Commonwealth Fund for the purpose of extending the study along medical, anthropometric and psychological lines. This sum was supplemented by a contribution of $8,000 in money and $6,000 in services from Stanford University. The money cost of the study, he reported, apart from services contributed, was therefore $42,300. The contribution of services by the university has exceeded the amount stipulated and would bring the total cost of the study to more than $50,000. The second Commonwealth grant made it possible to secure from a main group of subjects anthropometric measurements, medical examinations, character and personality tests, and interest tests, and in addition to carry out a parallel biographical study of the early mental traits of 300 men and women of genius. The first grant was made available in May 1921. May, June, and July were devoted by the writer to the preparation of plans, tests, and information blanks, and to securing the necessary help. The research start to begin with was as follows. Assistant Director, Dr. T. L. Kelly, Stanford University. Field Assistants, Florence Fuller, M.A., University of Minnesota. Florence Goodenow, M.A., Columbia University. Helen Marshall, M.A., Ohio State University. Dorothy H. Yates, Ph.D., University of California. Office Assistant, G. M. Roach, Ph.D., Stanford University. It will be evident that the success of an undertaking of the kind here described depends in no small measure upon the qualifications of the field assistants secured. In the search for suitable assistance, the leading universities of the country were canvassed by the writer in person. Every selection made proved to be a happy one. Dr. Yates had recently completed a PhD dissertation on gifted high school pupils. Miss Goodenow had worked extensively in mental tests and clinical methods with Dr. Letta S. Hollingsworth. Miss Marshall had worked with Dr. Rudolf Pinter in mental surveys of school children, and Miss Fuller had assisted Dr. M. E. Haggerty for a year in a survey of gifted children in Minneapolis. All had had extensive training in the use of tests, all had taught in public schools, and all were especially interested in the proposed investigation. 
The assistance of Dr. Roach in the work carried on at the university was extremely valuable. During 1921 to 1922, this had to do largely with the preparation of tests, especially the achievement and general information tests. On August 8th, the four field assistants began a course of five weeks of intensive training at Stanford University in preparation for their year's work. Professor L. L. Berlingame of the Department of Biology, Stanford University, gave instruction on heredity. Dr. J. Harold Williams, Director of the California Bureau of Juvenile Research on Methods of Collecting Field Data. Dr. Maud Merrill, Instructor in Psychology, Stanford University, on Binet Test Procedure. The Writer on the Literature of Genius. Dr. Roach assisted in shaping the plans and the preparation of information schedules and a general information test. The data to be collected for each child chosen for study included the following. 1. Two intelligence tests, Stanford Binet and National B. 2. A two-hour educational test, the Stanford Achievement Test. 3. A 50-minute test of general information in science, history, literature, and the arts. 4. A 50-minute test of knowledge of and interest in plays, games, and amusements. 5. A four-page interest blank to be filled out by the children. 6. A two-month reading record to be kept by the children. 7. A 16-page home information blank to be filled out by the parents, including ratings on 25 traits. 8. An eight-page school information blank to be filled out by the teachers, including ratings on the same 25 traits as were rated by the parents. 9. When possible, ratings of the home on the Whittier scale for home grading. Field work began in September 1921. Miss Goodenow and Miss Fuller were assigned to Los Angeles, Miss Marshall to San Francisco, and Dr. Yates to Oakland and Berkeley. It was thought that the four assistants could canvas grades, one to eight in the cities just named, and probably also in some of the smaller cities. However, the task proved more tedious than had been foreseen. After a conference with the field assistants late in November, grades one and two were estimated from the formal survey in order that grades three to eight might be more thoroughly covered. February 1st, 1922, Miss Bessie Fuller was added to the Los Angeles staff. During April, May and June, Miss Marshall was assisted in San Francisco by Miss Elizabeth Kellam and Dr. Yates in Oakland and Berkeley by Miss Beatrice Lance. Practically the entire cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco and Oakland were canvassed in this way, the larger part of Berkeley and part of Alameda. With the help of volunteer assistance, the following cities were covered more or less thoroughly by the same method as are used in the larger cities. Santa Barbara, grades 2-6, to six, by Dr. James L. Stockton, of the Santa Barbara State Teachers College. Fresno, by Miss Blanche Cummings, Director of Research in the Fresno Public Schools. San Jose, by Professor J. C. DeVos, San Jose State Teachers College. Santa Ana by Miss Bess Henry, Director of Research in the Santa Ana Public Schools. With the help of local assistants, Pasadena, Redlands, Santa Rosa, Palo Alto, Burlingame, Kelseyville, Irwin, Sebastopol, Burbank, San Mateo, San Bernardino, and a few other cities were canvassed somewhat less thoroughly by a simple method to be described later. In the same way, the rural schools of San Bernardino County were also covered. Through the cooperation of the high school principals of the state, a modified form of survey was carried out in 95 high schools, enrolling approximately 70,000 pupils. The regular field assistants canvassed most of the high school pupils in Los Angeles, San Francisco and Oakland. To the many volunteer helpers who contributed so much to the success of the study as a whole, the writer wishes to express his very great obligation. The procedure of the regular field assistants was as follows. 1. An entire school was canvassed by methods to be described in Chapter 2. 2. Home information blanks were distributed at once to the parents of the children selected for study, and, in about 95% of the cases, the homes of the children were visited and rated and parents were interviewed. 3. 
School information blanks were distributed to the teachers of the children selected. 4. Shortly before the close of the school year, in May and June 1922, the selected cases of a particular city were called together in groups of 10 to 50 for the achievement tests. The tests on plays, games, and amusements, and for the collection of data called for in the interest blank. At the same time, record booklets were distributed in which the children were asked to record their reading for a period of two months. The data thus collected, together with similar data for a control group of about 600 on the plays, games and amusement test, the interest blank, the school information blank, the information test and the reading records were scored and tabulated in the summer of 1922. In this work, the writer was assisted by Miss Fuller, Miss Marshall, Miss Goodnow, and Dr. Yates, as well as by a corpse of several clerical assistants. During November and December 1922, a detailed report was made to the parents or guardian of each child of the gifted group, including definite information on grade of intellectual superiority, standing in each of the achievement tests in terms of subject ages, information age, special abilities or weaknesses noted, Comparison of the child's play interests with those of normal children of the same age and sex, appraisal of the child's reading, and general advice and comment on various points. A reduced copy of this blank follows. On the following two pages, the record blank is displayed. Traits of gifted children, the Stanford University Gifted Children Research. Meanwhile, Work under the Second and Commonwealth Appropriation had already begun. This included the following divisions and personnel. 1. Medical examinations by Dr. Edith Bronson and Dr. Albert H. Moore, in cooperation with an advisory committee composed of Dr. Thomas Addis, Dr. Harold K. Faber, Dr. A. W. Hewlett, and Dr. W. E. Shatter, of the Stanford University Medical School, and Dr. Ernest Gale Martin, Professor of Physiology, Stanford University. 2. Anthropometric measurements, 37 in all, under the direction of Dr. Bird T. Bowen, Director of Child Welfare Research, University of Iowa. 3. Character and personality tests, methods prepared by A. S. Rubenheimer. 4. Interest test, method prepared by Jenny Benson Wyman. 5. Preparation of a guide to children's reading, based on reading records of the gifted and control groups, by Margaret Lima. 6. Study of the Specialization of Abilities by James C. DeVos. 7. A Biographical and Comparative Study of the Mental Development of a Representative Group of 300 Eminent Individuals by Catherine M. Cox. The plan of the investigation called for the collection of about 65 pages of test and measurement data and about 35 pages of questionnaire data, a total of approximately 100 pages for each child. Practically all of this material was obtained for more than 90% of the main experimental group of 643 subjects, and about half of it for nearly 600 other gifted subjects. In addition, a large part of the material was also obtained for several hundred unselected children. For the intelligence, achievement, and anthropometric measurements, norms were already available, but it was necessary to establish norms for the following. School information blank including various kinds of educational data and teachers' ratings on 25 traits. The interest blank, filled out by the children. The two months' reading record. The information test. The test of play interest and play knowledge. The Wyman interest test. And the test of character and personality traits. This enormously increased the labour involved in the investigation, but provided comparative data of the greatest value. It was not possible, unfortunately, to secure medical examinations or the data called for on the home information blank for an unselected group. During the course of the investigation, several different control groups were utilised, as it was not feasible to secure from a single group all the material that was desired. One group furnished norms for the school information blank, another for the information test, another for the interest character and personality tests another for the reading record, and another for the interest blank and the test to play interest and play knowledge. Each of these groups numbered from 600 to 800 children. After the results of the second year's work have been summarised, 
Another report was issued to parents of the gifted group. The form used in this report follows. A third report that summarizes the most important data from the physical measurements is reproduced in Chapter 7. On the following two pages are displayed the Stanford University Gifted Children Research Report to Parents on Interest and Personality Tests. Ms. Goodenow served as Chief Research Assistant throughout the second year, assisted in the standardization of the character, personality, interest tests which have been devised and validated by Mr. Robenheimer and Mrs. Wyman, directed the application of these tests in the spring of 1923 to the gifted group, and from June 1923 to September 1924, assisted in the preparation of the report. In this work, she was assisted, a part of the time, by Miss Helen Marshall and Miss Alter Williams. The choice of assistants for the second year's work proved to be no less fortunate than for the first year. Both by training and experience, Dr. Bronson and Dr. Moore were ideally fitted for the medical examining. Dr. Baldwin had long been engaged in studies of the physical growth of children from birth to maturity. Miss Cox, Mr. DeVos, Mr. Rubenheimer, Mrs. Wyman, and Miss Slimmer were advanced graduate students in psychology and education at Stanford University, and with the exception of Miss Slimmer, were working on PhD dissertations in connection with this research. Throughout its course, the investigation owes much to the devoted work of the field assistants, who constantly worked overtime, industriously ran down every clue that promised to yield new subjects or useful information and by their tactful dealings with parents and teachers secured from home and school, the corporation without which the study could not have proceeded. Of the 649 children who qualified for our main group, the parents of only six refused cooperation. The total time cost the assistance which parents have rendered has been very great. To fill out the schedule of information called for in the home blank is alone a task requiring several hours. In addition, approximately four half days were required to take the child to the educational tests, the personality and interest tests, the medical examination, and the anthropometric measurements. Almost invariably, the parents have shown an interest in the outcome of the study, apart from any help they might hope to receive from it. The purpose and methods of the various divisions of the research are set forth in their respective sections of this report, and need not be described here. It may be stated, however, that each part of the study was carried out essentially as planned, and with results which are believed in each case to throw considerable light on the problems under investigation. This volume deals with only the first stages of an investigation which will be continued with the same subjects for many years. The material that has been gathered is far too extensive to be summarized in satisfactory detail in a single volume. A brief clinical description of each case would alone have required a volume as large as the present one. Every section of the data would have warranted more thorough and detailed treatment than it had thus far been possible to give. The data already collected can be made the basis of numerous minor studies, and the follow-up work which will be carried on indefinitely will increase many times the value of the original material. The present purpose is to show in what traits, and to what extent, a representative group of intellectually superior children differs from a group of unselected normal children. The task of the future will be the comparison of promise and performance. In the fulfilment of this task, new light be thrown upon the prognostic significance of the test scores and of other records which have been secured. When our cases have thus been read backward, so to speak, it will be easier to read other cases forward to predict and describe in the light of long-range knowledge. Another unlimited field for future research is in the genealogical study of the families represented in our gifted group. It is to be hoped that financial support will be found for this and for other studies which it has thus far been possible to undertake. But increased knowledge of the origin and of the physical and mental traits of gifted children is not an end itself. When the sources of our intellectual talent have been determined, it is conceivable that means may be found which would increase the supply. When the physical, mental and character traits of gifted children are better understood, it will be possible to set about their education with better hope of success. Educational experiments in this line are already being undertaken in the public schools in ever-increasing number, 
and these need to be supplemented by privately endowed undertakings which permit of greater freedom for experimentation. Surely in a nation of a hundred million people there should be one or more schools of this kind, schools which would be unhampered in the selection of such pupils as the experiment called for, which would be free to follow without a hindrance the lead of experimental evidence, and financially in position to allow for long-range planning. In the gifted child, nature has moved far back the usual limits of educability, but the realms thus thrown open for the educator are still terra incognita. It is time to move forward, explore, and consolidate. End of section 1「Section 2 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 – Mental and Physical Traits in a Thousand Gifted Children – by Lewis Madison Terman and others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 2 – Method and Results of the Search for Subjects The purpose of the search was to locate subjects of a degree of brightness that would rate them well within the top 1% on the school population. It was also desired to secure subjects who would be, as fairly as possible, representative of all gifted children of the degree of brightness, set as a standard for selection. It is obvious that the conclusions regarding the characteristics of gifted children in general will be valid only to the extent to which the latter requirement has been made. Too often physicians and psychologists, as well as laymen, have based their conclusions regarding the supposed abnormality of intellectual precocity on selected cases. It was not considered feasible to attempt to locate the 1,000 brightest children in California, desirable as that would have been. Apart from the difficulties involved in equating the intellectual superiority of bright children of different ages, such a plan was entirely impractical because of the size of the state, 158,000 square miles, and the large school population, approximately 500,000, in grades 1 to 8. The cost of intelligence test blanks for a half million children would alone have greatly exceeded the funds available for the entire research. The labour of giving and scoring the test would probably have brought the cost of covering the entire state by this method to many times the amount of money available for the study. The limitation of the survey to the larger cities was therefore a matter of necessity. Travelling expenses were thus reduced to a minimum, as well as the time required for making the necessary arrangements with school officials. Such limitation, however, has undoubtedly affected the findings in various important ways especially with respect to racial and social origin of the subjects. Their scores on the various achievement tests, their grade advancement, their interests, their reading, and their recreational habits. The next problem was to secure a group of subjects who would be as representative as possible of all gifted children in the territory covered. A satisfactory solution of this problem would have required the application of a perfect measure of intelligence to all the children. A perfect measure was not available, and even if it had been, the cost of its application would have been too great. It was necessary, however, to find some kind of criterion for the selection of an experimental group. The leading possibilities considered were teachers' ratings, age grade status, achievement tests and intelligence tests. All of these criteria have been used from time to time, singly or in combination, by various investigators. One would hardly expect any two of them to yield the same subjects out of a given school population, and it is possible that the subjects selected by any one of the methods would differ appreciably in general characteristics from those selected by any other. The rank order of the above criteria for validity is probably as follows. 1. Intelligence tests. 2. Achievement tests. 3. Age grade status. 4. Teachers' ratings. The faults of subjective ratings have been sufficiently exposed in numerous investigations to show their great unreliability when used alone. Such ratings are usually based too large on the child's class work and are almost certain to weigh too lightly the age factor. 
Age grade status is perhaps a better criterion, but its value is limited. 1. By the arrival standards in different cities, or even in different schools in the same city, and 2. By the difficulty of equating various degrees of acceleration for children of the different ages. The first aim objection is the most serious. Moreover, the age grade status of a given child rests ultimately upon a teacher's rating, that is, upon a judgment as to fitness for promotion. It is also likely to be affected by age for entering school, regulatory of attendance, adaptability to school requirements, and various other factors having nothing to do with intelligence. Achievement tests, although they are an objective method, were not seriously considered, as they would have been more costly than intelligence tests and a few to them as measures of native ability. Selection of the main group It was decided to use intelligence tests as the first criterion for inclusion of subjects in the main experimental group. However, since it was not feasible to test the entire school population, even by an abbreviated test, it was necessary to use a preliminary sifting method to determine what children should be tested. The method adopted employed at both teachers' ratings and age grade status. In grades 3 to 8, the procedure involved three steps as follows. First step, from each class composed ordinarily of 30 to 50 pupils, from 1 to 5 children, usually 4, were selected for a mental test by the plan shown in the following blank, printed here in induced type. On the following page is displayed the blank for selection of gifted children. On the above blank, each regular classroom teacher made her nominations. In general, about 6 or 8% of the pupils in grades 3 to 8 were tested, but the proportion varied from school to school. In a few of the best schools, as high as 20% of the pupils enrolled were tested. In the poorer schools, as low as 2%. Second step. Next, the nominees from several classrooms, often those from an entire school building, were assembled in a group and given the National Intelligence Test, Scale B, Form 1. Those who ranked in the top 5% of unselected children of their respective ages were retained for further study. The standard proved to be too high and was later lowered to the 90th percentile, i.e. top 10%, in the case of children who, judged by teachers' ratings or age grade status, seem to be promising cases. Occasionally the standard was lowered to the 85th or even 80th percentile, especially in the case of children of ages 7 and 8. A 7-year-old was found of Binet IQ above 140, who rated only at the 85th percentile on National B. By our failure to give a Binet test to all above the 80th percentile on the National, a few cases were undoubtedly lost, who would have earned an IQ of 140. The national age norms used in making this segregation were those found by the writer for the Vallejo, California, public schools children. These were practically the only norms available which were based upon tests of an entire school population of ages 8 to 15 inclusive and were used in preference to the age norms published in the National Intelligence Test Manual. The norms used were as follows. A table is displayed on the page with displaying percentile scores by age, compared to equal or exceeded. Third step. Pupils retained by step 2 were next given an abbreviated Stanford Binet test. Two abbreviations were used, one for children of foreign parentage, the other for children of non-foreign parents. They were as follows. A list is displayed on the page for the foreign and non-foreign tests, graded by year. The selection of tests for the abbreviated Stanford Binet was made with considerable care and took account of diagnostic value, variety, brevity, and ease of administration. Judgment regarding diagnostic value was based chiefly on correlations of each test with mental age on the complete scale. Such correlations in terms of 1% of pupils of each mental age passing each test were available in two Stanford studies. The use of this method is justifiable in view of the fact that the aim is to get an abbreviation which will yield approximately the same results as the entire scale. Non-dependence upon language was of course the most important consideration in the abbreviation 
for children of foreign parentage. In the other abbreviation also, care was taken to avoid the too exclusive use of verbal or schoolish tests. It was thought that the method of nomination would probably overweigh the language factor, and that the intelligence tests ought to err in the opposite direction, if at all. For this reason, in step 2, national scale B was used almost exclusively in preference of scale A, the latter being more verbal. It is probable that the large use made of non-verbal tests give a group slightly different from that which would have resulted from the use of tests depending more upon the language factor, perhaps on the whole group slightly less gifted intellectually. On the other hand, the method gave the much desired assurance that the experimental group would not be characterized primarily by special ability and language. If the vocabulary test seems overweighted in the abbreviations used, it is only necessary to point to the correlation of 0.85 to 0.95, which have been found between vocabulary score and mental age on the entire scale. The amount of this correlation was deemed to justify rejection of some candidates on vocabulary test alone. This was frequently done in the case of non-foreign children of seven years or older, though neither were children below seven. Usually the vocabulary test was given first, and in case time was limited, the examiners were permitted to reject, without further test, those having a vocabulary quoted of less than 125. After some experience with this rule, the standard usually followed by a vocabulary quoted of 120. Examination of the table on page 308 determines the intelligence of school children, will show that the 120 rule is reasonably safe. The following age norms were used in computing vocabulary quotients. The table is displayed on the page, displaying mental age and median vocabulary. Pupils attaining an IQ of 130 or more on the abbreviated scale were given a complete examination. The correlation between the entire scale and the abbreviated scale is about 0.95 for unselected children of a given age, which means that the 130 rule is fairly safe. However, very few cases were rejected on an abbreviated test whose IQ was as high as 125. Older children were ordinarily not rejected on an abbreviated test if the IQ was as high as 120. It is possible to economise time in giving the abbreviated scale by beginning with vocabulary, going next to memory for digits, then working backward with other tests, beginning with the difficult and proceeding to the easy until enough tests have been missed to disqualify the subject, at which point the examination was ordinarily abandoned. IQ 140 on the complete scale was set as a provisional lower limit for inclusion in the scale of children under 11 years. For older children, an allowance had to be made for the fact that the brightest children of 11 years or older are graded too low by the Stanford Binet. The standards said were as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing age to score and IQ. Below 11 years, IQ 140. 11 to 11 and a half, 139. 11 half to 12, 138. 12 to 12 and a half, 137. 12 and a half to 13, 136. 13 to 13 and a half, 134. 13 and a half to 14, 132. Binet tests were given to pupils over the age of 14. The term and group test was to be used instead, but it turned out that few 14-year-old children of very superior intelligence were found in the grades below the high school. Such was the method of selection in grades 3 to 8. The method in grades 1 and 2 was at first exactly the same, except for the omission of the national test. During the first two months of the survey, all nominees in grades 1 and 2 were given an abbreviated minute. During this period, approximately three-fourths of the time of the field assistance was devoted to the first two grades. Moreover, the results here were on the whole less satisfactory than they were in the upper grades, because the teachers' nominations were more often in error. Accordingly, after the December 1st, 1921, grades 1 and 2 were no longer canvassed by the use of nomination blanks, 
Instead, the field assistant thereafter merely visited each primary teacher and inquired whether she had any pupils of very outstanding ability or exceptionally under age for the grade, and such pupils only were tested. A good many cases were discovered by other than the usual method. Whenever possible, sibs of cases already located were tested. This netted a considerable number and accounted for the majority of those in the main group who were below school age. A few preschool cases were located as a result of casual information. Sheer accident accounted for perhaps a half dozen school cases. Some of these accidents were rather surprising. In one case, a teacher in nominating the youngest child in her room reported by accident the child whose name was adjacent to that of the youngest child on the roll. This proved to be the only child in the 300 pupils of that building who tested as high as 140 IQ. Another child who met the standard was brought to the test by a child messenger. It was afterwards learned that the messenger had by some mistake brought another child than the one the teacher had intended to send. Now the subject who qualified was the second youngest in his class and was only sent to the test because the youngest pupil was absent. Loss of Subjects Accidental discoveries of the kind mentioned above were frequent enough to suggest that a considerable proportion of gifted pupils were being missed. A test experiment was therefore arranged through the cooperation of Dr. James L. Stockton of the State Teachers College, Santa Barbara. Dr. Stockton had 33 teachers in grades 2 to 6 of 7 schools in the city of Santa Barbara make their nomination in regular manner. He then gave National B not only to the pupils nominated, but to the entire school population of those grades. Those reaching the 95th percentile of the National were all to be given a Stanford Binet, as in our main study. In about half the cases, however, this is not possible. The results showed that of the eight pupils qualifying on the data collected, three had not been named on the nomination blanks. Of the five who qualified, four were first choices, one of whom was also youngest, and one was second choice and also youngest. There were five others, not given a Binet test, who would almost certainly have qualified had the data been complete, as all of them reached the 95th percentile score on National B. One of these had been nominated as brightest and youngest, one as second brightest, one as second brightest and youngest, and two as youngest only. Assuming conservatively that only four of these five most promising incomplete cases would have qualified, the total number would have been 12 cases, of whom three, or 25%, would have been missed by the method of search that gave us our 643 regular cases. If the Santa Barbara data could be taken as typical, it might be inferred that our main survey resulted in the location of only about 75% of the subjects who could have met the standards set if all had been tested. The field assistants estimate, however, that the efficiency was near at 90%. As an additional check, one school of 350 pupils in Los Angeles and another in San Francisco of 800 pupils were re-sifted. These two schools were amongst the very best in their respective cities. In the first sifting, the Los Angeles school had netted 12 cases, one for every 25 enrolled, and the San Francisco school 28 cases, one for every 28 enrolled. In each school, several teachers, after the first sifting, protested that there were other children in the school who were bright enough to qualify. Accordingly, the teachers were all given a second set of nomination blanks, and requested to nominate the youngest, the brightest, and the second brightest of those who had not been nominated in the first sitting. Tests were then made in the usual manner. In Los Angeles school, not a single new case qualified, but in the San Francisco school, 10 reached the standard. Of the 50 cases thus located in these schools, 20% would have been missed but for the second survey. It is entirely improbable, however, that the general loss was anything like as great, for the chances of loss would be lower in schools attended by average or an inferior population. After a little experience, the field assistants adapted the method of cert somewhat according to the type of school in which they were working, 
and as a result, were both able to save time and make the search more effective. In the best schools, more pupils were tested than the scheme called for. While in the poorer schools, it was not necessary to test so many. In the good schools, much testing was done in grades 1 and 2, but if a large school had netted no cases in grades 3 to 8, it was deemed safe to admit grades 1 and 2. It's believed that a considerable loss was incurred by our inability to include private schools in the survey. Judging from the number and character of the private schools in the three centres, this loss is probably greatest in Los Angeles, where such schools are numerous and patronised by the superior social classes, at least in San Francisco, where they are chiefly parochial. School Population Canvassed The main search in the cities of Los Angeles, San Francisco, and the East Bay cities of Oakland, Berkeley, and Alameda yielded 643 subjects, not including six whose parents refused to cooperate. These 643 cases were distributed as follows. Los Angeles, 285. San Francisco, 176. East Bay, 182. 81 of these from Berkeley and Alameda. 101 from Oakland. The proportion of cases found to school population canvas in each section was roughly as follows. Los Angeles, 1 to 330. San Francisco, 1 to 235. Oakland, 1 to 225. Berkeley and Alameda, 1 to 100. Figures in Table 1 show approximate numbers actually covered in the main survey. They do not include schools or classes not canvassed. Only about one half the population of grades 1 and 2 was covered. Probably 8,000 of the 12,000 school population of Berkeley and Alameda, grades 1 to 8, were also canvassed. Since 649 regular cases qualify from about 168,000 covered in the main survey, the proportion is about 1 for each 258. If 20% of the cases who could have qualified were missed, the number qualifying should have been about 812, which would have given a proportion of 1 for each 200, or about one half of 1%. Accurate figures were not available for the school population covered in other ways than by the main survey that is, in the high schools throughout the state, and in various city schools covered by volunteer assistance, probably 100,000 in a conservative estimate, which, added to the 168,000 covered in the main search, would give a total school population of more than a quarter of a million. Table 1 is displayed on the page, listing school population canvassed. Comparing grades in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, and the total. Analysis of the sources of information which yielded the main experimental group. Interesting facts were brought out by a comparison of the number of subjects in the main experimental group who were located as a result of various kinds of information, including the nomination blanks, SIB relationship to a child already located, previous tests, special recommendation, etc. Also in the case of those discovered by the use of the nomination blank, the relative proportions recommended as most intelligent in the class, next most intelligent, third most intelligent, youngest, brightest in preceding class, etc. The following data are for 644 cases of the 649 located in the main survey. A table is displayed on the page titled Means of Discovery, with three columns, the means of discovery, the number and the percent of main group. One by the use of nomination blanks, 447, 69.4%. 2. High record in earlier test, 83, 12.9%. 3. Special recommendations, 48, 7.5%. 4. SIP relationship to child who had already qualified, 41, 6.4%. 5. By accident or unknown means, 15, 2.3%. 6. By repeated survey of two schools. 10. 1.5%. The fact that about 30% of the entire group were located by other means than through the use of nomination blanks is due partly to the fact that after the first two months, the use of such blanks below the third grade was abandoned 
and that thereafter children in grades 1 and 2 were only tested as a result of special recommendation. A good many other cases were discovered because of SIP relationship to a child who had qualified. The following data show the relative number who receive various kinds of nominations. In this case, the percents are based upon the 447 children who are recommended in nomination blanks. In each case, the percent of this group who received a particular kind of recommendation and no other. It does not include those who are nominated in two ways, e.g. as most intelligent and also as youngest. A table is played on the page, titled Kind of Nomination, listing the kind of nomination, the number, and the percent of those nominated. 1. Most intelligent in class, 70, 15.7%. 2. Next most intelligent in class. 42. 9.4%. 3. Third most intelligent in class. 18. 4%. 4. Youngest in class. 88. 19.7%. 5. From teacher of previous half year. 17. 3.8%. The remainder of the group are accounted for as follows. Two kinds of nomination, 157, 35.1%. Three kinds of nomination, 55, 12.3%. The above figures show that of those discovered as a result of a single kind of nomination, the largest number belong to the youngest group, and the next largest number to the most intelligent group. However, more than a third of all who were nominated received nominations of two kinds. Analysis has also been made of each major group, as shown below. A table is displayed on the page, displaying the group nominated as brightest, the group nominated as second brightest, the group nominated as third brightest, group nominated as youngest, and group nominated by previous teacher, compared to the number and the percent nominated group. Perhaps the most important single finding is that nomination as youngest yielded more subjects who would otherwise have been missed than any other kind of nomination. 19.7% of the total nominated group. Nomination as brightest yielded 15.7% who were nominated in no other way. In other words, if one would identify the brightest child in a class of 30 to 50 pupils, it is better to consult the birth records in the class register than to ask the teacher's opinion. This finding has a very high reliability, as is based on the nominations made by approximately 6,000 teachers. The fact that nomination as second brightest yielded 42 subjects, 9.4% of the entire nominated group, who would not otherwise have been discovered, and that nomination as third brightest yielded 18 subjects or 4% of the entire nominated group, who qualified, strongly suggests that a similar number may have been missed by failure to call for second youngest and third youngest. If so, our group of 643 should have been larger by about 60, in which case the total would have been a little over 700. This would mean a loss of about 8.6%. It is probable that the loss from this failure was between 7 and 10% of the total number of availables. However, to have included the second youngest and third youngest would have necessitated giving a national test to 12 or 15% of all the pupils. Possibly it would have been still better to have given a five-minute opposite test toward the pupils as a means of preliminary sifting. This method was considered and was rejected only for the reason that its use would have given rise to the criticism that the gifted group so obtained would tend to belong to the verbal type. One may conclude that the method of selection employed although far from ideal, probably led to the discovery of at least 80% and possibly 90% of all the cases who could have qualified in the school population canvassed. One can only surmise how the undiscovered cases would have differed from an experimental group in sex proportion, mean intelligence, social origin, personal characteristics, etc. They would almost certainly have been found a little less accelerated in school. Some would be excessively shy others lazy, and still others lacking in adaptability. On the whole, the average child of our group is perhaps slightly better adapted to school life than is the strictly average gifted child of the same degree of brightness. It is improbable, however, that the general character of our group would have been significantly different 
from what it was and it included all the cases that were overlooked. It has not yet been possible to make analysis of the nominees who failed to qualify for the gifted group. In all, approximately 20,000 nominations were made in the main search. Many of these were duplicate nominations, but it is probable that the number of different children nominated was in the neighbourhood of 10,000. Practically all of these were given some kind of intelligence test, probably 8,000 of them the national. Many of the test blanks were scored only far enough to show that the required standard had not been met. It is hoped that sometime it will be possible to complete the scoring and to compare the relative showing made by various groups of nominees. The results of such a comparison should prove very instructive. Special Ability Cases The main search was not calculated to bring to light special ability cases, and a supplementary search was therefore planned for this purpose. It was thought that this procedure would probably net a few cases of very superior general intelligence who would pass with their teachers as having special talent only. It was hoped, however, to locate a number of genuine special ability cases for study and follow-up. Special teachers of art, music, manual training, domestic science and agriculture fill out the nomination blank shown on the next page. This blank was used for about eight weeks, but it netted so few cases showing evidence of real talent that it was abandoned. In general intelligence, the special ability subjects averaged 114 IQ. Among the most marked cases of musical ability were three children, or boys, who qualified for the regular gifted group. Ten others, three boys and seven girls, were purely special ability cases. Some of the latter were located as a result of inquiries among private music teachers. These ten cases had an average IQ of 122, with a range from 95 to 139. On the following page, blank for selection of gifted children is displayed. The search for special talent in art was especially disappointing in all three centres. In Los Angeles, a special art class was maintained for the 50 most promising pupils in the city. These pupils meet twice a week, in two classes of 25 each, to be given instruction by the best art supervisors in the city. A selection of pupils for this privilege involves, first, nomination by regular teacher to art teacher, then recommendation from art teacher to art supervisor, and finally, recommendation from supervisor to head supervisor. Of the 50 children attending these classes, the six boys and nine girls most promising as judged by the art supervisors were examined. Not only was the average IQ low, 109, range 79 to 133, but of two or three possible exceptions, there was little evidence of anything more than a copying ability. It must be admitted, however, that satisfactory measuring methods were not available. The children themselves, with few exceptions, were looking forward to other careers than art. There is considerable evidence that exceptional talent in painting or drawing is less likely than musical ability to appear precociously. Every city has its musical prodigies who give recitals, but it is said that in the history of New York City there has been but one public exhibition by a child artist. It will be interesting in the follow-up study to note how many of the 643 children in our main experimental group let us show well-marked specialised talent. Search in outside schools. In the outside schools, a nomination blank, similar to the one given above, was used except that the teacher was asked to nominate only the brightest, second brightest, and youngest in a class. The nominees of grades 1 and 2 were then given a Stanford Binet test. Those are grades 3 to 8, a national intelligence test, scale A or scale B, and those are grades 9 to 12, a term and group test. The standard for acceptance on the national was as follows. A table is displayed on the page displaying age and score. The minimum TGT scores for high school pupils were as follows. A table is displayed on the page displaying age and score. Although the outside surveys netted many interesting subjects and it will be worthwhile to follow up, their immediate results were disappointing because of the impossibility of controlling conditions. The outside cases selected on the basis of a Binet test number 356 and on the basis of a term and group test 
or National Intelligence Test, 378. All outside cases, 734. The results for these are not very suitable for statistical treatment because of certain departures from instructions and because not all of the subjects qualified on the same kind of test. Also, the supplementary data are far less complete than they are for our main group. Some of the most important data for 309 of the outside cases located in the high school survey are summarised in Chapter 30. End of Section 2《Section 2 Section 3 of Genetic Studies of Genius Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Madison Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 3 Composition of the Gifted Group By May 1st, 1924, our files included 1,444 subjects classified as in Table 2. Table 2 is displayed on the page, Classification of the Gifted Groups. They display the main experimental group, the outside binner group, outside high school group, and special ability group, compared to boys, girls, and total numbers. In addition to the above, 1,444, there are 211 outside cases, 103 boys and 108 girls in our files who failed by a small margin to qualify but are being followed up. Group 1 is by far the most important group. As it is composed almost entirely of subjects who are located in the main survey and for whom we have collected the most extensive data. It consists of 684 subjects. However, was referred to throughout this volume as a main experimental group included only 643 of these subjects. This restriction of numbers is due to the following facts. 1. 33 of the 684 cases were siblings of the original 643 and were either tested for the first time a year after the original survey was made or were later transferred to the main experimental group from other classifications. 2. Two boys of IQs of 111 and 114, twins of qualified subjects, were included in order to avoid possible jealousy. These cases have not been included in any of the statistical reports. 3. Parental cooperation was refused in 6 cases. These three groups account for 41 cases, which, subtracted from 684, gives the 643 cases of the main experimental group. Group 2 includes 128 old cases that had been located between 1911 and 1921, and 228 that were located in 1921 to 1922, by the help of volunteer assistance in cities of California other than those covered in the main search. It is the outside pre-high school group, and was selected for the most part on the basis of national and Bennett tests, the data which have been collected for this group have not been summarised, largely because they are so incomplete. Group 3 is the result of a cooperative survey carried on by principals of 95 high schools in California and was selected chiefly by the use of the term in a group test. Chapter 19 has been devoted to a summary of some of the data collected for this group. The nature of Group 4 has been indicated in the preceding chapter. Composition of Main Experimental Group Table 3 shows the distribution of the uncorrelated IQs of the main experimental group of 643 subjects by age and sex. It is seen that the largest numbers of cases are found in the age groups 8 to 12 inclusive, and that the mode is at 10. This is due, for the most part, to the fact that the search was carried out chiefly in grades 3 to 8. Many bright children of seven years or less have not yet reached the third grade, while many of the brightest 12-year-olds and nearly all of the brightest 13-year-olds are in the high school. The decrease in the number qualifying after age 11 and the relative infrequency of very high IQs among the older subjects who did qualify is in part to the inadequacy of the Stanford Binet for the older gifted, although some allowance was made for this by lowering somewhat the standard for qualification for subjects 12 years old or older. 
Table 3 is displayed on the previous page. Distribution of uncorrected IQs of main gifted group. An attempt has been made to correct the IQs to correspond to what they would have been had the scale been more nearly adequate by the upper range. Various methods of making this correction were tried empirically until one was found which seemed satisfactory. The correction used involved the following additions of months to the mental age score for those passing various numbers of tests out of the total of 12 tests in the years 16 to 18. A table is displayed on the page with two rows, tests passed in 16 and 18, and number of months to add. Applying this correction, we have the distribution shown in Table 4. It is seen that the corrected quotients reduce considerably the age differences with respect to various grades of superiority. The proportion of IQs as high as 170 at various age levels in Table 4 is as follows. Age 2 to 5, 2 of 32 cases, or 6.2%. Age 6 and 7, 4 of 82 cases, or 4.8%. Age 8 and 9, 16 of 189 cases, or 8.5%. Age 10 and 11, 19 of 240 cases, or 7.9%. Age 12 and 13, 2 of 100 cases, or 2%. Only at age 12 and 13 is the difference very marked, and here the drop may be explained as due largely to the fact that many of the brightest children of these ages have been promoted to the high school. The mean corrected IQ by age is as follows, 2 to 5, 148.75, 6 and 7, 149.45, 8 and 9, 151.95, 10 and 11, 153.9, 12 and 13, 149.1. Accordingly, when we allow for the known inaccuracies of the intelligence scale used, the frequency of highest scoring children shows little tendency to increase or decrease in the total age range covered. For this reason, it seems justifiable to throw all the ages together for a total IQ distribution. It will be noted that 21 cases were included whose corrected IQs are in the interval 135 to 139 and one who is the interval 130 to 134. The large majority of these 21 cases are within a point or two of IQ 140. Some of them were included because of indications that the Binet score, due to the conditions of the examination, was lower than it should have been. Several of them because they were sibs of children who had already qualified, and a few because of special interest which attached to their cases. The number of exceptions made is, of course, too small to affect appreciably the general character of the experimental group, or to invalidate conclusions which are drawn with respect to the mental and physical traits of children of IQ 140 or higher. Table 4 is displayed on the previous page, distribution of corrected IQs of the main gifted group. Table 5 is also displayed on the previous page, IQ distribution for ages combined. Composition of Group 2 Table 6 gives the IQ distribution of Group 2, subjects who were selected by volunteer assistance on the basis of Bennett tests given in California and cities not covered in the main survey. Of these, 128 are cases which have been under observation for several years, and about 75 are from other states than California. Several have been tested more than once. When more than one test score was available, the IQ that was entered in Table 6 is that from the test which was most complete. In a few instances, where the tests seemed to be of about equal validity, the mean of the IQs was taken. Figure 1 shows the distribution of 999 gifted cases, 643 in the main experimental group, plus 356 in Group 2, in comparison with the IQs of the 905 unselected children on whom the Stanford Binet test was standardized. The uncorrected IQs are used in Figure 1. Table 6 is displayed on the following page. IQs of outside Binet group, uncorrected. Figure 1 is displayed following. IQ distributions for 999 gifted and 905 unselected children. Composition of Group 3. 
Table 7 gives by age and sex the term and group test scores of 370 of the 378 subjects in group 3. The outside high school group who qualified on this test. Composition of group 4. This group is composed of the special ability cases that failed to qualify for any of the other gifted groups. It does not include cases of undoubted special ability that were able to qualify on the basis of the IQ. The group is as follows. A table is displayed on the page, displaying the sex, age and IQ with artistic ability, musical ability and mechanical ability. Table 7 is displayed on the following page, term and group test scores of outside high school group. Sex ratio. In all the groups except the special ability group, the boys are considerably more numerous than the girls, notwithstanding the precautions that were taken to avoid sex preference in the methods of search. In the main experimental group, there are 352 boys to 291 girls, 54.7% boys and 45.3% girls, a ratio of 1 to 21 Point zero to 100. The SD of the proportion is 1.96. Of 36 cases later added to the main experimental group, there were 11 boys and 22 girls. If we include these, the ratio becomes 363 boys to 313 girls, or 116.0 to 100. Turning to group 2, the outside Binner group we find 197 boys and 159 girls, giving a ratio of 1 to 23.9 to 100. Group 3, the high school group, yields 257 boys and 121 girls, a ratio of 212.3 to 100. It is well known that there is an excess of male births in the general population. Perhaps the most extensive statistical study has been made by Nicholas, who finds a ratio of 105.5 males to 100 females in living births of Europe, and 105.9 to 100 in living births of whites in the United States. The excess of males is greater in still births and less in multiple births. The above ratios correspond closely to those reported for other mammals. In the case of pure albino rats, for example, Miss King found for 80 litters and 452 offspring a ratio of 107.3 males to 100 females. The reason for the success of males is not definitely known, but a possible explanation is that sperms, which contain the male-producing sex chromosome, being lighter by a minute fraction than other sperms, may travel somewhat faster and attain the upper reaches of the oviduct in larger numbers. However, the best standard with which to compare the sex ratio in the gifted group is a sex ratio in the pre-high school population of the cities covered by the survey. This is found to be 104.5 boys to 100 girls. Our problem is, therefore, to explain the difference between this ratio and those found for the gifted groups, the latter ranging from 116 over 100 to 212 over 100. Four hypotheses will be examined. 1. Bias Selection it is possible that the method of selection may have favoured the boys, although in view of the fact that nominations on the basis of estimated intelligence were in the vast majority of cases made by women teachers, one would hardly expect this to be the case. The nomination blanks filled out by teachers were examined for evidence of sex preference. Owing to the difficulty of identifying sex of a nominee by the name, some inaccuracy is introduced. An examination was therefore not carried out for the 6,000 or more blanks secured, but only for those filled out by the teachers of children who qualified for the gifted group. It is especially important to know whether these particular teachers showed a large sex preference in their nominations. Of the original 643 cases, 352 boys to 291 girls, 257 boys and 190 girls have been located as a result of nominations. The others were discovered in various ways, as explained elsewhere. The figures 257 and 190 give a ratio of 135.3 boys to 100 girls. The blanks of which these children were nominated contained nominations of 1,010 boys, 765 in addition to those qualifying, and 920 girls, 
738 in addition to those qualifying. The figures 1010 to 920 are in the ratio of 109.7 boys to 100 girls. On pitching those qualifying, the ratio is 103.7 boys to 100 girls, which is almost exactly the same as a ratio for the entire school population in the cities covered. One could hardly conclude that the excess of boys in our group is due to the bias of teachers in making nominations. Even a large excess of boys nominated would not be proof of bias. The fact that the sex ratio of nominations in these blanks was 109.7 boys to 100 girls, whereas the sex ratio of those qualifying from these same nominations was 135.3 boys to 100 girls, would seem to free the teachers from the suspicion of bias. There remains the question whether the Stanford Binet test, which was relied upon for the final selection, is more favourable to boys than to girls. It is not possible here to review the numerous investigations that have been reported on this point in the literature of mental tests, nor is it necessary. The results have shown fairly consistently that age for age and grade for grade, girls do fully as well on this test as boys. Private schools, of which there are a considerable number in the cities canvassed, were not included in the survey. It is, of course, possible that such schools enrolled more gifted girls than gifted boys. We consider this unlikely, but the facts are not available. 2. Sex Ratio in Families of Gifted At the time the material on sex ratio was tabulated, data were available for 502 of the total 578 families which produced the main gift group of 643 children. These 502 families yielded 317 gifted boys and 274 gifted girls, a ratio of 115.7 to 100. The total number of children in the same families was 655 boys and 548 girls, giving a total of 119.5 to 100. The ratio among the sibs of the gifted was 123.35 to 100, which is appreciably higher than for the gifted themselves. It appears, therefore, that the factor which operates to give an excess of boys among the gifted affects no less strongly the sibs of the gifted. It has been suggested that superior vigour or vitality of parents favours maleness of, of offspring, and that this factor might at the same time exert a favourable influence upon the nervous structure and mental development of the offspring. There is a certain amount of indirect evidence which supports this hypothesis. Riddle found that in the case of pigeons in which the determiner for sex is carried by the female, it is carried by the male mammals. If the female is stimulated by removal of eggs from the nest to keep on laying, the eggs later produced result in an excess of female offspring. By analogy, one might infer that in the case of human beings, superior vigour of fathers would result in excess of male births. It need hardly be said that analogical reasoning in the biological field has no value except in so far as it suggests investigation. It is true, however, that the medical and anthropological data which we have secured indicate that gifted children come from families of more than average vigour. As will be shown in later chapters, the children themselves are well nourished and average above normal in height and weight. Infant mortality among the sibs has been very low, and the grandfathers rate considerably above average in longevity. In a study of longevity, 150 families were selected which seemed to show the greatest tendency to long life. The selection could not readily be made on a purely objective basis, owing to the presence of so many variables, such as age of relatives, number in the family, number of deaths that had occurred, occupation, etc. But there is no doubt that the method used gave on the whole a group of families of superior longevity. Possible bias was ruled out by having the selections made by an assistant who had no knowledge of the use to be made of the data. In the 150 families so selected, there were in all 253 children, 136 boys and 117 girls, this gives a ratio of 116.2 to 100, as compared with a ratio of 119.5 to 100 for the children of the entire group of families for which we have data. For the 253 children of long-lived families, there were 552 uncles 
and 509 aunts reported, a ratio of 108.2 to 100, which is very close to that found in the general population. It seems, therefore, that whatever the factor involved, it operates to give an excess of males only among the gifted children and their sibs, not among their relatives. In line with this is the fact that 478 of Cattell's American men of science had 716 sons and 668 daughters, a ratio of 107.2 to 100, or almost exactly the same as a ratio for the general population. The facts presented above offer no evidence that the general stock which produces gifted individuals is characterized by excessive male offspring. 3. Differential Death Rate of Embryos Our figures for the sex ratio among the gifted and their sibs are based upon living births. Nichols and others have reported some evidence that the proportion of males may be higher in miscarriages. Hospital reports have in some cases shown a third as many miscarriages as living births. The number may be considerably greater than this, as it is impossible to secure accurate data on the mortality of embryos within the first few weeks after conception. If the ratio of males to females for all conceptions were 120 to 100, and the mortality rate of male and female embryos were 30% and 20% respectively, then the sex ratio of living births would be 105 to 100, or approximately that which obtains for the general population. Assuming the same sex ratio for all conceptions, but a mortality rate of 15% for males and 10% for female embryos, then the sex ratio of living births would be 113 males to 100 females. It is evident, therefore, the reduction of 50% in miscarriages, using this term in the broad sense, might affect considerably the sex ratio of living births. We find that in the families reporting one or more miscarriages, there were, of living births, 183 boys and 160 girls, a ratio of 114 to 100, or 53.4% of males and 46.6% of females. In the families reporting no miscarriages, there were 466 boys and 380 girls, a ratio of 122.6 to 100, or 55.1% of males and 44.1% of females. The SD of the first proportion is 2.69, of the latter 1.71. The excessive proportion of boys in the families reporting no miscarriages may very well be significant. If mothers of the gifted group, on the whole, have excelled mothers of the generality in the ratio of live births to conceptions, the excessive gifted boys would really be accounted for. 4. Sex Difference in Variability The most common explanation of findings, such as we are here concerned with, is that the human male is more variable than the female. However, the mental test data bearing on sex variability are so inconsistent that it would be hard to say which way the weight of the evidence inclines. On the hypothesis of sex difference in variability, one would expect to find the highest intelligence scores in our gifted group earned by boys. This, however, is not the case in all groups. In the main experimental group, the three highest IQs corrected were earned by girls, both in Table 3, uncorrected IQs, and Table 4, corrected IQs. The means for the sexes are almost identical. The variability of the girls in each case is slightly greater than that for boys, but the difference is too small to be considered significant. The difference between the SDs in the case of the correct IQs being only 0.82 times the SD of the difference, which is 1.06. The proportion of each sex found at or above various levels are for the correct IQs as follows. A table is displayed on the page listing boys and girls with IQ ratings. 160 or above, boys 18.5, girls 16.5. 170 or above, boys 6.2% girls 7.2%, 180 or above, boys 2.6%, girls 2%, 190 or above, boys 0%, girls 1%. However, except for the non-excess of boys in the highest IQ ranges, the facts we have presented are in harmony with the hypothesis that exceptionally superior intelligence occurs with greater frequency among boys than among girls that the sibs of the gifted show even a greater excess of boys than do the gifted themselves, may seem at first 
thought to argue against this hypothesis. Actually, it supports it. If children are selected for a given trait, then that trait is more common in boys than in girls. It follows that a greater proportion of families consisting of girls will only be missed, with the result that the sibs of the children selected for the trait will also show an excess of boys. It can be shown, for example, that if the true sex ratio in a general population is one to one, and the trait in question occurs in one half of boys and one third of girls, the families of children selected for the trait will yield a sex ratio of 111 boys to 100 girls, not 100 to 100. The true case of the sex ratio found cannot be determined for our data. It may be either variability or the differential death rate of embryos. Both of these factors may be involved, and possibly others. Bias selection due to the method of nomination and testing is probably not reasonable. End of section 3「Section 4 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 – Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman and others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 4 – Racial and Social Origin Racial Origin the chief data on racial origin consists of replies by the child's parents to the following question asked in the home blank regarding each of the child's grandparents. Fathers, father's descent, for example, English and Scotch, German, Dutch and French, Russian, Jewish, etc. The question was answered for 85% of the grandparents of those for whom home blanks had been returned at the time tabulations were made. In tabulating the replies, a credit of two points was allowed for each grandparent, or one point for each great-grandparent, making a total of eight points for each child. The points were then totaled by nationality or race for each grandparent, and reduced two per cent, as shown in Table 8. Table 8 is displayed on the page, Racial Origin of Main Gifted Group, Percent of Grandparents of each Racial or Nationality Group. Divided two columns, Racial Stock, and percent of total. English, 30.7%. German, 15.7%. Scotch, 11.3%. Irish, 9 French, 5.7%. Russian Jewish, 3.8%. German Jewish, 1.8%. Polish Jewish, 0.8%. Romanian Jewish, 0.2%. French Jewish, 0.2%. Lithuanian Jewish, 0.1%. Austrian Jewish, 0.1%. Bohemian Jewish, 0.1%. Jewish, not classified, 3.4. Total Jewish, 10.5%. Scotch-Irish, 2.8. Swedish, 2.5. Italian, 1.4. Welsh, 1.4. Austrian, 1.3. Norwegian, 0.9. Danish, 0.9. Japanese, 0.6. Swiss, 0.6. Spanish, 0.3. Bohemian, 0.3. Russian, 0.3. Hungarian 0.3, Romanian 0.3, Flemish 0.3, Armenian 0.3, Portuguese 0.3, Alsatian 0.1, Negro 0.1, Indian 0.1, Mexican 0.1, Syrian 0.1, Icelandic 0.1. It is unfortunate that no very reliable data on the relative frequency of the different racial stocks represented in the cities covered by the main survey are available. However, even without such comparative figures, certain items in Table 8 stand out as significant. The percentage of Scotch is very high, as is also that of the Jewish groups, especially the Russian Jews. The English stock heads the list, but this is also probably true in the general population. The percentage of Latin blood is very low. The proportion of Jewish blood as it is reported, is 10.5% of the total. The actual amount is probably greater than this, as there is reason to believe that the presence of Jewish blood has in some cases been concealed. According to the estimates of a number of prominent Jewish social workers, the proportion of Jews in the total population of three main cities covered, Los Angeles, San Francisco and Oakland, is approximately 5%. According to this estimate, the amount of Jewish blood in our group is about twice the expected. 
Negroes represent 2% of the total of the combined population of Los Angeles, San Francisco, Oakland, Alameda, and Berkeley, and furnish three-tenths of 1% of our gifted group, two cases. As these cases are both part white, exact proportion of white blood is not known, they account for less than three-tenths of 1% of the ancestral units in Table 8. In regard to the absence of Chinese, it should be noted that the Oriental schools which the Chinese children attended were not canvassed. Tests made by K.T. Ewing of 105 unselected Chinese children, chiefly of the ages 9 and 11, in the Oriental School of San Francisco gave a median IQ of 97, with one case testing above 135. These results compare well with those for unselected white children in California, especially if any allowance is made for the language handicap. The mentality of Japanese children in California has recently been very thoroughly investigated by Professor M. L. Darcy, who finds little evidence that the Japanese are inferior to California white children. Professor Darcy gave Binet, Beta and Stanford achievement tests using unselected age groups of 10 to 15 years to nearly half of the Japanese children of these ages in the entire state. The results for the urban group gave a median IQ of about 90, with Q of 10.2. For 129 cases in the larger cities, the median was 99. That the Binet median was largely affected by the language factor is indicated by the fact that the beta median was slightly above that of unselected white children. In agreement with this is the fact that the median educational quotient of the Japanese children on the Stanford Achievement Test was about 95. Also the fact that the ratings given these children by the teachers for general quality of schoolwork was fairly high. The remarkable outcome of one Japanese white marriage is set forth in some detail in Chapter 5. The total population of Latin extraction in the cities covered is not known, but it is certainly very large in comparison with the number of Latin children in our group. Intelligence tests of many Latin groups in America have yielded consistently low scores, with a median IQ usually between 75 and 85. Perhaps a median IQ of 80 for the Italian, Portuguese and Mexican school children in the cities of California would be a liberal estimate. How much of this inferiority is due to the language handicap and to other environmental factors is impossible to say, but the relatively good showing made by certain other immigrant groups similarly handicapped would suggest that the true causes lie deeper than environment. Examination of the statistical probabilities will show that even a moderate difference in the median IQ of two race or nationality groups is sufficient to cause very large differences in the proportion of individuals testing at either extreme. The median IQ of California white children residing in urban communities is approximately 100, and the PE of the distribution is approximately 10. On the basis of normal distribution, the expected frequency of children testing as high as 140 would be 35 in 10,000, or one individual in 286. If the mean IQ were 90 and the PE of the distribution was still 10, the proportion of cases reaching 140 would be only 3.8 in 10,000, or one in 2,632. If the mean of 90 were accompanied by a PE of about 9, as would most probably be the case, the proportion reaching 140 would be much less than 1 in 2,632. One can at least say that a mean IQ of 90 is not likely to produce more than a tenth as many individuals above 140 as a mean IQ of 100 will produce. Table 9 gives for the gifted group and for the general population of the cities canvassed the proportion of native white of native parentage, native white of foreign or mixed parentage, and foreign white parentage. The figures for the population are taken from 1,920 census returns for males and females 21 years or over. As would be expected, there are no significant differences in the parentage of gifted boys and gifted girls, but the gifted rank higher than the general population in the proportion class as native white of native parentage, the ratio being about 5 to 4. Table 9 is displayed on the page, parentage of gifted compared with adults of the general population. The table is divided between four columns and three rows.
Birthplace of foreign-born parents of Gifted. The birthplaces of 248 foreign-born white parents who are gifted are given in Table 10. The figures for the Japanese are added for comparative purposes. The fourth column gives the percent contributed by each country to the total foreign-born white parents who are gifted. Column 5. The percent contributed by each country to the total foreign-born population in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Column 6 shows to what extent each number in column 4 exceeded or fell short of its quota as shown in column 5. Table 10 is displayed on the page, birthplace of 248 white foreign-born parents of gifted children. In comparing the percents in column 6, it is necessary to bear in mind the small numbers in column 3 upon which they are based. This applies especially in those cases in which the percent in column 5 is also small. The great excess over the quota for Russia, Russian Jews, and the enormous deficiency below the quota for Spain and Italy are, however, very significant. Birthplace for American-born parents and grandparents of gifted. A separate space was provided in the home blank for recording the birthplace of each parent and each grandparent. Replies definite enough for tabulation were received for 581 fathers and 583 mothers, or more than 90% of the full number for the main experimental group, and more than 95% of the number returning home blanks. Following are the proportions of the American-born and foreign-born parents from cities, towns, and country in the cases for which the information was available. The classification of cities by population is based on the 1890 census for parents and that of 1860 for grandparents. A table is displayed on the page comparing fathers, mothers, both, and grandparents to four columns with a number from the cities of 10,000 or over, from the cities and towns of 1,000 to 10,000, from the rural districts less than 1,000. Birthplace of Grandparents The data on birthplace of grandparents are less complete and less accurate than for the parents. However, there were 639 American-born grandparents whose birthplaces, as reported, were classifiable. Foreign-born grandparents were omitted from this comparison because of the deficiency of obtaining population data. Whether we consider the parents or the grandparents, there is a much larger number of cases in the urban groups than was true for the general population at the two periods, 1890 and 1860. However, the significance of this fact is not very clear, since the gifted subjects whose parents and grandparents we are considering were residents in cities. Figures based upon gifted children found in rural schools would undoubtedly be very different. Perhaps the point of greatest interest is the fact that, notwithstanding the small urban population in the United States in 1860, the percent of grandparents of rural birth is as low as that for parents. The birthplaces of American-born parents of our gifted were tabulated by state, and although the figures have little significance in the absence of accurate comparative data for the general population of the cities canvassed, they are given for whatever they may be worth. Table 11 is displayed on the page, Birthplace of American-born parents by state. Occupation of Fathers In the home blank, spaces were provided for reporting fathers' main occupation at successive ages, including age when each occupation that had been followed was begun, and the number of years it was followed. The replies were sufficiently definite for 560 fathers in the main group to permit of classification of occupation. The method of classification employed is that used in the United States Census Report, Professional, Commercial, Industrial and Public Service with subgroups under each. The results are as follows for the main occupation of fathers at the time the report was made. A list is displayed on the page with two columns, professional group and number. Lawyers, 33. Engineers of college degrees, 28. Teachers, total 30. 30. In colleges and universities, 10. High school, 13. Elementary, 3. Unclassified, 4. Physicians and surgeons, 23. Clergymen, 15. Writers, 9. Dentists, 9. Musicians, 6. Architects, 3. Inventors, 2. Other professions, 5. Total professional, 163. Proportion of all fathers, 29.1%. Commercial group. 
Executives and managers, 92. Salesmen and insurance agents, 43. Retail dealers, small stores, 38. Clerical workers, 38. Wholesale dealers, brokers and owners of large retail establishments, 19. Manufacturers, 11. Druggists, 8. Editors and publishers, 5. Expert accountants, 5. Total commercial, 259. Proportion of all fathers, 46.2%. Industrial group. Carpenters, 16. Mechanics and machinists, 14. Tailors, 7. Painters, 6. Contractors, 5. Barbers, 5. Florists, 4. Telegraph operators, 3. Butchers, 3. Photographers, 2. Farmers, 2. Lithographer, 1. Foreman, 1. Pattern maker, 1. Landscape gardener, 1. Sea captain, 1. Baker, 1. Potter, 1. Cobbler, 1. Practically unskilled, including such occupations as teamster, expressman, waiter, 1, day labourer, 1, etc. 38. Total industrial, 113. Proportion of all fathers, 20.2%. Public service group, postmen and post office clerks, 8. City firemen, 4. Army and Navy officers, 3. Soldiers and sailors, 3. Mayors, 2. Other city officials, 3. Policemen, 1. Civil service clerks, 1. Total public service, 25. Proportion of all fathers, 4.5%. As summary tables are displayed on the page, with professional group, public service group, commercial group and industrial group, compared to percentages of proportion among fathers of gifted children, proportion of population of Los Angeles and San Francisco by 1910 census, percent quota among fathers of gifted children. In the industrial group, only one man gives his occupation as labourer, which is 0.2% of our fathers as compared with 15.0% of the general population classified as labourers in the census report. Accordingly, fathers of gifted children yield only 1 77th of their quota for this class. The man referred to was a farmer who had moved to Berkeley and taken a position as labourer at the University of California in order that his children might attend college. Regrouping according to his Torzig's five great classifications, we have the following. 1. Professional, including, besides the professions listed above, editors and publishers, army and navy officers, mayors and city officials. The total of the professional group now becomes 176. 2. Semi-professional and business groups, including two subgrades of white-collar workers below the professional level. A. Executives and business managers, sales and insurance agents. Wholesale dealers, brokers, owners of large retail establishments, manufacturers, expert accountants, photographers, lithographers, and landscape gardeners. Total, 175. B. Retail dealers and owners of small stores, clerical workers, druggists, contractors, florists, telegraph operators, postmen and post office clerks, civil service clerks. Total, 105. Total of 2A and 2B. 280. 3. Skilled labour group, including carpenters, mechanics, machinists, tailors, butchers, farmers, painters, foremen, pattern makers, potters, bakers, cobblers, barbers, city firemen, soldiers, sailors, and policemen. Total 66. 4. Semi skilled or slightly skilled labourers, including teamsters, expressmen, waiters, etc. Total 37. 5. Common labourer. Total 1. The percentage distribution for these five classes is as follows. Professional, 31.4%. Semi-professional in business, 50%. A, higher group, 31.2%. B, lower group, 18.8%. Skilled labourer, 11.8%. Semi-skilled to slightly skilled, 6.6%. Common labour, 0.13%. The above data are in line with the findings of others on the social origin of superior ability. Some of the most important of these findings are summarised below. Cattell, fathers of 885 leading American men of science. Professional, 43.1% in general population, 3%. Agriculture, 22.2% in general population, 41.1%. Manufacturing and trade, 35.7%. In general population, 
34.1%. Edwin L. Clark, 666 American Men of Letters. Professional classes, 49.2%. Commercial classes, 22.7%. Agricultural classes, 20.9%. Mechanical, clerical, and unskilled, 7.2%. Alphonse de Condol, European Men of Science. There are three columns displayed with noble, wealthy, gentlemanly classes, middle class, workers, farmers, etc. Compared with percentages for 100 foreign associates of the Paris Academy of Science, 40 French members of both London and Berlin Academies. Noble, wealthy, gentlemanly classes, 41% of 100 foreign associates, 28% of 40 French members of both London and Berlin Academies. Middle class, 52%, 47%. Workers, farmers, etc., 7%, 25%. Havelock Ellis, 1,030 British men and women of genius. Upper classes or good family, 18.5%. Church, 16.7%. Law, 7.1%. Medicine, 3.6%. Miscellaneous professions, 7.8%. Army and Navy, 6.1%. Officials, clerks, etc., 3.2%. Commercial, 18.8%. Crafts, 9.2%. Yeomen and farmers, 6%. Artesians and unskilled, 2.5%. Perhaps only the last three classes above, including 17.5% of the cases, would rank below Class 2 of Torsig. The proportion of parents that are gifted below this level is 28.6%. Galton, 107 English men of science. Nobility and gentlemen, 9 cases. Army, Navy and Civil Office, 18 cases. Professions, 34 cases. Bankers, merchants and manufacturers, 43 cases. Farmers, 2 cases. Others, 1 case. The data most clearly comparable with our own are those of Cattle and Clark. By the method of which our gifted subjects were selected tends to reduce the numbers for the agricultural class and to increase somewhat those of the professional and commercial classes. Notwithstanding minor discrepancies, all of these investigations agree as to the existence of a very striking social hierarchy with respect to the production of superior individuals. There is one respect in which the contribution of the present study is unique. Earlier investigations had proved nothing more than that the upper social strata are more productive of men and women who have succeeded in achieving eminence. It has often been argued that this superiority in achievement should be credited, for the most part, to the larger opportunity for achievements enjoyed by members of the favoured classes. Our data show that individuals of the various social classes present the same differences in early childhood, a fact which strongly suggests that the casual factor lies in original endowment rather than environmental influences. Bar of scale ratings of occupational status. In order to arrive at a more accurate determination of the occupational status of the fathers of our gifted children, we have made use of the bar scale of occupational intelligence. What we want is a hierarchy of the occupations with respect to the relative demands which they make upon intelligence. The census classification, obviously, is not intended to serve this purpose. And although anyone can take the census categories and arrange such a hierarchy for himself, there is a large probable error in any such individual arrangement. The error results partially from personal bias and partially from insufficient information regarding the actual requirement of the hundreds of occupations which exist. In order to reduce the personal equation in rating the intelligence value of occupations, Mr. F. E. Barr drew up a list of 121 representative occupations, each definitely and concretely described, and had 20 judges rate them on a scale of 0 to 100 according to the grade of intelligence which each was believed to demand. The ratings were then distributed and P.E. values were computed for all the occupations. The P.E. values transmitted express, in the case of each occupation, the number of units of intelligence which according to the composite opinion of these 20 judges, the occupation demands for ordinary success. The table is displayed on the page displaying the scale value, the occupation and description. 
0.0 Hobo 1.54 Odd Jobs 2.11 Garbage Collector 3.38 Circus Rustabout Does Heavy Rough Work About Circus 3.44 Hostler Care of Horses in Livery Feed in Sales Stables 3.57 RR Second Hand Replaces Ties, etc., under supervision. 3.62, day labourer. On street in shop or factory as rust about. 3.99, truck layer. Does heavy work under supervision. 4.2, waterworks man. A variety of odd jobs, all unskilled. 4.29, miner. Digger and shoveler, etc. 4.81, longshoreman. Loads and unloads cargoes. 4.91, farm labourer, unskilled and usually inefficient. 4.98, laundry worker, various kinds of work in laundry, practically unskilled. 5.27, bartender. 5.41, teamster. 5.44, sawmill worker, heavy work, little skill required. 5.59, dairy hand, milking, care of stock under supervision. 5.81, drayman. 5.87, Delivery Man, delivers groceries, etc., with team or auto. 6.14, Junk Man, Collector of Junk. 6.42, Switch Man, Tending Switch in Railroad Yards. 6.66, Smelter Worker, Metal Pourers, Casting Collectors, etc. 6.27, Tire Repairer, in General Automobile Repair Shop. 6.85, Cobbler and shoemaker, repairman in shoe shop. 6.86, munition worker, average. 6.92, barber, not owner, has charge of chair. 6.93, moving picture operator, operates machine which protects pictures. 7.02, vulcanizer, understands the process of hardening rubber. 7.05, General Repairman. Repairs broken articles. Uses woodworking tools. 7.06. Ship Rigger. Installing cordage system on sailing vessels. Working under supervision. 7.17. Telephone Operator. 7.19. Cook. In restaurant or small hotel. 7.23. Streetcar Conductor. 7.24. Farm Tenants. On small trucks of land. 7.3. Brakeman. On freight or passenger trains. 7.33. City firefighter. Handles the ordinary firefighting apparatus. 7.39. Railroad fireman. On freight or passenger train. 7.54. Policeman. Average patrolman. 7.71. Structural steel worker. Heavy work demanding some skill. 7.73. Telegraph and Telegraph Line Man. 7.74. Bricklayer. 7.79. Butcher. Not shop owner. Able to make cuts properly. 7.91. Baker. 8.02. Metal Finisher. Polishes and lacquers metal fixtures, etc. 8.04. Plasterer. Knowledge of materials used necessary. 8.08. General Painter. Paints houses, buildings and various structures. 8.22, Harness Maker. 8.4, Tinsmith. Makes vessels, utensils, etc. from plated sheet metal. 8.49, Letter Carrier. 8.5, Forest Ranger. 8.58, Stonemason. 8.75, Plumber. Average trained plumber employee. 8.89, Gardening, Truck Farming. Owns and operates small plots. 8.99. Electric Repairman. Repairs electrical utensils, devices and machines. 9.28. Bookbinder. Sets up and binds books of all sorts. 9.37. Carpenter. Knows woodworking tools, can follow directions in various processes of wood construction work. 9.37. Potter. Makes jars, jugs, crockery, earthenware, etc. 9.54. Tailor. Employee in tailoring shop. 9.72, Salesman, 
in dry goods, hardware, grocery stores, etc. 10.11. Telegraph operator in small town. 10.21. Undertaker. In small town, six months a year, split schooling. 10.26. Station agent. In small town, access baggage man, freight agent operator, etc. 10.26. Mechanical repairman. In shop or factory, keeps machines in condition. 10.29. Dairy owner and manager. Small dairy, 50 to 100 cows. 10.53. Metal pattern maker. 10.54. Wood pattern maker. 10.54. Lithographer. Makes prints from designs which he puts on stone. 10.76. Linotype operator. 10.83. Photographer. City, 1,000 to 5,000. A few months training experience in studio. 10.86. Detective. Traces, clues, etc. Employee of Detective Bureau. 10.99. Electrotyper. Prepares woodcuts. 10.17. Travelling salesman. Sells drugs, groceries, hardware, dry goods, etc. 11.34. Clerical work. Bookkeepers, recorders, abstractors, etc. 11.35. Railroad pass conductor. 11.51. Storekeeper and owner. Small town retail dealer. General or special store. 11.74. Foreman. Small factory shop. 11.78. Stenographer. Write shorthand or uses typewriter. 12.02. Librarian. In small institutional public library. 12.06. Nurse and Monsieur. Graduate. 12.74. Chef. Employed in large first class hotels. 12.84. Editor. Small paper. Considerable job work. 12.89. Primary teacher. No college training. Two years special training. 12.96. Landscape gardener. 13.08. Grammar grade teacher. Normal graduate expects to make professional teaching. 13.2. Osteopath. Training equal to college graduate. 13.21. Pharmacist. In town or from 1,000 to 5,000 population. 13.29. Master Mechanic. Thorough knowledge in his field of mechanics. 13.3. Music Teacher. Two to four years special training, not college graduate. 13.31. Manufacturer. Employs from 10 to 50 men. Makes simple articles. 13.54. Dentist. Graduate. Two to five years experience in small town. 13.58. Art Teacher. In high school. Three or four years special training. 13.71 Surveyor, Transit Man, City or Country Surveyor. 13.31 Train Dispatcher, Must Be Mentally Alert. 14.45 Landowner and Operator, Very Large Farms or Ranches. 14.7 Musician, Successful Player or Singer in Good Company. 10.05 Secretarial Work, Private Secretary to High State or National Officials. 15.14. High school teacher. College normal graduate. Not the most progressive. 15.15. Preacher. Minister of town of 1,000 5,000. College graduate. 15.42. Industrial chemist. Thorough knowledge of the chemicals of manufacturing processes. 15.43. Mechanical engineer. Designs and constructs machines and machine tools. 15.71. Teacher in college. Degree A, B or AM. Not the most progressive. 15.75. Lawyer. In town of moderate size. Income 1,000 to 5,000. 15.86. Technical engineer. Thorough knowledge of the process of an industry. 16.18. Artist. High class painter of portraits, etc. 16.26. Mining engineer. Thorough knowledge of mining and extraction of metals. 16.28 Architect. Training equal to college graduate. 16.58 Great Wholesale Merchant. This is covering one or more states. 16.59 Consulting Engineer. In charge of Corps of Engineers. 16.64 Educational Administrator. Supplies City 2000 to 5000. 
college normal graduate. Superintendent of city, 2005,000, college normal graduate, 16.71, position, 6 to 8 years preparation, above high school income, 5,000 and up. 16.91, journalist, high school writer or editor. 17.5, publisher, high class magazine and newspaper or periodical, etc. 17.81, university professor, has AM or PhD, writes, teaches and does research. 18.06, great merchant, owns and operates a million dollar business. 18.14, musician, Paderewski. 18.33, high national official, cabinet officers, foreign ministers, etc. 18.85, writer, Van Dyke. 19.45, research leader, like Binet or Pasteur. 19.73, surgeon, Mayo Brothers. 20.71, inventive genius, Edison type. In the use of the scale, it is only necessary to compare the occupation which is to be rated with the occupations whose scale values are known, and to assign it the value possessed by the scale occupation which it most nearly matches. Intermediate values may be used in rating occupations which do not appear in the scale. It has been found that different judges agree fairly closely in rating the intellectual demands of occupations by this scale. It cannot be claimed that the bar scale values correspond exactly to the facts, but they unquestionably approximate the facts more closely than would the judgment of any one individual. In rating the parents who are gifted children for occupational status, additional evidence from other parts of the blanks was taken into consideration. For example, if a man who had not had college training was reported as an electrical engineer, the rating was changed to that of electrician or master mechanic, etc., according to the information which was available from other sources. The reports from the field workers, visits to the homes were often found useful in this connection. All statements concerning occupations were carefully compared with other known facts before being rated, and wherever there was doubt, a lower rather than a higher rating was assigned, in order to counterbalance any unconscious bias which might exist in the mind of the assistant who made the ratings. The most reliable comparative data on this head are probably the results of the United States Census. As the occupational statistics for the 1920 census were not yet available, the 1910 census classification of the adult male population of the cities of San Francisco, Los Angeles and Oakland was used. The problem was to compute a mean occupational rating of the entire adult male population of the above cities on the bar scale. Each occupation listed for these cities in the census report was rated on the bar scale, and each rating was multiplied by the number reported in the corresponding occupational group. The process was simply that of deriving a weighted average. Interpolations and rating were resorted to freely, and in this case, whenever there was doubt, a higher rather than a lower rating was given. This is the reverse of the procedure which was followed in rating the parents of our gifted, as the effect of bringing the two groups close together than they would have been found to be had, or the facts been known. It was thought better to err, if at all, on this side. In dealing with the census figures, the question arose as to what procedure should be followed with the very large group of adult males for whom no occupation was reported. It seemed fairly certain that upon the whole, these persons would rank below the average of the population in general, since a large proportion of them would be day labourers, temporarily unemployed. Two population ratings were worked out. The first, A, based on the assumption that the percentage not reported in the census would have the same distribution of occupational ratings as those reported. The second, B, by assigning to the group not reported a constant rating of 4.0 PE, which is above that of a day labourer and corresponds closely to that of a railroad track layer. The latter is probably a generous figure. Table 12 gives the distributions, means, and standard deviations for fathers of one gifted child. Fathers of more than one, total fathers of gifted children, and adult males of the general population, the latter by two methods of calculation. 
In connection with columns 1 and 2, it should be noted that a majority of the siblings of our gifted group have not been tested. If all have been tested, it is probable that the difference between the two columns would have been greater. As it is, the difference is 3.82 times the PE of the difference. In 34 cases, the information regarding the father was too indefinite to permit of a bar rating. Designations as indefinite as teacher, salesman, or writer were thrown out. It is not quite certain that the omitted cases were at least not below the average of total fathers of the gifted group. Another fact regarding Table 12 that should be noted is the absence of ratings higher than 16 for the general population, last two columns. This is due to the fact that the census descriptions of the higher professional occupations are less definite than those in the bar scale. More definite information would have raised the ratings of a certain proportion of the population, cases here rated 16, and possibly of some rated 15 or 14. But because of the small numbers, such changes would not have affected to any considerable extent the average rating for the general population. Table 12 is displayed on the page. Bar scale ratings for fathers of gifted and for male adults of the generality. The mean of 12.77 for total fathers of gifted corresponds fairly closely to the bar rating of a stenographer, librarian in a small city or primary teacher. The mean of 7.92 for the general population corresponds to the bar rating of a plasterer, baker or metal finisher. Grouping the data of Table 12, we have the following comparison between total fathers of gifted and adult males of the generality, Method B. Another table is displayed on the page, comparing the rating, fathers of gifted, and adults of the generality. Rating of 15 or above, 26.8% fathers of gifted, 2.2% adults of the generality. Rating 12 to 15. 26.8% fathers of gifted, 4.5% adults of the generality. Rating 9 to 12, 36.1% fathers of gifted, 37.0% adults of the generality. Rating 6 to 9, 8.9% fathers of gifted, 13.4% adults of the generality. Rating 3 to 6, 1.3% fathers of gifted. 42.9% adults of the generality. Economic status. For 170 families of the gifted, Dr. Bronson obtained a statement, usually from the mother, of the approximate annual income. These families are not selected. The question was asked in consecutive cases at the time of the medical examination, and less than half a dozen parents refused to answer. As will be seen from Table 13, the economic status of a majority of the families is fairly comfortable, but there are few cases of wealth. The median income reported is $3,333, the mean $4,705. The median in this case is more significant than the mean. 60 or 35.3% of the families report an income below $2,500 which is probably no more than the annual earnings of the average skilled labourer in California in 1923. Only 29.17% report the income above 7500 and 7, 4.1%, above $12,000. A few families in this group of 170 and several of our families not in this group are living in what might truly be called poverty. Table 13 is displayed on the page. Income reported by 170 families of gifted children. Home ratings on the white hair scale. One third of the homes of our gifted children were rated by the field assistants on the white hair scale for grading home conditions devised by Dr. J. Harold Williams. Observations were made during conferences with parents at their homes and the pertinent facts were recorded immediately after departure. The 288 homes graded are believed to be fairly representative of the group. The scale contains a scorecard with directions for grading each of five different items on a scale of 5 to 1, 6 to 0 in exceptional cases. Necessities, neatness, size, parental conditions, and parental supervision. The meaning of the different grades is defined in a very concrete way by the scorecard for each of the items graded. 
the sum of the separate ratings is the home index. Table 14 gives the distribution of all your scores for each item, with mean and standard deviation. Table 14 is displayed on the page, but your scale ratings of 288 homes are given to children. Below are given the means in comparison with the means reported by Dr. Williams for 50 unselected homes and for 120 homes of delinquent boys. In the case of the gifted, the ratings for the separate items tend to be very uniform, with a low SD for each. On all items, the homes of the gifted rate much higher than those of delinquents, with the greatest difference in parental supervision. The unselected homes approximate those of the gifted on all items except parental supervision. The difference in mean hope index of 22.9% for gifted and 13.9% for delinquents is very large. The total ratings of the 288 homes of gifted children were distributed as follows. Total rating 6 to 8, 1 case. Total rating 9 to 11, 1 case. Total rating 12 to 14, 4 cases. Total rating 15 to 17, 7 cases. Total rating 18 to 20, 41 cases. Total rating 21 to 23, 86 cases. Total rating 24 to 26, 137 cases. Total rating 27 to 29, 11 cases. Divorce and separation of parents. Total on this point of interest, not only in connection with the general quality of home environment our gifted children have enjoyed, but also an indication of the frequency with which the parents of such children are socially unadaptable or temperamentally exceptional. The home blank contained the following questions. Are parents divorced? If so, when? If not divorced, are parents separated? How long separated? The data thus obtained were in many cases checked up at the time of home visits. The facts as reported are as follows for the 578 families in our main group. Another table displayed on the page with three columns Divorces reported or otherwise known, number 30, 5.2%. Fathers separated, 11, 1.9%. Facts not known, 5, 0.8%. Families known to be unbroken, 532, 92.1%. There are no strictly comparable data for the general population from which these parents come. In 1916, there were 5,573 divorces and 30,996 marriages in California, or a ratio of 1 to 5.56. The ratios were as follows in the three countries with which we are here chiefly concerned. Los Angeles County, 1 to 5.24. San Francisco County, 1 to 4.35. Alameda County, 1 to 4.71. The three counties combined... 1 to 4.77. However, the proportion is lower for fruitful than for barren marriages, and we are here concerned with fruitful marriages only. In regard to the 5,573 divorces granted in California in 1916, certain additional facts were available in 5,196 cases. In the case of 2,088 of these, 5,196 divorces Dependent children were reported. This is 40.2%. The report was no dependent children, in the case of 57.6%, while in 2.2% this item was not reported. Roughly speaking, one may say that for 100 marriages in California, there are 18 divorces, and that in 7 or 40% of these cases, there are dependent children. Assuming that 80 of the 100 marriages are fruitful, we may take the ratio of 7 to 80, or 8.75%, as a figure with which to compare the 5.2% divorces in the families of our gifted. Making considerable allowance for various sources of error in this comparison, it seems reasonably certain that the divorce records of our 578 families are better than for the population to which they belong. Neighbourhood Ratings Dr. Williams has devised a scale for rating neighbourhoods similar to that for rating homes. It is unfortunate that lack of time prevented the use of this scale for rating the neighbourhood environment of our gifted. Instead, a simpler method was used. In visiting a home, the field assistant observed the surroundings and recorded an unanalyzed rating from 1 to 5 as follows. 
1. Very superior. 2. Superior. 3. Average. 4. Inferior. 5. Very inferior. The average rating of 305 neighbourhoods, chiefly those in which the homes that had been rated were located, was 2.25. Standard deviation, 0 0.94. The distribution was as follows. Very superior, 76. Superior, 108. Average, 92. Inferior, 28. Very inferior. No comparative data for unselected homes are available. But if the ratings had been given as intended by the scale, the average neighbourhood in which the gifted child resides is about the same as the average for the cities in question. We have seen that the average home index, however, is very superior, notwithstanding the modest average income. The conclusion seems to be that although the financial status of the parents of the average gifted child is such as to necessitate living in an average neighbourhood, the intelligence and character of the parents are such as to ensure that the internal conditions of the home will be above the average. The data presented later in this chapter on the education of parents support this conclusion. School Reports on Home Environment In the school blank, the teacher was asked to give significant facts regarding the child's home environment, e.g. imperfect parental control, excessive indulgence, undue severity, systematic home instruction, unsuitable companions, etc. The question was answered for 417 gifted children and for 319 of the control group, unselected children. The results were tabulated separately by sex, but have been here combined, as no significant sex differences were found. It should be noted that the wording of the question is such as hardly to call for reply unless significant facts regarding the child's home environment were known to the teacher. Or is that the question is especially designed to bring to light unfavorable conditions? Probably in a large majority of cases, failure to answer the question means that no especially significant facts particularly facts of unfavorable nature, were known to the teacher. However, the percentages have been based on the number for whom the question was answered. Probably the most significant fact is that unfavorable home conditions were mentioned for only 8.6% of the gifted as compared with 24.1% of the control group. Table 15 is displayed on the page, School Reports on the Home Environment. There are three columns displayed with replies received, and the gifted by number and percent, and the control by number and percent. Paid employment of gifted children. In the home blank, suitable spaces were provided for reporting the paid employment the child had had, together with kind, age when begun, number of hours weekly, and length of time continued. Of 330 boys, 52 or 16 percent have at some time had paid employment outside the home. In addition to this, Another 16% had received payments for definite services within the home or to immediate neighbours. Of 273 girls, 5 or less than 2% have been employed outside the home, and 33 have been paid for services within the home. Salaries range from trifling sums up to $400 a week, the latter for motion picture stars. Ages at the time of first employment range from 2 years in motion pictures up to 12. A table is displayed on the page listing kinds of employment outside of home. 1. Paper routes, 30 cases. 2. Delivery boy around boy, 12 cases. 3. Motion pictures or stage work, 7 cases. 4. Clerk and store, 5 cases. 5. Church choir, 2 cases. 6. Miscellaneous minor employment, 21 cases. Total, 77. More than one kind of employment listed for same child, 20. Total cases, 57. Education of Parents and Grandparents The data for parents consists of reports on the following item in the home blank. Draw a line under the highest school, grade reached. Father, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. High school, 1, 2, 3, 4. College, 1, 2, 3, 4. Postgrad. Other kinds of schools attended by father and length of time. The question was asked separately for mothers. For each grandparent, the question asked was simply... Extent of education, school grade reached. The figures of Table 16 may be too low, owing to a natural tendency to interpret the term grade reached as meaning grade completed. 
It will be noted that the median grade reached by the parents was 12.1%, which falls just within the first year of college, and that there was little difference between the amount of schooling of fathers and mothers. Table 16 is displayed on the following page. Schooling of parents and grandparents of gifted children. The central tendencies and variabilities for the data of Table 16 are as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing the fathers of gifted boys and girls, the mothers of the gifted, or parents, or grandfathers, or grandmothers, and all grandparents, compared to the amount of schooling and grades by median, main, and standard deviation. Parents had had schooling in addition to that shown in Table 16 as follows. Business school, 114. Normal school, 48. Law school, not included under college, 26. Evening school, 21. Medical school, not included under college, 18. Conservatory of music, 16. Art school, 10. Dramatic school, 9. Technical school, 8. Nurses training school, 7. Travel and study abroad, 7. Miscellaneous, 49. Total, 333. Percent of total group, 27.5%. Reports are available for only two-thirds of the grandparents. Table 16 shows the median grade reached by the grandfathers and grandmothers to be 8.9, or nearly through the ninth grade. However, the mean for the grandfathers is 10.8, as compared with 9.7 for the grandmothers. If the schooling of all grandparents had been reported, the means and medians would probably have been lower. The home blank provided separate spaces for reporting the college degrees each parent had obtained and where they were obtained. In treating the results on this item, only colleges and universities of recognised standing were included. All degrees requiring less than four years of study after high school graduation were excluded, as DDS, also DD, when it was obtained from a theological seminary of less than standard college grade. For this reason, the percents given are somewhat lower than they would have been had they been based on the data of Table 16. The table is split on the page with three columns. Father only holds degree. Number of children, 98. Percent of all children, 16.2. Mother only holds degree. Number of children, 18. Percent of all children, 3%. Both parents hold degree, number of children 44, percent of all children 7.3%. One of both parents hold degree, number of children 160, percent of all children 26.4%. That is, more than a quarter of these children have at least one parent who is a college graduate. There are 204 individual parents who are college graduates, which is 16.9% of the entire number. There are no comparative data on the proportion of adults of corresponding age in the general population who are college graduates, but it's doubtful whether it will be more than one fifteenth or one twentieth of the proportion found in this group. The median amount of schooling for the native born white draft for the United States Army in the recent war, as given in the official report, was 6.9, or not quite through the seventh grade. For the same group, the proportion of college graduates was approximately 1%. The figures reported for the Army agree closely with those of Thorndike, based upon school reports. In either case, however, are the data exactly comparable with those for parents of our gifted? These should be compared with adults in the generality of the corresponding age. The mean age of the United States Army draft of 1917 and 1918 was probably 15 years lower than that of the parents of our gifted as the main amount of schooling in the general population has risen considerably in recent years, the showing made by our parents is even better than it at first appears. Size of Home Library One indication of the cultural status of a home is the number of books it contains. The home blank contained the following item. Jot down a rough estimate of the number of books in the home library. This information was sought primarily for its significance in connection with individual children but the figures are also of interest for the group. Unfortunately, no comparative data are at hand for unselected children, but such would probably show but a small fraction of the mean, 328, reported for our gifted. The results for the 547 children for whom reports are available are as follows. 
a table is displayed on the page, comparing the book's estimate to the number and percent. No books, 7, 1.1%. 10 or fewer, 15, 2.3%. 25 books, 41, 6.4%. 50 books, 119, 18.5%. 100 books, 215, 33.4%. 500 or more, 106, 16.5%. 750 books, 57, 80.9%. 1,000 books, 43 6.7%, 2,000 books, 6, 0.9%. Total range reported, 0 to 6,000. Median, 202. Mean, 328. Standard deviation, 458. It is impossible to say how seriously the above reports have been affected by constant errors in the direction of overestimate or underestimate. It is unlikely that serious intentional exaggeration occurred in many cases, but it's conceivable that honest estimates of this kind tend to run either too high or too low. Summary 1. Data on racial origin indicate that, in comparison with the general population of the cities concerned, our gifted show a 100% excess of Jewish blood, a 25% excess of parents who are of native parentage, a probable excess of Scotch ancestry, and a very great deficiency of Latin and Negro ancestry. 2. Half of the parents were born in cities of 10,000 population or over, and almost a quarter in cities for towns of 1,000 to 10,000, leaving only a quarter for rural districts and towns or villages of less than 1,000. The grandparents were only slightly oftener of rural origin than were the parents. 3. Classification of the occupation of fathers into the five grades of Torsi gave 31.4% for class 1, professional, 50% for class 2, semi-professional and business, 11.8% for class 3, skilled labour, and a total of 6.8% for class 4 and 5, semi-skilled and unskilled labour. Early investigations have shown that social class is highly correlated with adult achievement. This study shows that it is highly correlated with intelligence in fairly early childhood. 4. Ratings of the occupation of parents on the bar scale give a mean which is very far above the mean bar ratings for the general population. 5. The median income of 170 random homes of the gifted was $3,333, with a mean of $4,705, and a standard deviation of $3,805. 6. Ratings of 288 random homes of the gifted on the Whittier scale for home grading yielded a mean score above that for unselected homes and far above that for homes of delinquent boys. 7. In the case of 5.24% of families of the gifted, the parents are divorced, and in the case of 1.9%, they are separated. These figures are lower than those for fruitful marriages in the general population of California. 8. The neighbourhoods in which 305 random homes of gifted children were located gave a mean rating of only a little above average. 9. The school reports unfavorable home conditions for only 8.6% of the gifted group, as compared with 24.1% of the control group. 10. Approximately 16% of our boys and 2% of our girls have at some time had paid employment outside the home. A maximum salary was $400 a week. 11. The mean amount of schooling for both fathers and mothers is approximately 12 grades, with a standard deviation of about 3.5 grades. The mean for grandfathers is 10.8 and for grandmothers 9.7. The average parent of the gifted child has covered about twice as many school grades as the average adult in the population. 12. A quarter of our subjects have at least one parent who is a college graduate. About 17% of the parents hold a degree from a college with standard grade. 13. Libraries in the homes of our subjects range in size from 0 to 6,000 books with median of 202, and a mean of 328, standard deviation 458. 14. The data of this chapter offers considerable indirect evidence that the hereditary of our gifted subjects is much superior than that of the average individual. End of section 4.
Section 4 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Madison Terman and others This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 5 Intellectually Superior Relatives it has thus not been possible to undertake an extended study of the hereditary of our gifted children, but the facts presented in the preceding chapter indicate that a majority have sprung from families of distinctly better than average ability. The purpose of this chapter is to summarize such information as we have been able to secure with reference to the frequency of gifted relatives. Four pages, eight and a half by eleven inches, of the home information blank were devoted to questions regarding family history. The questions follow. The home information blank was filled out for 94% of the children in our main group, but not always with the completeness that could have been desired. However, there were few questions which were not answered, in as many as 90% of the blanks returned. The trouble lay not so much in failure to answer, as in the failure to record all the facts that would have been significant. Sometimes the facts were not known, but frequently they were omitted simply because the parents did not consider them important. The standards of performance and culture in these families are so high that a relative who is a highly successful physician or lawyer or banker is likely to be described as of average ability, such as is taken for granted. There are many cases of failure to mention fairly close relatives who were really distinguished. In the case of one subject for whom Seven eminent relatives were listed in the home blank. Further investigation brought to light 34 sufficient distinction to be included in Appleton's Cyclopedia of American Biography or Who's Who. Doubtless in many cases, the mere labour of writing down the information requested was the deterring factor. The small amount of space provided in the home blank in which to record facts about gifted relatives also limited the information secured. Home visits by the field assistants and correspondents have supplanted considerably the data supplied in the home blank, but information on heredity is still extremely fragmentary. Siblings in the main group The 643 children discovered in the main search belong to 578 families. At the time the search was conducted, Eight other children in these families qualified on the Terman Group test for the high school gifted group. One qualified at the outside Binnock Group, and five were included because they came within five points of qualifying on the Binnett. This brought the number to 657, or an average of 1.136 per family. Not counting the five cases with slightly below standard IQ, the total is 651, or an average of 1.126 per family. A year later, 19 additional cases in these families qualified as a result of testing 48 sibs who had not been tested before. At present, therefore, the 578 families have furnished 676 subjects, or an average of 1.17 per family. There are at least 481 sibs, the number is growing, who have not been tested, but we estimate that among these are probably between 50 and 75 who are capable of reaching the standard set for the group. Below will be found the number of families with one, two, three, four, or five children who qualified for the gifted group. Two sets of figures are given. A. Those based upon the 658 children discovered in the original search, 643 of the main group and 15 others, and B. Those which include, in addition to the 18 cases discovered by tests of sieves a year later. A table is displayed on the page, displaying several columns with families furnishing one gifted subject, compared to A and B. The number of families furnishing more than one subject would, of course, have been much smaller, had no special effort been made to test sibs who had already qualified in the usual way as a result of the school search. We estimate, however, that even apart from this advantage, 578 families would have yielded approximately 600 subjects. Considering the highly selected nature of our group, the likelihood of a family furnishing two subjects by mere chance 
is very remote. Not more than one child in 200 in the general school population is capable of satisfying the standard. The families represented in our group probably have, on an average, not more than two children attending the public schools. Reckoning the number in schools too, a given family would have one chance in a hundred of furnishing one subject. The likelihood of one family furnishing two subjects by chance alone would be one over a hundred by one over a hundred, or one in ten thousand. Accordingly, by chance alone, we should not have expected a single family to have yielded two subjects. Actually, 71 furnished, 2, and 82 or more. Taking our estimate that 20 families would have done so, even if no special search had been carried on among SIBs, this would be 346 times the number which chance alone would have given. The record of 71 families with two children is on the same basis of reckoning. 1,228 times as high as chance would give. In so far as gifted sibs have been missed, this record is lower than it deserves to be. On the other hand, it is possible that teachers in nominating children for the test may have been inclined to favour the sib of a child who had made an exceptional school record. However, even if we make considerable allowance for this possibility, the showing made by these 578 families must still be considered remarkable. Relatives in the Hall of Fame Of the 62 members of the Hall of Fame, 14, or 22.58%, are known to be related to one or more children of our main gifted group. At least one Hall of Fame relative was reported for 15 children, or 2.3% of the group, and two or more for seven children. The relationships are given in Table 17. Table 17 is displayed on the page. Relatives in Who's Who Twelve of the 643 are known to have a parent or grandparent in Who's Who. 1921-22 These twelve children represent eight families, which gives an average of 1.5 gifted children for such families. There are three fathers, two mothers, and four grandfathers in Who's Who. Two sibs have mother and grandfather thus distinguished. Each of the two mothers has two children in the group, or the living offspring. Of the three fathers, one has two children in the group. All the children of these three fathers who have been tested have qualified. The above number is almost certainly too small, and it has not been possible to check all parents and grandparents against the numerous additions of who's who. It is also necessary to take into account the fact that half or more of these parents are still below the average age of first inclusion in who's who. Other parents in the group will doubtless yet attain this degree of distinction. The Who's Who group would have been much larger had the faculties of Stanford and the University of California been canvassed. Stanford does not enter at all in what we have called the main search, and the University of California faculty was only partially canvassed. Of 128 old cases whom we have been following for several years, 12 are known to have a parent in Who's Who. The three of the 578 fathers and two of the 578 mothers in our main group should have attained this distinction by midlife is many times the number chance would give. Brimhall finds the average age of first inclusion in Who's Who, Volume 6, to be 49.9 years. The average age of our 578 fathers is about 41 years, and that our 578 mothers about 37 years. Brimhall estimates the chance of a man of the generality getting into who's who was 1 in 823.5. For men, the average age to the fathers of our gifted children, the chances are probably less than 1 in 2,000. The actual number is 3 out of 578, which is about 10 times the number of chance would give. In the case of women of the generality, Brimhall finds that the chances are only 1 in 7,647 of inclusion in who's who. Of 578 mothers of our gifted, there are two of this distinction, which, considering the average age of 37 years, is many, many times the number of chance would give. Brimhall found that the father of a distinguished man of science is 98 times as likely to be listed in who's who as is a man of the generality 
and the brother of a distinguished man of science about 72 times as likely. One of the fathers in Who's Who is also one of Cattell's 1,000 most distinguished men of science. One parent is her college president, and one grandfather is a widely known man of science. The names of distinguished parents and grandparents are withheld to avoid identification of any of our subjects. Other relatives in Who's Who have been reported to the number of 35, which is probably below the actual. Four of these were first cousins of gifted children, two were aunts and one an uncle. The entire list is given in Table 18. Table 18 is displayed on the following pages. Other Relatives of Distinction There were 58 other relatives reported in the home blank of sufficient distinction to be named in standard encyclopedias of biography. These are listed below. Many relatives of perhaps equal distinction were excluded because no reference to them could be found in the biographical encyclopedias in the Stanford University Library. The list would probably have been considerably longer if foreign biographical encyclopedias had been more extensively consulted. Among the 58 are six signers of the Declaration of Independence, two presidents of the United States, two vice presidents, four governors of states or colonies, four generals, six writers, two inventors, four statesmen, three artists, and two judges of Supreme Courts. In Table 19, Appleton refers to Appleton's Cyclopedia of American Biography and National to the National Cyclopedia of American Biography. In each case, the relationship is given as reported in the home blank. An allowance must be made for occasional inaccuracy, especially if the designation of cousin relationships and in the number of great prefixes. The latter suffix to a child's number indicates that the child has one or more sibs, indicated by another letter suffix in the gift group. Table 19, Other Relatives of Distinction, is displayed on the following pages. Positions of Honour, Trust or Responsibility Held by Parents and Grandparents The data summarised in Table 20 are from the home blanks, which have been returned by 528 of the 578 families in the main gifted group at the time of tabulation. The list is known to be very incomplete, due to the frequent failure of parents to report honours of considerable importance. The positions of honour reported have been summarised under the headings political, religious or fraternal, professional or academic, business or financial, and miscellaneous. In many cases, two or more positions of honour were named for the same parent or grandparent. And unfortunately, at the time the tabulations were made, duplicate positions of honour were not separately recorded. Accordingly, the totals for each group refer to total number of honours, and not the number of parents or grandparents who have attained such honours. It is evident, however, that the proportion of gifted ancestors in this group of 528 families is extraordinarily high in comparison with the generality. Table 20, Positions of Honour, Trust or Responsibility Held by Parents and Grandparents is displayed on the following pages. The table is divided between six columns, with professional group compared to the father, mother, grandfather, grandmother and total. A. Political. 1. Major national government officers as senators, representatives, etc. 2. Major state officers as above. 3. Mayor of city of 25,000 or more. 4. Mayor of city or town less than 25,000. 5. Important civic officers other than mayor. 6. Minor political officers. The totals recorded. Father, 64. Mother, 19. Grandfather, 158. Grandmother, 3. Total, 244. B. Religious or fraternal orders. 1. President or Vice President, state or large city branch of orders such as DAR, KC, etc. 2. Important church officers, bishop, etc. over large areas. 3. Miscellaneous club officers. 4. Miscellaneous church officers. 5. Class officers in college. Total Group B. Father, 214. Mother, 169. Grandfather, 191. Grandmother, 109. Total, 683. 
C. Professional or academic. 1. College president. 2. College trustee. 3. Teacher in college. 4. School principal or superintendent. 5. Miscellaneous professional honours. Total of group C. Father, 73. Mother, 25. Grandfather, 39. Grandmother, 3. Total, 140. D. Business or financial. 1. Superintendent or manager of large factory or corporation. 2. Bank president. 3. Bank director or trustee. Total for group D. Father, 51. Mother, 0. Grandfather, 46. Grandmother, 1. Total, 98. E. Miscellaneous. 1. Commission officer, Army or Navy. 2. Public speaker of note. Total for group E. Father, 17. Mother, 0. Grandfather, 27. Grandmother, 1. Total, 45. Incomplete list of distinguished relatives of three gifted sibs. We have not thus far been able to undertake the completion of any genealogies of our gifted families, although considerable material has been assembled for several. With some hesitation, owing to the incompleteness of our information, the available data are presented for one family. This family is doubtless above the average of our group, both as to number of distinguished relatives and as to completeness of family records. Nevertheless, there are many other families in the group, which, judging from such information as we have, would make almost or quite as good a showing. Most of the information regarding this family was obtained by Miss Goodenow from written or printed records, including genealogies, DAR records, and Appleton Encyclopedia of American Biography. On the home blank, only seven distinguished relatives were mentioned. Follow-up of the case brought to light 34 relatives sufficiently distinguished to be named in Appleton's Encyclopedia of American Biography, or in Who's Who, besides many others somewhat less distinguished. Of course, a majority of these relatives are too remote to be of much significance, individually, in the biological makeup of the proper city. But the significant fact is the frequency of which gifted relatives appear. The family shows a high order of selective mating throughout. In the following incomplete list of distinguished relatives, those designated by a star named Appleton's Encyclopedia or Who's Who, the names are grouped according to the generation to which they belong, counting back from the proper city. In order to preserve the anonymity of the immediate family, all names in the direct line are omitted in the first three generations. Table 21, Superior Relatives of a Gifted Family is displayed on the following pages, listing a series of generations from 1st to 10th. The A Family The A Family is a result of a Japanese-American marriage. There are five children, all but one of whom have qualified for our gifted group. That one is still too young to test. Girl, age 12, 8th grade, IQ 137. Boy, age 11. 8th grade, IQ 150. Girl, age 9. 5th grade, IQ 140. Boy, age 7. 2nd grade, IQ 147. Girl, age 1. Has not been tested. This is indeed a remarkable family, and the fact that it is the result of a mixed marriage makes it doubly interesting. This was the first, or one of the first, Japanese-American marriages in America and aroused much unfavorable comment at the time. The parents were married in Portland, Oregon, because of the difficulty of finding anyone in California who would consent to perform the ceremony. Following are a few facts regarding the hereditary of the children. Paternal. The father of Proposity was born in Japan. He had four years of high school education, later studied silk culture, and before coming to America, lectured on this and other subjects. In this country, he has followed several occupations, but is now a florist and nurseryman. His father was born in Japan, of Japanese parents, and was educated by a private tutor. He was a fencing master and producer of silkworm eggs. He was very fond of reading, was a good chess player, and was twice elected Kocho, or head of the town. Little is known of the paternal grandmother of the children, except that she was born in Japan, of Japanese parents, and that she was educated by a private tutor. Maternal The mother was born in California, 
and comes of exceptionally superior colonial ancestry. She attended college one year. She has held important offices in local churches and clubs and has published several poems and essays in newspapers and magazines. Her mother was born in California, had a high school education, is prominent in church and club circles, and lectures on home economics. She is descended from Charles Carroll of Carleton, a singer, and is related to Lerman Abbott. The maternal grandfather of the Propositi was born in Massachusetts. He is a prominent man and has held many church offices of more than local importance. After the San Francisco earthquake and fire, he was an outstanding figure in the work of rehabilitation. In the direct line of his ancestry are six colonial governors, including John Winthrop and William Bradford, and Elbridge, Jerry, a singer, and the fifth vice president of the United States. There are also in the ancestry of the proper city several writers, artists, judges, clergymen, and government officials. We have another mixed Japanese-American family represented in our group by a child of IQ 153, as in the A family, is a father who is of Japanese descent. Each of the parents comes of rather superior stock. Still another child of Japanese-American parents is included in our special group, showing artistic ability. In this case, the mother is Japanese. In our outside Bennett group, there is a child of 149 IQ of mixed Chinese-American parentage, father Chinese. All of these mixed marriages would have to be regarded, from a biological point of view, as highly successful. They illustrate the fact that in determining the quality of the offspring, the racial factor is much less important than the influence of near ancestors. The R family. This is a Romanian Jewish family of eight children, three of whom belong to our gifted group. Twin girls aged eight, fourth grade, IQs 142 and 131 and a girl, aged 10, 7th grade, IQ 139. A brother, IQ of 123, at age of 14, will complete high school at 15. He has been an honor student throughout his high school course, and has exceptional musical talent. He has played the clarinet several times for the Los Angeles Examiner of Radio Broadcasting Company, and has composed orchestral pieces. His 10-year-old sister is also musical, and sometimes accompanies him in broadcasting. The school records of the other children in his family are all very superior. The parents came to America at about the age of 20, practically penniless. The father worked at odd jobs, and the mother in a factory. Neither parent had had more than a few months of schooling in Romania. After coming to America, the father attended night school, which the mother was unable to do because of the children. When the oldest child began to attend school, the parents had him bring home his books in order they might study with him of evenings. They have continued to educate themselves, now read and write English well, and are unusually well informed on most subjects of general interest. The mother, especially, has read a great deal along lines of child training and child welfare, and shows remarkably good judgment in putting theory into practice. The family is still in very moderate financial circumstances. The father worked in a butcher shop for several years, but failing health recently made it necessary for him to find lighter work. They accordingly rented a tiny shop next to their home, which is in a foreign neighbourhood near the outskirts of the city, and have opened a small general store which the mother helps to look after. Their home contains only the barest necessities as far as furnishings are concerned, but there is a piano and a small library of well-chosen books, including the Book of Knowledge. Both parents appear to have decidedly superior intellectual ability. Certainly their opportunities have been no better than those of thousands of foreigners with stupid children whose inferior intellectual ability is so commonly ascribed to lack of educational advantages. The B Family In the B Family are four girls, all in the gifted group. One is a 15-year-old girl with a term and group test score of 191. She is an A student in all her work and plays the cello and piano. The second is 13 and has a Binet IQ of 137. She leads her class in the first year of high school and plays a cornet in the high school orchestra. The third is 11 years old and in the 8th grade. Her Binet IQ is 152. She plays a violin in the Los Angeles Children's Orchestra. 
Music teachers and musicians who have heard her play regard her as highly gifted musically. The fourth is nine years old and is in the sixth grade. Her IQ is 172. She learned to read at the age of four without instruction. She plays the flute and was admitted to the Los Angeles Children Orchestra after six months of instruction. The father of these children was manager of a sugar of milk factory and invented machinery for use in the factory. But he developed manic depressive insanity at the age of 53 and has since been confined in a sanitarium. The mother owns the manager's real estate office and supports the family. She had three years in college. The paternal grandfather was a teacher of Scotch and French descent. The paternal grandmother, also of Scotch and French descent, was a woman of very superior intelligence, but was mentally unbalanced for a period of two years at the time of the menopause. The maternal grandfather was entirely self-educated, but was a great reader and especially fond of Emerson and Carlyle. The maternal grandmother seems to have been appreciably above the average in intelligence. It is interesting that the four children of this family should combine exceptional musical ability with such marked intellectual superiority. Also that the ancestry during the two preceding generations gave no evidence of very exceptional musical talent. However, the mother plays a piano and is well informed along musical lines. Summary 1. The 578 families of the main group have yielded 676 subjects. Although nearly 500 of their sibs have not been tested, 73 families have yielded two subjects and died three or more. The number of families with two subjects is more than 1,200 times the number of chance would give. 2. Nearly a quarter of the members of the Hall of Fame are known to be related to one or more of our subjects. The number in our main group known to be so related is 15 or 2.3% of the entire number. 3. Although a majority of the parents are relatively young, five are listed in who's who, three fathers and two mothers. This is many times the number chance would give. Four grandfathers and 35 other relatives are known to appear in who's who. 4. Among 58 other eminent relatives are six signers of the Declaration of Independence, two presidents and two vice presidents of the United States, four generals, six writers, two inventors, four statesmen, three artists and two Supreme Court judges. 5. Parents and grandparents have held posts of responsibility in very great number, including 20 cases of a major national office, 26 a major state office, 67 a major religious or fraternal office, 4 college presidencies, 23 professorships in colleges, 74 positions as superintendent or manager of a large factory or corporation, and 18 bank presidencies. 6. There is one family in the group which has 34 known relatives sufficiently distinguished to be named in Appleton's Cyclopedia of American Biography, or in Who's Who, besides many others somewhat less distinguished. The indications that many other families in the group have genealogies highly less interesting. One of these is a family of five children, four of them in the gifted group, who are the offspring of a Japanese-American marriage. The data set forth in this chapter are very incomplete, but fragmentary as they are, they give considerable support to Galton's theory as to the hereditary nature of genius. Unfortunately, it has thus far not been possible to carry out any studies of a kind which would give exact data on family resemblances in the group or reveal the laws by which superior mental ability is transmitted. End of section 5《Section 6 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis, Madison, Terman, and others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 6. Vital Statistics. Size of Families. There are only 91 completed families in our group. If we count as completed a family in which the mother is 45 years old or older. These 91 mothers reported to the medical examiners a total of 353 pregnancies, 
two of which were of twins. The number of children which might have resulted was therefore 355. 46 miscarriages and 45 deaths were reported. The 309 births exclusive of miscarriages include 165 boys and 144 girls, giving a sex ratio of 114.58 to 100. In the same 91 completed families, information was available regarding the size of the family from which 85 of the fathers and 88 of the mothers had come. The correlation between the number of children in the present generation and the number in each of the parents' families was as follows. Immediate family versus father's family, R equals plus 0.36, deviation 0.06. Immediate family versus mother's family, R equals plus 0.18, deviation 0.07. The 91 families were distributed as follows with respect to the number of children in the present generation. A small table is displayed on the page listing the number of children compared to the number of families. Number of children 1, 19 families. 2 children, 22 families. 3 children, 16 families. 4 children, 11 families. 5 children, 7 families. 6 children, 7 families. 7 children, 3 families. 8 children, 2 families, 9 children, 2 families, 10 children, no families, 11 children, 2 families. These data yield an average number of children of 3.40 to the family. At first thought, such an average might be taken to indicate that the California gifted families are probably in general maintaining their numbers. Further consideration, however, shows that the average of 3.40 is subject to three corrections. First correction. There is a selection of families caught in our survey due to the fact that a large family has a better chance of coming into our group than a small family. To take a simple hypothetical case, if half the marriages of our population produced two children, and if the other half of the marriages produced four children, the average number of children per marriage for the total population is three. However, since the four child marriages taken together produce twice as many children as the two child marriages, it comes about that any random sampling of the children in such a population would give us twice as many four children families as would give of two children families. For example, if ten two child families were caught, twenty children, the expected number of four children families caught would be twenty, eighty children. The sum of the children, 100, divided by the number of marriages, 30, gives the average number of children for the sampling as 3.33, which is to be compared with the average of 3.00 for the total population. Accordingly, any group of families located in the manner in which our gifted families were located will yield an average number of children which is surprisingly high. As Dr. Lenz has pointed out, since the probability for each family to be included in the random sample is proportional to the number of its children, one must divide the number of families by the number of children in order to get the same composition of the material as in the totality of all fertile marriages. Table 22 gives the necessary computations. The fertility index of fertile marriages of this class of parents in California is not represented by 3.40 the average number of children in the family's court, but by 2.18. Second correction. It must be borne in mind that the index 2.18 holds only for fruitful marriages, since marriages which were childless could not be included in our sampling. A further correction is necessary. Assuming the proportion of childless marriages to be the same as that reported by Cattell for the generality of marriages in America, viz. 17%, the 91 fruitful marriages indicate a total number of marriages of 110, and our fertility index of 2.18 is accordingly reduced to 1.80. 91 times 2.18 divided by 110 equals 1.80. Third correction. The index 1.80 is for those individuals who marry and have children, but since a large proportion of the individuals of this class remain celibate, a third correction must be computed. In all probability, this proportion is as high as 
and we base our estimate upon this figure, our index of 1.80 is reduced to 1.44. Table 22 is displayed on the page, correcting fertility index for method of sampling. 91 multiplied by 2.18 divided by 138 equals 1.44. Accordingly, if our data may be regarded as typical, it appears that a man or woman representing the stream with which we are here concerned is produced on the average 0.72 of a child, and that the gifted families of California are rapidly dying out. That the situation in the present generation is eugenically less favourable than in the preceding generation is shown by a comparison of the figures above with the corresponding figures for the fathers' and mothers' families. As we have already stated, data were available with respect to the size of the father's family in 85 of the 91 cases and with respect to the size of the mother's family in 88 cases. The distributions are given in Table 23. Table 23 is displayed on the page, size of family at present, and preceding generations. There are three columns displaying the number of children, the father's families, and the mother's families. Carrying out the same computations for the parents' families, as you have already made for the families of the present generation, but allowing for 10% of celibacy instead of 20%, since it is known that celibacy in the educated classes was formerly less frequent than at present, we have the significant results shown in Table 24. Table 24 is displayed on the page, Fertility Indices of Present and Preceding Generations. There are four columns, comparing the number of children to the families of children, families of fathers, and the families of mothers. If we base our comparison on the estimated number of children for all marriages in this stream of the general population, item 3 above, the reduction of fertility is from an average of 3.25 in the parental generation to 1.0 in the present generation. This is a decrease of 45%. When we take account of the increasing celibacy, item 4 above, the reduction is from 2.92 in the parental generation to 1.44 in the present generation. That is, the fertility index for the stratum of the California population with which we are here concerned has decreased from 50% in a single generation. Because of the various corrections that need to be taken into account, there are few data on fertility strictly comparable to our own. Cattell found the average number of children born to 440 American men of science whose families were completed to be 2.3. Barren marriages are included in this average, so that the figure 2.3 for this scientific group is to be compared with 1.80, the figure resulting from the second correction for the present generation of our gifted families. Galton found that a group of 100 English men of science, excluding barren marriages, had on an average 4.7 children. Havelock Ellis found an average of 5.45 children for 240 fruitful marriages of British men of distinction. These figures 4.7 and 5.45 are to be compared with the results of the first correction for the present generation of gifted families, namely 2.18. It would seem, therefore, that the fertility of families of the type which produce gifted individuals is rapidly on the decline. Size of family and education of parents An attempt was made to find out whether within this group of 91 families there was any correlation between the amount of schooling of parents and the number of offspring. The highest school grade reach was used as the measure of schooling, and a schooling index for a mid-parent was calculated by averaging the highest grade reached by the two parents. For example, one parent reached grade 12 and the other grade 8. The mid-parent index of schooling was 10. The correlation with the number of offspring was found to be minus 0.214, deviation 0.07. Size of family and degree of superiority of children. Another question that arises is whether there is any correlation within our highly selected group between the degree of a child's superiority and the size of family from which he comes. 
the correlation was computed for the 91 completed families and found to be minus 0.271, deviation 0.062. This correlation is high enough to be decidedly significant from the point of view of eugenics, and it is desirable to know whether it can be accounted for on the hypothesis that the most gifted parents, those most likely to have children of highest IQ, are prevented from having large families by their greater educational ambitions. It is possible to answer this question by the method of partial correlations. The correlation between IQ of child and schooling of mid-parent was found to be positive 0.16. The correlation between IQ of child and the number of living births with schooling of mid-parent constant is negative 0.246, deviation 0.063. That is the fact that the highest IQs are found in the smallest families cannot be accounted for by the supposed interference of schooling, as it is but slightly reduced when the effect of this factor is eliminated. Miscarriages In the 91 completed families, 46 miscarriages were reported by the mothers of our examining physicians. The proportion of pregnancies which resulted in miscarriages, 7.7%, is very low. For 10,043 pregnancies, records of which were obtained in a hospital of Manchester, England, Dr. A. S. Parker reports 1,659 abortions, miscarriages, or a proportion of 16.5%. The proportion was very small in the younger mothers and rose to 20.7% by the age of 28. Of mothers of gifted children, 57, or 62% of the 91, report no miscarriages, and in five cases the question is not answered. In one of these, the mother is dead. No reason for failure to reply in the other four cases is known. The physicians ask in each case of miscarriage whether it was induced or spontaneous. It can be assumed that whenever the information given by parents on this point is incorrect, the error is pretty certainly in one direction, as there is little likelihood of a mother reporting a miscarriage as induced which was spontaneous. There are 23 who report spontaneous miscarriages only, one induced miscarriages only, three both induced and spontaneous, and three fail to state whether the miscarriage was induced or spontaneous. The number of induced miscarriages admitted is nine. The following figures give the number and kind of miscarriages for each mother. A table is displayed on the page comparing the reported miscarriages to the number per mother. If the chances of superior endowment were the same for these 46 aborted offspring as for their sibs, a considerable number of potentially gifted individuals have thus been lost to the world. In all probability, some of these were lost through abortions which were induced. The total number of potentially gifted individuals thus sacrificed in a nation of a hundred million population must be very large, even when due allowance is made for the small proportion of gifted offspring in the population at large. Probably a number of these mothers attempted miscarriages, which they did not have succeeded in bringing about. One such failure is known to have given us one of our brightest and most promising boys. Infant Mortality in Families of Gifted The infant mortality in families of gifted children has been compared with that in the general population with respect to percent of deaths under one year and under five years. This comparison is made separately for the 91 completed families for whom we have home blanks. The results given below show that infant mortality in our gifted families is about two-thirds of the expected in the case of boys, and only one-third of the expected in the case of girls. The good showing might indicate either better care, better heredity, or both. A table is displayed on the page comparing the general population and 91 completed families of gifted to the percentage of mortality for under one year in males and females and under five years in males and females. Age of parents at birth of gifted child This question was asked in the home information blank and was answered for 583 children, or 96.5% of those for whom the blank was filled out. Accordingly, the data as shown in Table 25 may be considered representative. In this case, 
there would seem to be no important selective factor which would give an abnormally large number of children whose parents were especially old or especially young at the birth of their gifted offspring. Perhaps one selective factor does enter to a slight degree. Such would be the case, for example, in a population containing an abnormally large or an abnormally small proportion of young married couples. This proportion is likely to be rather large in frontier communities, but in cities such as we are here concerned with, this factor would probably be small. Even though they have had a fairly heavy immigration in recent years from other states, Cattell found the average age of fathers of 865 leading American men of science to be 35 years at the birth of their sons, and that of the mothers 29 years and 8 months. These figures agree very closely with those in Table 25. Table 25 is displayed on the page, Age of Parents at Birth of Gifted Children. The average age of fathers of 299 British men of genius was found by Ellis to be 37.1. The corresponding figure for fathers of 100 English men of science studied by Galton was 36, for the mothers of the same group, 30. Ellis thinks there is a positive correlation between degree of eminence and age of father, but his data do not at all warrant this conclusion. The corresponding figure for the entire population would doubtless be much lower than for any distinguished group, but the difference is probably accounted for entirely by age of marriage voluntary limitation of births, and other factors having no biological basis. Table 25 shows that the average age of fathers is 4.62 years in excess of the average age of mothers. The difference for parents of gifted boys is 4.89 years, and for parents of gifted girls, 4.30 years. The difference between medians is 4.29 for parents of boys, 4.03 for parents of girls, and 4.18 for both. The difference between the excess of father's age over mother's for the gifted boy group as compared with the gifted girl group is well within the range of chance. The direction and extent of disparity in age of parents is shown in Table 26. Table 26 is displayed on the page, Disparity in Ages of Parents. Statistics on the age of marriage of these parents would be interesting, but unfortunately this item was omitted by oversight from the home information blank. Order of birth Owing to the form of our data, it is impossible to work out the birth order exclusive of miscarriages. Since the order of miscarriage is not stated, and the order of birth of the proposity as stated includes marriages and deceased siblings. Another and more serious source of error in the accompanying tables is the fact that, since our main survey was confined to the eight school grades, many children in the largest families of the general population were not caught in our group. Moreover, the tables include both completed and incompleted families, for to have based the tables upon their completed families alone would have favoured the selection of late order births. Accordingly, in many cases, it is to be expected that the latter births will change the relative position of a given child in the table. Absolute position, of course, will not be changed, but a child who is now the oldest of three may become the oldest of four, five, etc. The table should then be considered suggestive rather than conclusive, and this only as regards to the small families. In the large families, as we have stated, the older children would often be beyond the age limits of our group. Nevertheless, the figures are interesting to compare with the corresponding figures from Cattell. The line across the middle of tables 27 to 29 is intended to call attention to the fact that the figures for birth order beyond 4 are of questionable validity. The following figures give the percent of birth of each order of families of 2, 3 or 4 children. Cattell's figures for American men of science are given in parenthesis. A table is displayed on the page, order of birth, comparing the number of children to percentages of first, second, third and fourth. There is a very striking agreement between Cattell's data and our own for families of two children. In each case, nearly three-fifths are first born. The agreement is only moderately close for families of three and four children, 
which may be explained by the hypothesis that first-born gifted in families of three or four children were more likely to have been missed because they had advanced beyond the eighth grade. It has been suggested that the better chance which the first-born apparently has of becoming a leading man of science may be due to greater educational opportunities enjoyed by the first-born. This alleged educational advantage is, of course, hypothetical, but even if it were actual, one might very well doubt whether the effect would register in the Binet IQ to almost exactly the same degree as in scientific performance. Especially since the IQs were taken in childhood, while the supposed influence of environment upon scientific performance would presumably depend chiefly on the relative amount of schooling enjoyed by the first-born and that of born after the years of childhood. Such facts seem to render the environment hypothesis very questionable. On the preceding page, Table 27 is displayed. Order of birth, boys, based on total number of pregnancies. Table 28 is displayed on the page. Order of birth, girls, based on total number of pregnancies. And Table 29 is displayed on the following page. Order of birth, sexes combined, based on total number of pregnancies. However, before accepting the above findings, it will be necessary to rule out all factors tending to bring about an atypical selection of cases, and this is extremely difficult, if not impossible. The misleading effect of the selective factor is illustrated by considering the data for the 91 completed families. It might at first be supposed that the data for these families would, except for a small number, be more valid than for the entire group. Actually, they have no validity at all. The completed families in our group show an atypically small proportion of gifted firstborn, for the reason that our main search, being confined chiefly to grades 3 to 8, yielded few children above 13 years of age. The oldest child in a completed family would frequently, if not in a majority of cases, be older than 13 and would therefore be less likely to be caught in our survey. The enormous effect of this vitiating factor is shown by the fact that in 24 families of this group having two children, the ratio of second order to first order births was 17 to 7. In 17 families of three children, there were 12 third order births and only one of first order. The fact that a selective factor could give such results illustrates the necessity of caution in interpreting data of this kind. In this case, completed families having a gifted firstborn were rarely caught. Possibly in the case of incomplete families, those with gifted firstborn were more likely to be caught. Such would certainly tend to be the case with the families most incomplete, since the gifted secondborn of the youngest parents would not have reached the third grade. However, it will be noted that our data for families of two and three children agree very closely with those of Cattell, and it does not seem probable that Cattell's figures could be subject to the kind of error we are considering. Mortality statistics regarding parents. In the case of 502 of the 578 families in our main gifted group, including 591 of the total 643 children in the group, the physicians made note of whether the parents were living or dead. This includes all the families of the main group in which the children were given a medical examination. Among these 591 children, two, 0.33%, were orphans and 53, 8.9%, were half orphans. With a number of half orphans at about 9%, the number of full orphans expected by chance would be about 0.81%. 0.9 multiplied by 0.9 equals 0 0.0081. This is not far from the proportion found. Strange to say, the number of deceased fathers reported is more than three times that of deceased mothers, namely 42 fathers are compared with 13 mothers. These numbers are, respectively, 8.37% and 2.6% of the total number of parental pairs, 502. A difference large enough to raise considerable question of accuracy. Table 30 is displayed on the page, Causes of Death of Parents with three columns listing the cause and compared to the father and the mother. Accident, father 7, mother 1. Unknown, father 3, mother 2. Tuberculosis, father 3, mother 2. 
Influenza pneumonia, father 4, mother 1. Heart disease, father 4, mother 0. Influenza, father 2, mother 1. Appendicitis, father 2, mother 0. Pernicious anemia, father 2, mother 0. Nervous breakdown, father 2, mother 0. Diabetes, father 1, mother 1. Septicemia, father 1, mother 1. Pneumonia, father 1, mother 1. Hernia operation, father 1, mother 0. Peritonitis, father 1, mother 0. Cancer of liver, father 1, mother 0. Nephritis, father 1, mother 0. Meningitis or encephalitis, father 1, mother 0. Sciatica, father 1, mother 0. Tuberculosis of kidney, father 1, mother 0. Disease of gallbladder, father 1, mother 0. Nephrectomy, father 1, mother 0. Childbirth, father 0, mother 1. Gangrene, father 0, mother 1. Suicide, father 0, mother 1. Old age, father 1, mother 0. Total, father 42, mother 13. Two possible sources of error suggest themselves. 1. The reports are made in nearly all cases by the mothers when they brought the child for medical examination. It is possible that some of these were stepmothers but did not divulge the fact. One might assume that the death of the father would always be reported by the mother. One could not safely assume that every stepmother would report that she was the second wife and she had nothing to do with bringing into the world the child found to be so exceptionally superior. 2. A second source of error lies in the possibility that among the 75 or 80 mothers who could have brought the child for medical examination and failed to do so, there were disproportionate numbers of stepmothers. This source of error is probably less serious than the first. If neither of these errors had entered, and the excess of widowed mothers is a true one, the explanation might be that children of widowed mothers stood a better chance of being caught in our survey because of extra attention or instruction in the home. One might expect widowed mothers to lavish more affection upon their offspring, but as a class, they certainly do not have more time to devote to them. The cause of death in the case of these 42 fathers and 13 mothers were reported to our physicians, as shown above in Table 30. Chronic Illnesses of Parents Chronic illnesses of parents were reported to our physicians, as shown in Table 31. The numbers are, of course, too small to be statistically significant, even if one could assume entirely accuracy of report. One notes, however, that the mothers reported 50% more illnesses for themselves and for their husbands. These illnesses do not include tuberculosis and lose syphilis, which were reported severally. Table 31 is displayed on the page. Longevity of grandparents of gifted. It was thought that longevity of ancestors might throw some light on the virility of the stock from which the gifted children come. As the parents are in the large majority of cases still living, grandparents were used for comparison with the general population. Since not all of the grandparents were dead, it was necessary to take account of the life expectation of those still living. The longevity index for grandfathers only was calculated. The formula used was supplied by Dr. Truman L. Kelly and is as follows. Total life expectation according to U.S. life tables of living grandfathers of gifted time of questionnaire plus age at that time, plus sum of deceased grandfathers' ages at time of death, close parenthesis, minus total life expectation of grandfathers reckoned from the birth of the child's parent plus age at that time for grandfathers who are living, plus total life expectation of grandfathers at time of birth of child's parent plus age at that time for grandfathers who are dead, close parenthesis divided by n. The number. The comparative figures are taken from the U.S. Life Tables by Glover, Table 4, for all white males in the original registration states where it's used. Substituting the values as found for the above formula, we have 33,007.256 plus 42,907.5 minus 27,454.48 plus 45,827.148 divided by 1,117. 
Solving gives 2.35 years of life in excess of expectation for grandfathers of gifted children. This difference of 2.35 is, for two reasons, too small. One, it is based upon the theoretical expectation of life under the conditions prevailing in the United States in 1921. However, many of the grandfathers died a number of years ago, a considerable portion of them in foreign countries, and the hazards of living to which they succumbed were greater than those in the United States in 1921. Under modern American conditions, it is fair to assume that on the average they would have lived somewhat longer. 2. The formula gives credit only for excess years of life already completed. It allots to the grandparents still living only as many additional years of life as the average man of equal age. These grandfathers have already lived an average of 2.35 years of life in excess of the average man who lives to the age which the grandfathers have attained at the time of the birth of the gifted child's father, and the future is more likely to increase rather than decrease this advantage. Tuberculosis and Lewis Mum Relatives Under the caption, Tuberculosis, the physician recorded the information given by mothers relative to history of tuberculosis in parents and other near relatives. The following figures are therefore not limited to existing cases of the disease but are based upon all cases for which a history of tuberculosis was reported. Table 32 is displayed on the page, Tuberculosis Among Relatives. The percents in Table 32 are percents of children, not of relatives. The figures reported by Dr. Moore, Los Angeles, are in each case much higher than those reported by Dr. Bronson, San Francisco Bay Region. This is probably accounted for by the fact that the climate of Southern California attracts many families in which there is a tendency to tuberculosis. The reports of parents are probably fairly accurate and show that about one child in 20 has at least one parent with a history of tuberculosis. The reports from more distant relatives are doubtless less complete. From these figures one could hardly infer that the incidence of tuberculosis in these families is excessive. The data on Lou's syphilis cannot be taken as complete. The reports include only two cases, one a father, one a great uncle. There are two other probable cases, both parents of one of the children. Hereditary disease and defects. Histories of insanity among relatives were reported to the physician as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing the parents grandparents and other relatives, to the male, female, and total and percentage of gift and group. Parents, male 2, female 2, total 4. Percent of gift and group, 0.4%. Grandparents and great-grandparents, male 11, female 5, total 16. Percent of gift and group, 0.3%. Other relatives, sex not always stated, total 37. Six families were bought two cases each. 1, 3 cases, and 1, 6 cases. Thus, 1.6% of the families furnished 36.8% of all cases of insanity reported. The information regarding the last mentioned family was not reported on the medical blank, but was furnished by the superintendent of the orphanage in which the child is living. The family of this child on the maternal side is reported to consist almost entirely of insane, criminal, or mental defectives, although one cousin is reported as very brilliant and a talented violinist. We have no reliable information as to the paternal ancestry of this child. Only 15 cases of feeble-mindedness among relatives were reported to the physicians. None in parents, grandparents or great-grandparents. One sip of a gifted child, other relatives, 14. This does not include the information just mentioned, which was furnished by the orphanage superintendent for one of our group. One family reports five cases, four uncles and one cousin all in the maternal line. This is the third of the total number of cases reported. There were 19 cases of epilepsy reported. Direct line, none. Sib of child, one. Grandparents and great-grandparents, six. Other relatives, 12. Information regarding other nervous tendencies was regularly asked for by the physicians. Under this heading are recorded hysteria, insomnia, and cases described as very nervous, high-strung, etc. 
For the most part, the defects mentioned appear to be of relatively minor importance. The following cases were reported. Sub of child, 1. Fathers, 10. Mothers, 24. Other relatives, 30. Of the 65 cases, 54 were reported by Dr. Bronson. Dr. Bronson's figures are high, largely for the reason that she included in her positive records the mothers who impressed her during the interview as having nervous tendencies, whether they reported such tendencies or not. Asthma and hay fever, which are frequently classified as nervous diseases, were reported as follows. A table is displayed on the page, comparing asthma, hay fever, goiter, and cancer to the male, female, total, and percentage gifted group. Asthma, gifted children, male 4, female 2, total 6. Percent of group, 1.02%. Sibs of gifted, male 3, female 2, total 5. Parents of gifted, male 9, female 7, total 16. Percent of group, 1.6%. Hay fever, gifted children, male 2, female 0, total 2. Percent of group, 0.3%. Parents of gifted, male 13, female 11, total 24. Percent of group, 2.4%. Other relatives, total, 50. Goiter, 18 cases were reported. Gifted children, 1. Sips of gifted, 2. Parents of gifted, 9. Other relatives, 6. Total, 18. Cancer, 52 cases of cancer were reported, 38.5% of which were reported by 1.2% of the families. Parents of gifted, 4. Grandparents and great-grandparents, 38. Other relatives, 10. Total, 52. Only three cases of chorea were reported in the medical blanks. One of the gifted children, one sib and one parent. The home information blank reports one additional case among the gifted children. One father is reported as having palsy. One mother is having severe hysteria, with what appears to be hysteria, hemiplegia. These are not included in the data mentioned above on other nervous tendencies. If the figures on insanity, feeble-mindedness, epilepsy, and other nervous diseases are taken at their face value, the showing made by these families is much superior to that which would be found for a random group of families in the general population. However, it is unsafe to assume that these mothers reported all cases of nervous defect of which they had knowledge, notwithstanding the assurance given them that the records would be kept in locked files and treated as entirely confidential as far as individual cases were concerned. In view of the possible error from this source, it is hardly worthwhile to make any comparison of the findings with statistics for the general population. Summary 1. The 91 mothers who are 45 years old or older report an average of 3.40 births, exclusive of miscarriages when allowance is made for the greater chance of large families being caught in our survey, for childless marriages and for celibacy. The average number of offspring per individual in the stratum represented by the parents of our subjects is 0.72. This is 50% lower than that found for the preceding generation, and is far too low to maintain the stock. 2. There is a low but probably significant negative correlation minus 0.214, deviation 0 0.07, between schooling of mid-parent and number of living births. There is a correlation of minus 0.271, deviation 0 0.062, between IQ of child and the number of living births. The latter correlation is only reduced to minus 0.246, when the effect of schooling is eliminated by the method of partial correlation. 3. The proportion of miscarriages to pregnancies in the completed families is probably not more than half the normal for mothers of the generality. Infant mortality in these families has also been extremely low. 4. The average age of the father at the birth of a gifted child was 33.63 years, standard deviation 7.70, of mothers 29.01 years, standard deviation 5.64. These figures are slightly lower than those reported by Cattell for parents of American men of science. 5. The data on order of birth, as far as they may be considered valid, are in striking agreement with Cattell's figures in showing a preponderance of firstborn gifted in families of two or more. The fact that superiority of the firstborn registers in childhood as clearly as in the achievements of adult life 
suggests that the cases are to be sought in native endowment rather than environmental and education. 6. The number of deceased fathers reported is 42. Of deceased mothers, 13. The causes of death are too scattered to be statistically significant. 7. 40 fathers, 8%, and 61 mothers, 12%, have one or more chronic illnesses, many of which are of minor importance. This is probably less than would be found for adults of corresponding age in the general population. There is a record of tuberculosis in one of both parents of 5.4% of the children. 8. Longevity of the grandfathers of the gifted subjects is at least 2.35 years, and probably more than that amount in excess of the expected. 9. Four parents, 0.4%, 16 grandparents and great-grandparents, 0.3%, and 37 other relatives were reported to the physicians as having had a record of insanity. Very few of the cases of hereditary defect were reported. End of section 6. Section 7 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1, Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children, by Lewis Terman and others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 7. Anthropometric Measurements. Bird T. Baldwin. In the spring of 1923, Dr. Terman invited the writer to cooperate in a comprehensive investigation of a group of intellectually gifted children whom he had selected in California. The aim, scope and methods of the entire investigation are described in the previous sections of this book. The problem assigned was to make an anthropometric study of the status or the physical growth of these children. The purpose was, one, to secure an accurate picture of the status of physical development of each of the gifted children through a series of selected physical measurements. Two, to make a comparison of their total and partial growth with that of other groups. Three, to determine the relationships of various physical traits measured, and 4. To analyse the correspondence of the physical status and mental status of this group of children. Method of work In order to ensure good anthropometric laboratory conditions, it was decided to establish centres equipped with standard laboratory facilities at Los Angeles, San Francisco and Stanford University for the three main districts. The children from the suburbs of Los Angeles and the surrounding small towns came to Los Angeles to be measured, those from Berkeley, Alameda and Oakland to San Francisco, and those from the towns near Palo Alto to Stanford University. Many of the children lived so far from the centre that an entire day was required for the parent and the child to make the trip. At each of the centres, the laboratory was located in the most accessible part of the city. It consisted of a measuring room, waiting room, and small dressing rooms. The parents were requested by a form letter to bring their children at specific hours on days designated. Arrangements were made with the superintendents of schools in the various cities for excusing the children from school work whenever it was necessary. Almost all the children notified came to the laboratory. The measuring began the first week of April and continued for 13 consecutive weeks. The total number of children measured was 623, most of whom belonged to the group which had been designated as a main experimental group. 29 of these were not included in the statistical treatment because they had IQs of less than 130, although they had special abilities, or because they had been examined by group intelligence tests only. The 594 children included 312 boys and 282 girls, with IQs ranging from 130 to 189. They are distributed by age as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing age and years to boys and girls. Measurements. 37 careful anthropometric measurements were taken on each child without clothing, making a total of 21,978 measurements on the 594 children. The original records giving the data of the measurements for each child are on file at the Iowa Child Welfare Research Station and in duplicate at Stanford University. 
The measurements selected were height, standing, sitting, stem length to vertex, stem length to sternal notch, head, anterior posterior diameter, transverse diameter, height, circumference, width of face, length of face, shoulders, width, arms, span, length from shoulder to elbow, right and left, length from elbow to fingertip, right and left, circumference of upper, relaxed and flexed, right and left, width of wrist, proximal and distal, right and left, circumference of wrist, right and left, chest, width, depth, circumference, hips, width, adicia, width at trochanters, Circumference. Legs. Length. Breathing capacity. Grip. Right. Left. Weight. Nude. All measurements were taken in the metric units, and the final results translated into the English units for this report. The actual time required for making the measurements for each child with the aid of the recorder was about 20 minutes. Figure 2 gives the location and actual measurements of 31 physical traits on the fourth boy measured. He is six years of age and has intelligence quotients of 154. He holds a remarkable record for swimming and diving. He also plays a violin for public exhibition and is a movie actor. The boy is slightly below medium height and his weight is slightly above the Iowa preschool norm for his height. He is above the norm in breathing capacity and chest measurements, both for his height and age and for his weight and age. His shoulders are broader than those of the average child of his age. Figure 2 is displayed on the preceding page, Location of Physical Measurements. Instruments The apparatus and instruments were those used in the Iowa Research Station Laboratory, including the measuring board of a height, benches, square, plumb line, sliding and spreading calipers, tapes, and metric rule, supplemented by scales, a spirometer, and a hand dynamometer from the Psychological Laboratory of Stanford University. All instruments except the hand dynamometer were carefully standardized before the work was started. The hand dynamometer, Smedley, number 256, was later sent to the Bureau of Standards, Washington, where corrections were found necessary after careful testing. Since the errors ranged from minus 2.8 kilograms to minus 1.7 kilograms, at five unit intervals up to 50 kilograms. On the scale, the average error was found to be minus 2.17 kilograms for the boys and minus 2.33 kilograms for the girls. The averages, deviations, probable errors, and coefficients of variability given for grip are for the corrected measurements. The technique of taking the measurements was that described by the writer in his physical growth of children from the birth to maturity and revised in his new book on the same subject now in preparation. Cooperation of Parents and Children The attitude and the cooperation of the parents and children were exceptionally good throughout the entire study. In general, the children appeared to be physically well-developed and normal. Mentally, they were alert and quick to respond. Socially, they were well-mannered and showed good spirit. The parents of the mentally superior children, as a rule, showed a great interest in the welfare and training of their children. In a few instances, we were able to get valuable data on the physical growth of the children from the original diaries. Figure 3 gives the individual growth curves from birth of a brother and sister included in the study. The girl is of medium height. At 6 years 6 months, she is 0.7% underweight, average in breathing capacity, 1.1 inches above the norm in width of shoulders and 0.9 pounds below the norm in right grip. The boy is also of medium height. At 11 years, 2 months, he is 8.7% overweight, 10 cubic inches above the norm in breathing capacity, 0.1 inch above the norm in width of shoulders and 8 pounds below the norm in right grip. Figure 3 is displayed on the page. Individual growth curves of two sibs, brother and sister. The graph compares inches to age months and pounds. The curve shows steady growth in height, but somewhat retarded growth in chest development and irregular growth in weight. They also show that the diseases indicated, except diphtheria for the girl, affected growth in weight, and had little apparent effect on height or chest growth. There is a drop in weight following measles for the boy, followed by marked gain. 
For both the boy and the girl, there is an acceleration in weight after the removal of tonsils and adenoids. Since reclining height is longer than standing height for the same individual, the height curves drop back when standing height was first taken instead of reclining height at 19 months of the boy and at 14 months of the girl. When the work on physical measurements was begun, the parents had already acquired an intelligent interest in the largest survey of the characteristics of mentally superior children and had become acquainted with the results of specialised examinations. In order to meet the very large number of requests for the results of the physical measurements, a form letter was forwarded to the parents or guardians for each child. The letter is reproduced on pages 142 to 143. On the following pages, report to the parents on physical measurements is displayed. Comparison of the group with other groups in various sections of the United States. Since the weight-height relationship of a child furnishes one of the best general criteria for its physical status, the average heights and weights for all the children included between the ages of 7 and 15 were first computed and the results compared with those of earlier writers on California children and on a few representative groups in other parts of the United States. The results given in Table 33 show at a glance that this group measured by the group average is physically superior in both height and weight for age, although several children are small and some are considerably underweight. The Oakland children measured by Barnes in 1892 are considerably inferior to this group, although they were heavier and taller than similar groups of children from Boston, Worcester, Toronto, St. Louis and Milwaukee, whose records were displayed at the World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. The Oakland children, letters studied by Boas, were superior to those studied by Barnes, but inferior to those included in this study. The Davenport group represents a selection from the best residential district in the city. The Oak Park group is from one of the most favoured social sections of Chicago. Faber's study in 1923 was of a group of California children. The California gifted children excel them in all height and weight, for all ages included. They also excel the early Boas Burke averages for the country at large, when approximately 90,000 children for height averages and 68,000 for weight averages between the ages of 5.5 and, and 18.5 and years were included. According to the standards of the new Baldwin Wood Tables for Tall, Medium and Short American Children, based upon records from 124,000 well-developed American-born children, measured without clothing, 44 of the 312 superior boys are tall, 233 medium, and 35 short. Of the 282 girls, 45 are tall, 208 medium, and 29 short. Of the boys, 176 are of normal weight for height, 89 overweight, and 42 underweight. Of the girls, 143 are of normal weight for height, 88 overweight, and 51 underweight. The criteria for overweight and underweight were a deviation from the norm of more than 6% for children and less than 10 years of age, and 8% for children 10 years and older. A more detailed analysis of tall, medium and short children is given in Table 34. On the preceding page, Table 33 is displayed. Height and weight of gifted and other groups of children. Table 34 is displayed on the following page. Relation of weight to height, gifted children, is comparing the boys, tall, medium, and short, and girls, tall, medium, and short, compared to the percentages of normal weight, overweight, and underweight. Deviations from norms in weight and breathing capacity. In order to get a graphic representation of the deviations from a standard group in weight and in breathing capacity of the gifted children, the distribution of the percentages of deviation for each child has been charted, figures 4, 5, and 6. The deviation in weight was calculated from the Baldwin Wood weight height age norms for new children. The deviation in breathing capacity from the unpublished Baldwin height breathing capacity age norms and new weight breathing capacity age norms for American born children. The curves for weight deviation show the range of deviations on the norms for the boys to be from minus 24 to plus 60 percent 
and for the girls from minus 24 to plus 48 percent. It should be noted, however, that 74.5 percent of the boys and 62.4 percent of the girls deviate less than 10 percent from the norms. One boy deviated 60 percent below the breathing capacity norm, another 60 percent above normal, but 72.6 percent of the boys deviated no more than 10 percent above or below the norm. One girl deviated 45% below the norm and another 45% above, but 68.3% deviated not more than 10% above or below the norm. On the following pages, figure 4 is displayed. Percentage deviations of gifted children from the Baldwin Wood weight height age norms. Figure 5 is displayed on the page, percentage deviations of gifted children from the norms in breathing capacity for age and height. And figure 6 is displayed on the following page. Percentage deviations of gifted children from the norms in breathing capacity for age and weight. The results show a wide range of distribution on both the positive and negative side of the norm for both height and breathing capacity. For weight, the results indicate a fairly normal distribution, with a slight preponderance toward the positive side of the curve. For breathing capacity, when compared with weight, height, age norms, the curves are skewed towards the positive side of the distribution. As a group, these mentally gifted children are superior in breathing capacity to unselected children. Results of physical measurements In tables 35 and 36, the averages, standard deviations with their probable errors, and coefficients of variability for the measurements on the 37 physical traits are given for boys and girls from 7 to 15 years inclusive. The 24 children less than 7 years of age are distributed from 2 to 6 years of age and are therefore too few to treat by age groups. The average represents the central tendency of the group, but of course does not show individual variations or differences. The standard deviation is the amount of variation above and below the average in terms of the measurement for about 68% of the children. The coefficient of variability is a percentage in terms of a pure number whereas a standard deviation involves various units of measurement. In the case of height at 7 years, for example, the average in the boys is 48.5 inches, while the standard deviation shows that about 68% of cases vary in not more than 2.4 inches on each side of this average. The coefficient of variability in height for the 7-year-old boys is 5%. Sensible measurements since all measurements in Table 35 and 36 were accurately taken by a trained examiner under standardised conditions, and since the number of traits measured includes a comprehensive and significant selection, the results established for the first time a series of averages for 37 traits for a considerable number of mentally superior boys and girls. The less accurate measurements from one standpoint of technique of measuring are with the face circumference of arms, and circumference of chest. Sex and age differences. A general survey of table 35 and 36, and a figure 7 and 8, shows interesting and significant differences in sex development. The boys are superior to the girls in all traits up to 12 years of age, except width of hips, length of leg and weight, in which the girls begin to show superiority before this age. It must be remembered, however, that these are averages of the measurements and that chronological age is an arbitrary division that does not take adequately into consideration the accelerated and retarded stages of anatomical and physiological ages for particular children. The writer's individual growth studies on large numbers of children show that tall children are farther advanced than short children in their periods of growth during childhood. This basic principle is also illustrated in a later selection of this study, pages 163, FF. When 12 years of age is used as an arbitrary division, it is found that during the subsequent adolescent period, the girls equal or excel the boys in standing height, sitting height, stem length to vertex, stem length to sternal notch, chest measurement, hip measurement, and weight. They maintain their superiority for the ages included. Increments of growth. Figures 7 and 8 in tables 35 and 36 show an appreciable increase in increment of growth 
from age to age in practically all traits except head measurements with an adolescent acceleration beginning at about 13 years for the boys and 11 years for the girls the acceleration varying with different traits for instance the acceleration in weight precedes the acceleration in height the ages do not extend far enough to make possible a determination of the final stages of growth in any one of the traits included on the preceding page figure 7 is displayed age curves for 16 physical traits gifted boys figure 8 is displayed on the page age curves for 16 physical traits gifted girls variability of measurements a study of the lineal measurements taken in terms of inches and tenths shows that the length variable are those of the head excluding the face standing height sitting height stem length width of shoulders and width and depth of chest the most variable lineal measurements are those of circumference of the wrist chest and arms weight is from two to three times the variable as lineal traits and the psychophysical traits of breathing capacity and right and left grip shows considerably more variability than weight a comparison of the coefficients of variability of all traits for all ages for the two sexes shows that as a rule the girls are more variable than the boys and that the variability increases during the adolescent acceleration in growth the percentage of variability differs for the sexes with the stages of physiological growth attained indices of growth the percentage of the weight to the height that is weight height index varies with age and shows that the girls begin to increase in weight for their height after 12 years of age and the boys slightly later the individual indices vary with the relative increase in height which also varies at a particular age with the height status of the child for each sex the majority of these children are of normal weight for height but several are decidedly underweight and others equally overweight the average cephalic in disease are approximately the same for boys and girls and very little with age the cranial capacity was computed for the children for ages 7 to 15 by the pearson lee formula for general comparison with norms of porteus and others for anglo-saxon boys and girls the results for the gifted boys are above the porteus norms throughout the tabulated results are not included here because as professor pearson writes in a recent letter to assume the formula holds for children when the bone growth both internal and external is so very considerable during the adolescent period might lead to grave error cranial capacities are now being computed from a larger series of head measurements on various children in the iowa child welfare research station laboratory under professor pearson's directions the average chest index varies little with sex or with age except at 15 years of age when the girls exceed the boys on the average the sitting height is approximately 53 percent of the standing height for boys and for girls of the ages included arm span and height are approximately equal since the difference is less than one inch for the boys and girls at any age comparison with a control group when a comparison is made with the oak part children with whom the same instruments and methods of measuring were used from the ages of seven to fourteen years in arm span width of shoulders width of hips and right grip it's evident that the gifted boys and girls as a group are superior in these four traits coefficients of correlation for physical traits zero order correlation table 37 gives the coefficients of correlation by the pearson formula between four physical traits for the ages 9 to 14 inclusive and six additional physical traits for ages 11 for boys and girls the results show relatively high positive correlation between weight and standing height for all ages for both sexes the correlation for the boys being higher than that for the girls the coefficients of correlation between breathing capacity and grip are also positive and relatively high for all ages for boys and girls which means that for children of the same age those of superior breathing capacity are also of superior strength as indicated by grip of the right hand 11 years the coefficients of correlation between breathing capacity and width depth and circumference of chest are positive for boys and girls but higher for boys than for girls the results indicate the width of chest has a higher correlation with breathing capacity than either 
depth or circumference of chest. These correlations indicate that for the various ages included, the children who are relatively high in one physical trait are relatively high in the other physical traits. Table 37 is displayed on the following page. Coefficients of correlation between certain physical traits of 594 gifted children. Partial correlations. By use of the partial correlation, age was made constant for this entire group. There is still a positive correlation between the physical traits included. For the boys, the lowest partial coefficient of correlation is plus 0.483 between breathing capacity and depth of chest. The highest is positive 0.703 between standing height and weight. For the girls, the lowest partial coefficient of correlation, positive 0.466, is between breathing capacity and depth of chest. The highest positive 0.824 between breathing capacity and circumference of chest. These results show that when the effect of age is eliminated, the children who are superior in one physical trait are likely to be superior in other physical traits. Comparison with control group. For control in the study of the correlation of physical traits of these gifted children, data on Horace Mann and Oak Park School children were used. Table 39. The Horace Mann group included 120 children for each age between 7 and 16 years who had been measured without clothing consecutively each half year for periods of 6 to 10 years each. The Oak Park group included 122 children for each of the ages 11 and 14 years, measured with clothing. The three groups are of practically the same social status. The coefficients of correlation between the various traits are as a rule higher for the Horace Mann children who have had a long series of consecutive measurements. The correlations for the gifted children are about the same as those for the Oak Park children. The relative position of the three groups with respect to each other varies with the age, sex, and the trait measured. The lower correlation between breathing capacity and right group for the California children at nine years of age may be due to the fact that the California children had not had previous training or experience with these two psychophysical tests. The series of comparative coefficients of correlation shows that growth relationships for the traits included are very similar for the three groups of children. The boys of the three groups have, as a rule, higher coefficients of correlation than the girls. On the following page, Table 38 is displayed. Total and partial correlations between chronological age and physical traits of 594 gifted children. Table 39 is displayed on the following page. Total coefficients of correlation between physical traits of gifted and other groups of children. Resemblance between parents and children. When the parents brought the children to the laboratories for measurement, the height and weight of the parents were taken in order to determine the correlation between the height of parents and the height of their children. In a few instances, the fathers were measured at their homes. Table 40 gives the correlations of height of father and son and of mother and daughter for 305 children for the ages 10, 11, 12 and 13. The average of the four correlations for fathers and sons is 0.36, for mothers and daughters, 0.305. Table 40 is displayed on the page. Coefficients of correlation between height of parents and height of 305 give to children. Relation of physical growth to nutritional status. According to Dreyer's method, the normal weight of an individual is computed by finding the weight in Dreyer's tables corresponding to a subject's length of trunk and circumference of chest. The average of these two weights is the normal for the person of the given measurements. A calculation is displayed. Weight derived from length of trunk plus weight derived from circumference of chest divided by 2 equals normal weight. The percentage below or above normal is rarely computed by comparing the observed weight and the normal weight derived from the tables. A calculation is displayed. Observed weight minus calculated weight multiplied by 100 divided by calculated weight equals percent deviation. Dreyer's standards of weights are normal within 5%, possibly abnormal, plus or minus 5%, probably abnormal, plus or minus 10%, 
certainly abnormal, plus or minus 15%. An inspection of Table 41 shows that the Dreyer method of predicting weight on the basis of sitting height, stem length and chest circumference gives a large percentage of overweight boys, 35%, and of underweight girls, 54%. Table 41 is displayed on the preceding page. Distribution of gifted children according to Dreyer's standard of weight. Only 4% of the boys are underweight, and only 10% of the girls are overweight, according to the Dreyer limits. When the limits of the Dreyer tables are extended to 10% above and 10% below his norm, 0.3% of the boys and 25.4% of the girls are underweight. 22.4% of the boys and 2.6% of the girls are overweight. The Dreyer method should be elaborated to take into consideration age differences, sex differences, and differences of chest formation. Such an investigation is being carried out by the writer. In order to formulate standards for evaluating the nutritional status of children, von Perquetz used as his index the Pelidizzi, which are based on the relationship between weight and setting height. The formula is cube root of 10 multiplied by weight in grams over the sitting height in centimetres equals 100%. Table 42 gives the periodicity for the boys and girls included in this study. This table shows that the index for the boys taken as a group is 94% and for the girls 95%, with a range of 86 to 105% for the boys and of 86 to 107% for the girls. According to the von Perquet standards, the majority of these children range between 89 and 99%, with a standard deviation of more than 3%, which would indicate that the normal rating should be a zone, rather than a definite percentage. For the 14 boys and 30 girls, with pallidity of 99 and above, all are above weight for height and age by the Baldwin Wood tables. The average amount overweight for the boys is 34%, for the girls 23.2%. For the 5 boys and 6 girls below 89 in pallidity, all are below weight for height and age. The average amount under weight for the boys is 11.5% and for girls 17.3%. Table 42 is displayed on the following page. From Perquits, Pelleduzzi of Gifted Children. Development of Carpal Bones. Rowan's genograms were available for 57 of the gifted children 29 boys and 28 girls, from 9 to 12 years. The selection of children was made at random. The mean total areas of the carpal bones for these children are given in Table 43, with the mean areas for a group of Iowa children of the same ages. Table 43 is displayed on the page. Mean area of carpal bones for 57 gifted children and 126 Iowa University school children. From an examination of Table 43, it will be seen that the areas of the gifted children are lower at each age, except at 10 years for the girls, than for the Iowa group. This may be due to chance, since the numbers involved make a very inadequate sampling. It is necessary, therefore, to take account of the height of these children. Height measurements were available for 43 of the group, 22 boys and 21 girls, and for all the Iowa children. The average heights for ages show that the California gifted boys are shorter than the Iowa boys at 10, 11 and 12 years, and the California gifted girls shorter than the Iowa girls at 11 years. While the differences between the two groups is partly inexplicable on the basis of difference in height, it cannot be wholly explained in this way. Stages of Physiological Maturation Observations were made on this group of children by the two examining physicians for some of the principal changes in both sexes during adolescence. See page 577. Five stages were indicated on the physical measurement cards to be followed by the examiners. These are 1. Lack of apparent sex development. 2. Beginning sex development indicated by a slight appearance of straight pubic hair. 3. Enlargement of genitals for boys and breasts for girls. 4. Noticeable pigmentation and curl pubic hair. 5. Complete pubescence for boys and first menstruation for girls. The progressive stages of physiological development necessary grade into each other without sharp or inaccurate lines of demarcation. Like height in inches or weight in pounds, 
the correlation between the stages of physiological maturity and height, weight, width of hips, and circumference of chest of the gifted children have been calculated and are given in Table 44. It will be seen that all the correlations are positive, and that probably all of them are significant. The highest correlations between physiological maturity and height are plus 0.529 deviation, 0.077 for girls at 12 years, and plus 0.498 deviation, 0.072 for boys at 13 years. The highest correlations between maturity and weight are plus 0.498 deviation, 0.083 for girls at 13 years, and plus 0.435 deviation, 0.078 for boys at 13 years. These correlations indicate that, for the given ages, the taller and heavier children are relatively more matured physiologically than the shorter, lighter children. In order to determine to what extent the correlations were due to weight and to height, respectively, partial correlations were computed in order to determine the relation between physiological maturity and the physical measurements when the influence of weight and height are separately eliminated. These partial correlations are given in Table 45. The significant correlations here are the correlation plus 0.411 deviation 0 0.088 between physiological maturity and height. When the effect of weight is eliminated for 12-year-old girls, the correlation is plus 0.264 deviation 0 0.090 between maturity and height. When the effect of weight is eliminated for 13-year-old boys, the correlation plus 0.437 deviation 0 0.090 between maturity and weight when the effect of height is eliminated for 13-year-old girls. On the basis of these partial correlations, it may be concluded that the taller girls at 12 years are more mature physiologically than the shorter girls, that the taller boys at 13 years are more mature physiologically than the shorter boys, and the more mature girls at 13 are heavier than the less mature. Table 44 is displayed on the page. Intercorrelations between five stages of pubescence, physiological maturity, standing height, weight, circumference of chest, and width of hips for 290 gifted children. Table 44 is displayed on the following page. Partial correlations between five stages of pubescence, physiological maturity, and standing height, weight, circumference of chest, and width of hips for 290 gifted children. Nationality Deviations in nationalities in height and weight. The boys and girls representing a preponderance of a particular nationality were selected, and the amount of deviation above or below the norm in height for age, and in weight for height and age, was calculated. The results are shown in Table 46 for the seven predominating nationalities. The Jewish and Irish boys are the heaviest for their height and age, and the American and Jewish girls are the heaviest for their height and age. The American girls include, however, two unusual cases of 34 and 60 pounds overweight, respectively. Table 46 is displayed on the page. Deviations from the norm in height and weight of gifted children of seven predominating nationalities. Deviations of nationalities in cephalic index. The cephalic index is the proportion of the width of the head to the length. This index is frequently used by anthropologists for determining race classifications. The width varies from 70 to 90% of the length for normal individuals. Within these limits, three general divisions are indicated. 1. The long head, or dolichocephalic, below 75%. 2. The broad head, or brachycephalic, ranging from 80 to 87%. 3. The intermediate form, or mesocephalic, ranging from 75 to 80%. It will be noted, Table 47, that all of these children lie in the upper range of the mesocephalic and the lower range of the brachycephalic, excepting the Scandinavian boys who approach the extreme brachycephalic type. For the American boys, the indices range from 75 to 84%. For the American girls, from 76 to 86%. For the English boys, from 71 to 88%. For the English girls, from 74 to 87%, for the Jewish boys from 74 to 87%, for the Jewish girls from 73 to 89%,
for the Scandinavian boys from 81 to 92 per cent, for the Scandinavian girls from 75 to 85 per cent, for the Scotch boys from 74 to 83 per cent, with one exception at 90, for the Scotch girls from 71 to 81 per cent, with one exception at 85. This illustrates the fact that various types are found within a particular nationality. This is especially true of this group of children, where the classification is based on simply a preponderance of nationality. Table 47 is displayed on the page. Average cephalic indices of gifted children of the seven predominant nationalities. Mental and physical status. Since the mental examinations of these children were given prior to the physical measurements, the mental ages were computed to correspond with the exact chronological age at the time of the physical measurement on the assumption that the IQs for the short intervals remained constant. In a study of the physical status of this group of gifted children, it is found that the group is, as a whole, physically superior to the various control groups used for comparison. In order to determine the exact amount of correspondence between mental superiority and physical superiority, it would be necessary to study a very large group of unselected children. This is not possible for this investigation. Tables 48 and 49 give the correlations that were calculated for the gifted group. Table 48 is displayed on the page. Coefficients of correlation between mental age and height and weight of 397 gifted children. Table 49 is displayed on the page. Total and partial correlation between mental age, chronological age, and seven physical traits of 594 gifted children. The coefficients, Table 48, for weight and mental age for 10-year-old boys, height and mental age for 11-year-old girls, standing height and mental age, and weight and mental age for 13-year-old boys indicate a positive relationship. The correlations, Table 49, between mental age and standing height for the mentally superior boys and girls, independent of the effect of chronological age, are found to be plus 0.219, deviation 0.036, and plus 0.211, deviation 0.038. Both of them probably significant correlations. When the entire group is taken as a whole, and chronological age is partially out, it is found that there is a slight positive correlation between mental age and standing height for boys and girls, table 49, but none between mental age and the other physical measurements. That a significant correlation between mental age and standing height is obtained for this selected group in what the IQs range from 140 upward indicates that the correlation will be much higher with a large unselected group in which the range of IQs is wider. It is not possible to predict from the data presented here whether the amount of correspondence between superior physical measurements other than standing height and weight and superior mentality would be significant. Summary and Conclusions 1. The gifted California children as a group are above the best standards for American-born children in physical growth status for average standing height and weight. They also excel in average standing height and weight other groups of California children studied by Barnes, Boas, and Faber. 2. The gifted children deviate in a positive direction from the Baldwin weight, height, age, breathing standards for American-born children, but 62-73% to 73 deviate, not more than 10% above or below these norms. 3. A large proportion have broad shoulders and hips, strong muscles, and well-developed lungs. 4. In the 37 physical traits, the boys surpass the girls in the average of all traits up to 12 years of age, except width of hips, length of legs, and weight, in which the girls begin to show superiority prior to this age. After 12 years, the girls excel the boys in standing height, sitting height, stem length, and sternal notch, to chest measurements, hip measurements, and weight. 5. The physical traits of the girls are more variable than those of the boys with a coefficient of variability increasing slightly with age for both sexes. For boys and girls, the least variable measurements are for head, standing height, sitting height, stem length, width of shoulders, and width of chest. 
the most reliable are those of circumference of wrist, chest and arms, weight, and the psychophysical functions of breathing capacity and strength. 6. These children excel the children of a control group in Oak Park, Illinois, in four selected physical traits, arm span, width of shoulders, width of hips and grip. 7. Various types of cephalic indices are found within particular nationality groups represented by these children, but the majority of the children are of the mesocephalic type. 8. The coefficients of correlation between all of the physical traits are positive and high for each age and for each sex, range from 0.322 to 0.851. The coefficients are higher for boys than for girls. 9. When chronological age is made constant by means of partial correlations, the lowest coefficient for boys is 0.483 between breathing capacity and depth of chest, and the highest is 0.703 between standing height and weight. For girls, the lowest coefficient is 0.466 between breathing capacity and depth of chest, and the highest is 0.824 between breathing capacity and circumference of chest. 10. There is positive correlation between the standing height of fathers and sons and of mothers and daughters. 11. This group of children, measured by the Dreher method of predicting weight, gives a large percentage of overweight boys and underweight girls according to the Baldwin Wood norms, measured by the von Pritiquet nutritional rating. The majority of the children are grouped between 93 and 96. 12. The main areas of the carpal bones of 57 of the boys and girls taken at random are found by means of Roman genograms to be slightly below the average of Iowa children of the same ages. 13. All the coefficients of correlation between physical traits and stages of physiological maturity are significant for boys and girls of the ages 11, 12, and 13. The intercorrelations between the various physical traits are all high and positive. This shows that taller, heavier, larger boys and girls mature earlier than smaller children of the same chronological age. 14. The coefficients of correlation between mental age and standing height and weight for ages 10 to 13 years vary considerably for boys and girls. Although low, they are positive for weight for 10-year-old boys, for height for 11-year-old girls, and for height and weight for 13-year-old boys. 15. When age is made constant for the entire group of children from 2 years to 15 years of age by means of partial correlation, a small but probably significant positive correlation is found between mental age and height for boys and girls, but no correlation is found between mental age and other physical measurements. 16. The results of this investigation show that the gifted group is, as a whole, physically superior to the various groups used for comparison. End of section 7. Section 8 of Genetic Studies of Genius, Volume 1 Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis, Terman, and others. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey. Chapter 8 Health and Physical History This chapter will summarize data on health history for the main experimental group. The data came from three sources. 1. The home blank. 2. The school blank. And 3. The history records of the physicians who gave the medical examinations. The data from all three sources relate to the main group of 643 children but the subjects reported by the home, the school, and the medical examiners are not always identical. In each case, the data were obtained for 90% or more of the group, but were subjects for whom data were not available were not always the same. For practical purposes, however, the three kinds of data may be treated as three lines of evidence on the health conditions of a single group. The items of information called for in the three blanks were not always the same, but one and three covered in general much the same ground. When a given question was included in both home and school blanks, it was ordinarily worded identically in the two cases. 
The three schedules are as given below. On the following pages, the home blank is displayed. Each of the above three sources of data has its advantages and disadvantages. Doubtless the medical history, as recorded by the physicians, is the most reliable, as it was obtained from the parent in person, usually the mother, at the time the child was brought for the medical examination. Information thus obtained is likely to be both fuller and more accurate than can be obtained by written replies. The information obtained from the home blank is usually from the same source as the history data reported by the physicians, the mother, but is less complete. In both cases, the data are subject to the ordinary errors of report due to reports of memory and of observation. The cooperation of parents was such that it is believed the question of intentional falsification of report need not be raised. In judging the value of the information derived from parents, it is necessary to take account of the superior intelligence and education of the families represented in our group, and the fact that in about 30% of cases, the parents have kept a written record in the form of a baby book. The school blank was in nearly all cases filled out by the child's regular class teacher. The teacher's information is, of course, less complete than that of the parent, since it covers a briefer period, but for the same reason it is less likely to be vitiated by errors of memory. The teacher has also the advantage that she is likely to know more than the parent about the health conditions of the average child, which gives her a better standard for judgment. Moreover, she is able in many cases to refer to records of school health examinations made by school doctor or school nurse. Finally, the circumstance which makes the school reports of special interest is the fact that comparable reports were obtained from teachers for a control group, as well as for the gifted group. The source of the teacher's information in the case of the gifted and the control groups were as follows. A table is displayed on the page with three columns, comparing the main source of information to gifted and control in percentages. The controlled children attended the same schools as the gifted attended, and usually, but not always, the same class. This means that, in a majority of cases, the school blank for a control subject was filled out by a teacher who had filled one for a gifted subject. Effort was made to secure a control group, which would represent, as fairly as possible, the entire school population of grades 2 to 8. Their choice was made on an arbitrary and objective basis. In each case, the teacher was directed to select that child in the case whose chronological age was nearest to the age grade norm according to the following standards. A table is displayed on the page comparing grades to years and months. The above standards correspond very closely to the actual grade medians for the school population in the cities covered. Approximately 800 teachers distributed fairly evenly in the schools which were canvassed after January 1, 1922, were asked to fill out the school blanks for control subjects, one each. Approximately 600 did so with the necessary promptness, and the number of blanks filled out with sufficient completeness to make them usable was 527. These were distributed by age and sex as follows. A table is displayed on the page with three columns comparing age and boys and girls. As other control groups were used for other purposes, this one will be referred to as control group A. Length of pregnancy. Verbal report of mothers to physicians for 591 children of main experimental group gave the following results. Tables displayed on the page comparing the numbers of boys, girls and sexes combined to the percentages for premature, full term and over time. The 26 cases of premature birth were distributed as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing boys and girls to length of time in months. Length of pregnancy was reported in the home blank for 565 children of the same group. Data from this source gave 3.7% of births as premature, not over 8 calendar months, and 1.4% as over time, 10 calendar months. These figures agree closely with those based upon verbal reports to the physicians. Mother's health during pregnancy. Data are available only from the home blanks on this point. 
The following summary of responses is given for whatever it may be worth. The table is displayed on the page, comparing boys and girls, two grades for excellent, good, fair, poor, and very poor. There were 44 conditions of ill health reported in the home blank, including 9 cases of nervousness and 7 cases of nausea. No other condition was reported more than 3 times. Weight at birth. Birth weight was reported in the home blank for 569 children, exclusive of those prematurely born. The distributions are as follows, taking weight in each case to nearest half pound. A table is displayed on the page with boys compared to weights and girls compared to weights with a median, mean and standard deviation. There were 64 boys and 57 girls reported to the physicians whose birth weights were the result of hospital weighings. These give for the boys a mean of 8 pounds, 5.2 ounces, standard deviation 1 pound 7 ounces, and for the girls a mean of 7 pounds, 12 ounces, standard deviation 1 pound 2 ounces. The means for the hospital weighings are only a very little lower than those based on the reports in the home blank, but the variability of the former is considerably lower. It is probable that the hospital records are the more reliable, but it should be noted that in both cases, errors of memory may have entered. However, there are 140 boys and 68 girls for whom parents had kept written records, chiefly of home weighings. These give the following results. A table is displayed on the page comparing boys and girls to median, mean, standard deviation in weight. Both median and mean are higher for this group than for either of the other groups. For all the groups, they are significantly higher than the norm, as will be seen from the following comparative data. A table is displayed on the page comparing three columns with case studies compared to the mean for boys and the mean for girls. The mean birth weights furnished by Dr. Faber are of special interest for our present purpose for the reason that they are based upon San Francisco infants. Although these means are higher than most other investigators have found, they are still far below the mean for the gifted group. It may be of interest to compare the average of the four means for American children reported by Faber, Holt, Bowditch, and Hollingsworth with the average of the means for the three separate gifted groups. Total reported in home blank, cases reported in home blank for whom a baby book was kept, and cases of hospital weighings reported to two physicians. A table is displayed on the page comparing the average of Faber, Holt, Bowditch, and Hollingsworth, average of three gifted groups, excessive gifted over the norms, and excess in percent compared to the mean for boys and the mean for girls. The superiority of the gifted is about three-fifths of the standard deviation of the gifted. It is conceivable that some of the superiority may be due to a tendency for birth weights to be exaggerated in memory reports. But this were the explanation, the mean should be lower for children for whom written records were kept. Such was not the case. The evidence seems to justify the conclusion that our gifted children are above the norm with respect to weight of birth. Abnormal or unusual conditions of birth. The physicians obtained information on this point for 591 children of the main group. In the home blank, 536 of the same group were reported on the parents. The data from the two sources agreed very closely, but as the verbal reports made to the physicians are doubtless the more accurate, these only are presented. It will be noted, Table 49a. The 19% of the births of males and 12% of the births of females involve instrumental delivery. Such figures would suggest that the common belief regarding the influence of this factor in the causation of mental defect may not be well founded. Table 49a is displayed on the previous page, Conditions of Birth, with three columns comparing a series of known medical conditions, comparing to boys and girls. Infant feeding. The data summarized are for 589 cases reported in the home blank. The results are given separately for the nationality groups. 1. American, including all American-born mothers, except those of Jewish ancestry. 2. Foreign-born, including Canadians, but excluding all of Jewish ancestry. 3. Mothers of Jewish or partly Jewish ancestry. This group includes a few mothers who have not reported their ancestry as Jewish but it were believed to be of Jewish origin. The most important facts are given in Table 50. Table 50 is displayed on the page, Infant Feeding. 
There are six columns on the page comparing six factors. Breastfed only entire period. Bottle fed only entire period. Partially breast, partially bottle. Report not clear. Breast only eight months or longer. Breast only for less than eight months. The compared to percentages for American born non-Jewish, foreign born non-Jewish, Jewish, the total, and all 160 IQ or above. The proportion of breastfeeding is probably high for the social classes represented in this group. It is highest in the foreign born non-Jewish, next highest in the Jewish, and lowest in the American born non-Jewish. The figures of the last column for cases 160 IQ or over show a slightly but perhaps not significantly higher percentage of breastfeeding than is found for the total group. The low percentage of bottle feeding might be interpreted either as an indication that bottle feeding is not favourable to superior mental development, or that these parents have, because of their own intelligence, recognised the importance of breastfeeding. The latter is probably sufficient to account for all the difference found. Valuable comparative data on the proportion of infants who are breastfed are given for 20,504 cases by Woodbury. Table 51 shows the percent of Woodbury's cases and about Gifford cases that were breastfed for various periods. In the preparation of this table, infants which were partially breastfed are included but given only half weight. For this reason, the figures for the gifted do not exactly tally with those in Table 50. Woodbury's data are confined to children who live 12 months or longer. Table 51 is displayed on the page, percentage of breastfeeding among unselected and gifted children. The above figures show a considerably higher percentage of breastfeeding for the gifted. It should be noted, moreover, that Woodbury's data were obtained in industrial cities in which there was a large proportion of foreign-born. In fact, 21.2% of Woodbury's mothers are so classified. Since the percentage of breastfeeding is higher in the case of foreign-born than of native-born mothers, both in Woodbury's data and her own, the superiority of our gifted is even greater than the above figures would indicate. Table 52 gives additional comparative data. The figures from Dietrich are based upon 1,000 consecutive cases seen in private practice in Los Angeles, including no hospital or welfare cases. Dietrich does not state whether the 83 cases in which breastfeeding was supplemented by the bottle were included in the totals for breastfed. Mitchell's figures are based upon nearly 3,000 cases in a children's hospital for the years 1900 to 1915. The cases were not consecutive, and the method of selection is not given. The fact that this was a hospital group would make it of doubtful value for comparative purposes. Table 52 is displayed on the page. Additional comparative data on infant feeding. The superiority of the feeding conditions for the gifted group is even more marked in Table 52 than in Table 51. Perhaps the figures from Dietrich are the most valuable of all for our present purposes, since they are consecutive cases found in private practice among the middle classes of one of the cities covered in our survey. Only 39.2% of his cases, as compared with 57.4% of the gifted, were breastfed eight months or longer. A table is displayed on the page. Early health. The physicians report the following abnormal conditions during infancy. There are five columns listed on the page, comparing asphyxia, cyanosis, hemorrhage, convulsions, scurvy, rickets, digestive and malnutrition, compared to boys and girls, collated by Dr. Moore, and boys and girls, collated by Dr. Bronson. A total of 591 cases, 107, or 18.1%, suffered for one or more of the above conditions. In the home blank, parents read health during the first year, as shown in Table 53. Table 53 is displayed on the page, health during first year, home blank. Slightly more than half of the special conditions of ill health during the first year reported by the mothers were digestive disorders. Early development. Table 54 summarised the testimony of mothers to physicians at the time of the medical examination with respect to age of sitting alone, teething, first steps and first words, at least three. The data are subject to the usual vitiation from faulty memory and from lack of uniform meanings attached to such expressions as sitting alone, first steps, etc. 
The very early records are especially questionable, and for this reason the medians are probably more significant than the means. Below Table 54 are given for comparison the means, medians, and standard deviations based upon the reports made by parents in the home blank. Attention is called to the fact that the data from medical blanks and home blanks are not comparable on age of walking and talking, as the terms were, unfortunately, differently defined in the two cases. Table 54 is displayed on the previous page. Data on early development. Total for both physicians. Mead reports the following data on age of walking and talking for normal and feeble-minded children. Tables displayed comparing walking and talking to the normal and feeble-minded. Comparison of means shows that our gifted children walked about one month earlier and talked about three and a half months earlier than Mead's normal children. Mead's data were based on the following definitions. Walking means to take a step unassisted. Talking means to use a word intelligently, i.e. to associate the idea with the subject. The data for a gifted group shows the girls slightly more precocious than the boys in sitting alone, teething, walking and talking. In all cases, however, the difference is very small in comparison with the standard deviation. The coefficients of variation by the formula, V equals standard deviation multiplied by 100 divided by mean, are as follows for the physician's data. Boys, standalone 24.5, first tooth 31.3, first steps 20.1, first words 28.8. Girls, standalone 28.9, first tooth 34.5. First steps, 19.1. First words, 21.5. That is, the girls are more variable in two of the traits, and the boys in two. Disease history. The most important data on this point are those of Table 55, which is based upon the section of the medical examination blank entitled Ladder History. Table 55 is displayed on the page, Partial Summary of Disease History, Medical Examinations. The total number of positive reports in the above table is 1,697. There were one or more positive reports for 550 of the 591 children of the main group who were given medical examinations. This is an average of somewhat more than three for each child. Reports of two or more illnesses were made as follows. A table is displayed on the page, comparing data collected by boys, Dr. Moore, boys, Dr. Bronson, girls Dr. Moore and girls with Dr. Bronson, compared to the number of illnesses. Table 55 shows a large effect of subjective factors entering into medical statistics. Dr. Moore reports about a third more cases of sore throat, tonsillitis, adenitis, and colds in Dr. Bronson. That this difference is probably not due to climate or to hereditary tendencies in the population attracted to Los Angeles is suggested by the fact that Dr. Bronson reports bronchitis, and the disease of the respiratory tract more than twice as often as Dr. Moore. Dr. Bronson reports tooth act nearly three times as frequently as Dr. Moore, and she reports 50 of the 52 cases of abscess. The disagreements are due in part to the greater tendency of Dr. Moore to ignore minor departures from perfect health, and in part to the fact that Dr. Bronson questioned the mothers somewhat more extensively than did Dr. Moore. Table 56 summarizes the data of the physicians on certain symptoms, which are likely to be associated with tuberculosis. For all the symptoms in this group, the figures of Dr. Moore are higher than those of Dr. Bronson. It is very probable that this is due to the fact that Los Angeles attracts so many families in which there is low resistance to tuberculosis. The large figures for growing pains and night cries suggest that these symptoms are not very indicative of tuberculosis. The 35 children who were known to have been exposed to tuberculosis gave a smaller proportion of positive reports of growing pains than the total group. Night cries, however, were twice as frequent in the exposed group. Persistent cough, five times as frequent. Fever, nearly three times. And night sweats, four times. Table 56 is displayed on the page. History of symptoms sometimes associated with tuberculosis. Table 57 gives the percents reported in the home blank as having had various infectious diseases. The second and fourth columns of this table give for each disease the percent of tax which were described by the parents as severe or very severe, or in words of that effect. Table 57 is displayed on the page. Infectious diseases are reported by parents. Home blank. 
The above figures are almost identical for boys and girls. For both sexes, the incidence of scarlet fever, diphtheria, and pneumonia seems high, but comparative data for the general population of the cities are not available. Roughly 1 in 12 has had scarlet fever, 1 in 15 diphtheria, and 1 in 20 pneumonia. About a quarter of the cases of scarlet fever and diphtheria and half of the cases of pneumonia are described as having been severe or very severe. With an incidence so high, these diseases doubtless rob the world of many potential geniuses. At the same time, the frequency of severe cases among the superior children suggests that contagious diseases may not be as important a factor in the causation of mental defects as they are properly believed to be. Other serious illnesses reported include seven cases of smallpox, six of typhoid, three of infantile paralysis, seven mastoid operations, and eleven appendix operations. After effects of contagious diseases reported by parents in the home blank include the following. A table is displayed on the page with a series of medical disorders compared to the number of cases. Accidents and operations. Accidents were reported in the home blank as shown in table 58. Table 58 is displayed on the page, accidents suffered by gifted children, home blank. Surgical operations were reported by parents in the home blank as follows. A table is displayed on the page, listing tonsillectomy, adenoids, circumcision, appendectomy, mastoid, and miscellaneous, compared to the numbers of boys, girls, in total. Normal recovery reported in all except six cases. Slow recovery reported in five cases of tonsillectomy. Imperfect recovery from Lorenz, operation on hip. One case, child is still a cripple. Headaches. Information on the frequency of headaches was called for both in the home blank and the school blank. For this condition, we therefore have data from two sources on the gifted and from one source, school blank, on a control group. Frequent headaches were reported as follows. Gifted group, home blank, boys 2%, girls 2.4%. School blank, boys 2.3%, girls 2.6%. Control group, school blank. Boys 4.2%, girls 4.9%. That is, home and school reports agree very closely on the gifted, but the school report shows almost twice as many control as gifted having frequent headaches. However, when the numbers for frequent and occasional were combined, it was found that teachers report more gifted children than do parents as having headaches. But here also, the gifted make a better showing than the control. From these figures, it would seem that children are more likely to have at least occasional headaches at school and at home, and that this tendency is more marked with the control than with the gifted. Headaches may be largely psychological. Better physical care, less eye strain because of more glasses, etc., may account in part for the difference between the control and the gifted, but it is doubtful whether it does so entirely. Symptoms of general weakness the school blank called for symptoms of general weakness, if any. The question was answered for 527 of the gifted group and 594 of the control. Symptoms were reported as shown below. Table 59 is displayed on the page. Symptoms of general weakness, school blank. The above figures, it will be noted, are considerably more favourable for the gifted than for the control. Urinary disturbances. Histories of urinary disturbances were reported by the physicians as shown in Table 60. Table 60 is displayed on the page, History of Urinary Disturbances. Digestive troubles, basal press, were reported by the physicians as follows. A small table is displayed on the page. The above figures agree fairly well with the data on digestive troubles reported in the home blank. According to the parents, 15.2% of the boys and 12.5% of the girls have had digestive disturbances. Nutrition In the home blank, nutrition was rated as excellent, good, fair or poor. In the school blank, as good, fair or poor. Ratings from the two sources are, therefore, not strictly comparable. In the following figures, the most significant comparison is between the gifted and control groups in the school reports. It will be noted that the school reports poor nutrition nearly three times as frequently in the troll as in the gifted group. 
Table 61 is displayed on the page. Readings on nutrition. Obstructed breathing. The home blank and the school blank, both called for information regarding removal of tonsils and adenoids. In the former, the question was answered for 550 of the gifted group. In the latter, for 511 of the gifted and 493 of the control. These reports are, of course, less accurate than those of the physicians, but they are of interest because they were obtained for a control group in the cities covered by the survey. Table 62 is displayed on the page. Removal of adenoids and tonsils. Three facts stand out in the above figures. 1. A far larger proportion of boys than of girls have adenoid and tonsil operations. In this, the school and the home agree. 2. Both in the cases of adenoids and tonsils, the school reports about 60% more removal for the gifted than for the control. 3. The home, as would be expected, reports more removals than the school, the latter overlooking about a quarter of all cases. Of 20,000 Denford children, 10% were reported by teachers as having had adenoids or tonsils removed. Of 16,000 Salt Lake City children, 13%. This is far lower even than the figures for our control group, a difference which is probably attributable to better medical attention given to school children in cities of California. Mouth breathing. Homeschool blanks called for a rating on mouth breathing as none, slight, marked, or extreme. The school reports 50% more cases of mouth breathing in the control than in the gifted group, and three times as many cases which are marked or extreme. This would be expected from the fact that the gifted have more often had adenoid and tonsil operations. Table 63 is displayed on the page, Home and School Reports of Mouth Breathing. There is a marked sex difference in favour of the girls. This is observed in both home and school reports, and for both gifted and control groups. A similar difference in the same direction was found with respect to frequency of adenoid and tonsil removal. That is, the girls have less often had tonsils or adenoids removed, and are less often mouth breathers. Somewhat more mouth breathers were reported by parents than by teachers. No consistent age tendencies were found. Since the gifts were classified in four grades by both home and school, it was possible to compute the correlation between the two ratings for extent of mouth breathing. This was done and found to be 0.56. Of 16,000 children in Salt Lake City, 9% were classified by their teachers as mouth breathers. The school report for our gifted group is 20.5%, and for our control group, 38.5%. The number of marked or extreme cases for our gifted group is only 2.5%, school report, and for our control group, 7.5%. Frequency of colds. Frequency with which the children suffered colds was reported in the home and school blanks as shown in Table 64. Again, we find a marked sex difference in favour of the girls. In the gifted group, more than twice as many boys as girls are said to have colds frequently or very frequently. The school reports a somewhat higher percentage of frequent or very frequent colds for the gifted than for the control, but this is offset by a higher percentage of gifted reported under the caption rarely. Of 16,000 children in Salt Lake City, 20% were reported by teachers as having colds as often two or three times a month. Table 64 is displayed on the page, Frequency of Colds. Hearing. Percent ratings in the home and school blanks are somewhat defective, poor or very poor, in hearing as follows. Gifted both sexes, home blank, 3.6%. Gifted both sexes, school blank, 2.3%. Control, both sexes, school blank, 5.9%. That is, parents report more cases of defective hearing among the gifted group than do teachers, and teachers report nearly three times as many cases for the control group as a report for the gifted. The difference is probably large enough to be significant and may be related to the fact that more of the gifted group have had adenoids and tonsils removed. Data were worked out for the sexes separately, but no significant differences were found. A similarly worded question used by the writer in school surveys gave 4% of 20,000 children with defective hearing in Denver and 5% of 16,000 in Salt Lake City. Vision 
The school blank called for a rating of vision, without glasses as normal, somewhat defective or very poor, also for information as to whether the child wore glasses. Combining ages, we had the following proportion of gifted and control groups, rated either as somewhat defective or as very poor. A small table is displayed on the page, comparing gifted to control, to subnormal vision and wearing glasses. About a quarter more cases of subnormal vision are reported for the gifted than for the control. This may be due to the fact that the gifted use their eyes more for reading, writing and other near work. A more probable explanation is that, with a given degree of defect, the gifted, because of the greater intelligence of their parents, are more likely than other children to have the vision corrected by glasses. This would call the teacher's attention to the existence of a defect and cause it to be reported. Nervous Disturbances Under a letter history, the physicians report 45.1% of the boys and 32.3% of the girls as having had a record of nervous symptoms. Dr. Bronson reporting about 50% more than Dr. Moore. One third of all cases are accounted for by nail biting. The remaining two thirds are distributed widely among such symptoms as restless, nervous, excitable, headaches, twitching, restless sleep, grinding teeth, sensitiveness, etc. Both home and school blank contain the question, is child especially nervous? We thus have reports from both sources on the gifted and from one source, school blank, on a control group. The data are as follows. A small table is displayed on the page comparing the gifted control group to school report and home report. The parents report about 50% more cases of nervousness than the teachers. Teachers report about the same number of gifted and control boys as nervous, but about 75% more control than gifted girls. In a survey of the Denver schools, approximately 10% of about 20,000 children enrolled were described by their teachers as showing such symptoms as muscular twitching, nervousness, excessive timidity, tendency to cry or to worry, stuttering, etc. The same method in the survey of the Salt Lake City schools gives 11.8% of about 16,000 for whom the question was answered. Teachers in Philadelphia reporting on 4,000 children classified 11.4% of the boys and 9.6% of the girls as nervous. There is nothing in the above data to indicate that gifted children are more likely than others to show the ordinary symptoms of nervousness. In response to the question, how shown, 41 different symptoms of nervousness were mentioned. Of these, restlessness, excitability, irritability, and now biting account for more than half the cases. The other symptoms include crying without cause, twitching, timidity, stuttering, worry, sensitiveness, trembling, restless sleep, etc. No significant differences were found between the gift and control groups in the nature of the symptoms shown. Information on stuttering was asked for specifically in both home and school blank. Also information regarding its severity. The results are as follows. Tables displayed on the page comparing the school blank and home blank to gifted and control. Omitting the slight and very slight cases, we have the following. Another table is displayed on the page comparing the school blank and home blank to the gifted and control groups. That the majority of all cases reported are not very serious is indicated by the fact that of the gifted group, only 1.0% are reported as stutterers by both home and school. Of 20,000 children in Denver, 3% were reported by their teachers as stutterers. Of 16,000 children in Salt Lake City, 1.8%. Conradi's census of 87,000 children in various cities of the United States gave 2.46% with speech defects and 0.8% as stutterers. There is no evidence in the above figures that stuttering is more common among gifted than among normal children. The teachers report no case of chorea for either the gifted or control group. The parents report two in the gifted group as having had an attack several years previously. Two cases in more than 500 represent about the normal frequency. Information regarding market fears was asked for only in the home blank, hence no controlled data are available. Of the gifted boys, 10.3% were reporters having marked fears. Of the gifted girls, 13.0%. Approximately 80% of the cases were under the age of 11 years. As causes of fear, 
Darkness is mentioned 20 times. Dogs and fire, 6 each. Other animals and dogs, 5 times. Nothing else more than twice. School reports were secured on excessive timidity for gifted and control groups. The results are as follows. A table is displayed on the page, Mary. Number reported on, and percent timid, compared to the gifted and control groups. It will be noted that although there is little difference between the gifted and control group, sexes combined, the gifted girls are reported timid twice as frequently as gifted boys. In the control group, the difference is smaller, but in the same direction. The question in the home blank asking whether the child had had night terrors, and how often, brought positive reports for 9.4% of the boys and for 10.5% of the girls. However, only 20 of the 51 who had had night terrors were subject to frequent attacks. This is out of a total of 515 reported on. The problem having had frequent attacks is therefore 4%. More than three-fourths of all cases occurred before the age of eight years. More than half were described simply as bad dreams or nightmares, with screaming or crying on waking. Tendency to worry was reported as follows in the home and school blanks. Small tables displayed on the page carrying the school blank and home blank to the gifted and control groups. No significant differences found between the gifted and control groups or between the home and school reports on the gifted. There were no marked age differences. School work was given as a source of worry in about half the cases in both gifted and control groups. Habitus. The following data on habitus are summarised from the medical blanks and are based in part on the observations of the examining physicians and in part on information reported to them by their parents. Table 65 is displayed on the page. Summary of physicians' reports on habitus. The highly subjective nature of the judgments on which the above figures are based is indicated by the large difference in the reports of the two physicians on certain items. Dr. Bronson, for example, reports 28.8% as unstable, as compared with 2.8% reported by Dr. Moore. Shores reports nearly four times as many unruly as are reported by Dr. Moore. Dr. Moore reports three times as many boys as girls as unstable, a sex difference which is not found in the data of Dr. Bronson. However, both physicians report more boys and girls as irritable. Dr. Moore reported nearly twice as many children of the ages 10 to 13 as of the younger ages, to be muscularly weak, unstable, irritable, easily fatigued, and unruly. While in Dr. Bronson's data, there were no significant age differences. Eating Habits Eats Fast Of Dr. Moore's cases, 54.3% of boys and 22.5% of girls were reported as eating fast. Of Dr. Bronson's cases, 43.8% of boys and 31.1% of girls of the entire group, 44.1% of boys and 26.6% of girls. In the reports of both physicians, the boys show a small but probably significant increase as adolescents approaches in the proportion of eating fast. The girls show a noticeable decrease. Eats between meals. Of Dr. Moore's cases, 62.5% of the boys and 58.5% of the girls are reported as eating between meals. Of Dr. Bronson's cases, 23.6% of the boys and 16.7% of the girls. However, in 36.8% of Dr. Bronson's records, the data on this point were not obtained. There were no marked age differences. Daily consumption of milk. The average daily amount of milk consumed by the boys is 1.12 pence. By the girls, 1.10 pence. Of the boys, 2.2% are reported as drinking no milk. Of the girls, 6.9%. Green vegetables daily. This question is answered yes for 88.5% of boys and 93.7% of girls in Dr. Moore's group, and for 74.7% of boys and 77.3% of girls in Dr. Bronson's group. Eats meat daily. Dr. Moore reports yes for 60.4% of the boys and 59.2% of girls. Dr. Bronson for 71.3% of the boys and 72.0% of girls. It would be interesting to know whether the difference between the two groups is due to the more stimulating climate of the San Francisco Bay region where Dr. Bronson's cases live. Eats fruit daily. 
The record is yes for all but one of Dr. Moore's group, and for 84.3% of Dr. Bronson's boys and 86.4% of her girls. Drinks tea. Of Dr. Moore's boys, 8.6% are reporters drinking tea. In the only two of these cases is the amount more than one cup a day. In three cases, the tea is described as very weak. Of the girls, 2.8% are reported, in no case, more than one cup a day. Of Dr. Bronson's boys, 9.5% drink tea at least occasionally. The amount is not specified. 13 or 9.8% of Dr. Bronson's girls drink tea. One seven-year-old boy is reported, but no others under nine. Drinks coffee. In Dr. Moore's group, the record is yes for 8.6% of boys and 9.2% of girls. In Dr. Bronson's group, for 15.2% of boys and 17.4% of girls. No boy under nine and no girl under seven was reported as drinking coffee, and no case was the amount more than one cup daily. Eats candy. The data on this point can be taken as suggestive only, as the answers were recorded in rather indefinite terms. Rough groupings were made as shown below. No marked age or sex differences were found. A table is displayed on the page with three columns covering Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson percentages. Two surveyed responses. One, none, very little, readily, once a week. Dr. Moore, 29.6%. Dr. Bronson, 24.8%. Two, occasionally, some moderate amount, two or three times a week. Dr. Moore, 58.7%. Dr. Bronson, 31.0%. Three, daily, often too much, considerable, a good deal. Dr. Moore, 5.3%. Dr. Bronson, 39.0%. Four, not answered. Dr. Moore, 6.4%. Dr. Bronson, 5.2%. Personal hygiene. Data on constipation are reported by the physicians as follows. A table is displayed on the page with the survey's percentages from Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson compared with regular constipated no record. The following figures summarize the frequency of brushing teeth as reported to physicians by parents. The various age groups are combined as no significant age differences were evident. The table is displayed on the page comparing the percentages obtained by Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson. The mean number of baths per week by age and sex as reported to the physicians was as follows. A table is displayed on the page displaying the mean number of baths per week by age. Sleep Habits The home blank called for the child's usual hour of going to sleep, time required to go to sleep, and soundness of sleep. Table 66 gives the median number of hours of sleep. Table 66 gives the median number of hours of sleep by age for the gifted group together with the age means found by Terman and Hocking for 2,692 unselected children. Table 66 displayed on the page, Hours of Sleep of Gifted Children. Table 66 indicates that these gifted children sleep more on the average than do unselected children. The difference is small at 6 years, but increases to about 3 quarters of an hour by the age of 12 years. Terman and Hocking found that feeble-minded children of the ages 6 to 13 sleep considerably less than normal children, but that feeble-minded adults sleep more than normal adults. The average time required to go to sleep is 7 minutes for the group. Sleep is reported by the parents as sound for 98.9% .9 of all cases. The physicians report that 79% of boys and 70% of girls, or 75% of all, sleep alone, and that 96% sleep with window open. A daily nap is reported for 7 girls and eight boys, all but two are under eight years. Hours out of doors daily. As would be expected, the boys spend somewhat more time out of doors than do the girls, but there are no significant age differences. In Dr. Moore's group, the boys average 3.5 hours daily out of doors, the girls 3.3 hours. Dr. Bronson's figures show an average of 2.6 hours for boys and 1.9 hours for girls. There are three of Dr. Moore's group who spend less than one hour out of doors, as compared with 24 of Dr. Bronson's group. Of Dr. Moore's group, 23 spend five or more hours out of doors. Of Dr. Bronson's group, only one. Data for 587 cases. Sexual development of gifted boys. 
Condition of the pubic hair was recorded by Dr. Moore in the case of 115 boys of 9 years and older. For comparison with Clampton's data, from 3,835 boys in the high schools of New York City. Cranman takes as his criterion of completed pubescence the appearance of the kink or twist in pubic hair, which is definitely a characteristic. When this appears, he considers that the boy has reached puberty during the period which extends from the beginning of the growth of pubic hair up to the time when the kink appears, the boy is said to be pubescent. Grantham's figures are based upon examination of 3,835 high school boys in New York City during the years 1901-06. Of these boys, 98% were American-born, but in about 40% of the cases, both parents were born abroad. He calls attention to the differences in sex development between the various racial groups only in a general way, except for the German group, in which he points out, puberty tends to occur in a later period than with children of American-born parents. The data for Dr. Moore's group are as follows. A table displayed on the page comparing age, case examined, hair present, percent, hair kinky, and percent. As will be seen from the figures below, the children of foreign-born parents were much more numerous in Crampton's group. A table is displayed on the page comparing birthplace of parents, gifted group, 115 cases, by percentage, and Crampton's 3,835 cases by percentage. Table 67 shows the proportions of post-pubescence, pubescence, and pre-pubescence in the two groups at successive ages. Table 67 is displayed on the page, Adolescent Development, Gifted and Normal Boys. The above figures would indicate that the gifted boy tends to mature somewhat earlier than the average, but the numbers in the gifted group are too small to be more than suggestive. Condition of pubic hair was not noted by Dr. Bronson, but change of voice was recorded by both physicians for all boys of 10 years of order. The figures are as follows for the total of 221 cases. The table is displayed on the page comparing age, total cases, number changing, and percent changing or changed. Sexual development of girls. Presence or absence of pubic hair was recorded by both physicians for all girls of 10 years and over. Dr. Moore's cases were examined by a woman assistant. Condition of hair is noted in some instances as scanty or profuse, straight or kinky, but not in all. Hence, no differentiation is made in the total given below. Reports of the two physicians agreed closely and have therefore been combined. A table is displayed on the page comparing age, total cases, Pubic hair present and percent of total. Table 68A is displayed on the following page. Age of first menstruation of American girls. Age of first menstruation for those who have already matured is as follows. For the present age groups taken separately. It will be noted that the age is taken to last birthday. A table is displayed on the page comparing present age an age of first menstruation taken to last birthday. Table 68A gives comparative data for age of first menstruation of normal American girls. The data for the first four groups are taken from Bird T. Baldwin's Physical Growth of Children from Birth to Maturity, University of Iowa Studies, 1921, page 190. These groups are described as coming from the middle and upper social classes. Group 5 is reported by H.P. Bowditch, Massachusetts Board of Health Report, 1877, and Group 6 by Burledge, American Journal of Physiology, April 1923. Probably the data for the first four groups are the most accurate. The following figures, Table 68b, permit a comparison between this combined group of 388 girls and the girls of the gifted group with respect to the number of those who were 11 years old or older who had matured before 11 or before 12. Of the number who were 13 years old or older, who matured before 11, before 12, before 13, etc. Table 68b is displayed on the previous page. Comparison of gifted girls of norms and age of first menstruation. The number of gifted girls who have reached 13 or 14 is too small to give the above figures a very high degree of reliability. But as far as they go, the indicated tendency to considerably earlier maturity for the gifted therefore unselected girls. 
for example, of gifted girls 13 years old or older, about half matured before the age of 13, as compared with a quarter of unselected girls. Mammary development of girls was reported by Dr. Moore, but not by Dr. Bronson. A positive report includes all cases in which the pubertal development of the mammary glands had begun. Because of the difficulty of interpreting the records, no attempt had been made to differentiate as to extent of development. No strictly comparative data are available. A table is displayed on the page comparing cases positive and percent positive to present age. Seven histories of masturbation were reported to the physicians, including four boys and three girls. The data on this point are probably very incomplete. Summary 1. Data on health history for about 90% of the main gifted group were obtained from the home blank, the school blank, and the medical examiner's case history records. By means of the school blank, comparative data on many points were obtained from a representative control group of corresponding age attending the same schools which the gifted children attend. 2. Of the gifted group, 4.4% were born prematurely, 2.7% as early as 8 months. In only 7.8% of cases was a mother's health during pregnancy rated as poor or very poor. 3. The mean birth weight was approximately three-fourths of a pound above the norm, according to accepted standards. This excess amounts to three-fifths of the standard development of the birth weights of the gifted. 4. Approximately 19% of the male births and 12% of the female births involved instrumental delivery. 5. Only 8.2% of the gifted were bottle-fed during the entire period, while 47.5% were breastfed only, and 43.5% were partially breastfed. The proportion of breastfeeding was considerably higher than for the general population, and was appreciably higher for the case above 160 IQ than for the entire group. 6. Health during the first year was rated by the mothers as excellent, or good, for 74% of cases, and as very poor for only 3.3%. 7. Age of learning to walk averaged about one month less, and of learning to talk about three and a half months less, than mean ages for normal children. Dentition was perhaps slightly precocious. 8. Summary of contagious diseases history shows no important deviations of this group from the normal child population, as perhaps a rather high percent have had scarlet fever, 9.1%, and diphtheria, 5.9%. 9. Nearly a third of the group have suffered one or more accidents. About 8% of the group, bone fracture. The number of surgical operations averaged slightly more than one per child, more than half of which were for adenoids or tonsils. 10. About half as many of the gifted as of the control group, according to school reports, suffer frequent headaches. 11. Symptoms of general weakness were reported by the school nearly 30% less frequently for the gifted than for the control group. 12. The school reports nutrition is poor for 2.6% of the gifted, as compared with 7.2% of the control. This is in harmony with the results of metabolism tests reported in Chapter 9. 13. More than half the gift group had undergone tonsillectomy, as compared with about a quarter of the control group. 14. Marked or extreme mouth breathing is reported by one-third as frequently for the gifted as for the control group. 15. In frequency of colds, no significant difference was found in the school reports on the two groups. 16. Defective hearing is approximately two and a half times as frequent among the control as among the gifted, according to school reports. 17. The school reports about a quarter more cases of defective vision for the gifted than for the control. 18. Indications of nervousness are reported by the school for 13.3% of gifted and for 16.1% of control. Stuttering, including mild cases, are reported for 2.6% of the gifted and for 3.4% of control. Only two cases give a history of chorea. Excessive timidity and tendency to worry were reported with about equal frequency in the gifted and control groups. 19. The data on habitus are difficult to evaluate because of lack of suitable control data. 20. Case histories obtained by the medical examiners indicate that for the gifted group, the dietary regime is above the average for the general child population. 21. Approximately 8% of the gifted group suffer more or less from constipation.
22. The gifted children show significant excess of daily hours of sleep as compared with the term and hogging norms. The excess is slight with the younger children, but amounts to about 50 minutes by age 12. 23. The gifted boys spend, on an average, about three hours outdoors daily, the girls about two and a half hours. 24. Pubescence, as indicated by a mountain kinkiness of the pubic hair, occurs on the average somewhat earlier among gifted than among unselected boys. Owing to the small number of gifted boys above 12 years, this conclusion is only tentative. 25. Of gifted girls 13 years old or older, 48% had menstruated before 13, as compared to 25% for unselected girls. Figure 9 is displayed on the page, Growth and Development of Gifted Unselected Children. Figure 10 is displayed on the page, Physical Defects in Gifted and Control Group. End of Section 8section nine of genetic studies of genius volume one mental and physical traits of a thousand gifted children by lewis terman this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings from the public domain for more information or volunteer please visit librivox.org recorded by leon harvey chapter nine medical examinations subjects Medical examinations were given by the two physicians to 783 children of the various gifted groups. The purpose of this, as of other divisions of our study, was twofold. A. To secure data that would contribute to a better understanding of individual cases, and B. To secure a basis for generalizations with respect to the health conditions of gifted children in general. In the interest of the latter purpose, the present summary is confined to the medical examinations of 591 gifted subjects of the main experimental group. The number of families represented is 502, or 87%, of the total of 578 in the main group. A small part of the loss of 13% was due to Christian science beliefs of the parents. The greater part to such causes as change of residence, illness in the family, difficulties in the way of bringing the child for examination, etc., Table 69 gives the distributions of the 591 subjects by age, sex, and examining physician. Age in Table 69 is age at last birthday preceding the medical examination. The average is about a year greater than age at the time the subjects were first located and tested. Table 69 is displayed on the page, subjects of main group given medical examinations. Previous experience of the examining physicians. The professional records of the examining physicians are as given below. Dr. Moore, B.S., University of Minnesota, 1895, M.D., University of Minnesota, 1897. Postgraduate work in New York City, about 12 months. Postgraduate in pediatrics in New York and Baltimore. 18 years in general practice in New York and New Rochelle, New York. Captain Medical Corps of the United States Army, in 1918. Senior Residency in Pediatrics at the University of California through 1919-20. Attending Physician in Pediatrics through 1920-21 in San Francisco State and Country Hospital. At present a member of the Hollywood Medical Group, practice limited to children. Member of the Clinical Staff of the Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Member of the Attending Staff of the Hollywood Hospital. Dr. Bronson, M.D., Johns Hopkins University, 1913. Intern, Children's Hospital, San Francisco, 1913-14. Resident Physician, New York City Children's Hospital, Randalls Island, 1914-15. Resident Physician, Hospital for Sick Children, Edinburgh, 1915-16. Resident Physician, Paddington Green Children's Hospital, London, 1916-17. Resident Physician, Pendlebury Children's Hospital, Manchester, 1917-18. Temporary Physician, Outpatient Department, Children's Hospital, Great Ormond Street, London, 1918-19. Associate Physician, Children's Hospital, San Francisco, 1919-23. Assistant Professor, University of California Medical School, 1923. It is evident from the above records that both physicians were exceptionally well qualified by training and experience for making the proposed examinations. Both were recommended for the work 
by the Pediatric Department of the University of California and Stanford University Medical Schools. Both are highly trained specialists in children's diseases. Dr. Moore has had much more experience in general practice, but Dr. Bronson has had a somewhat more varied and extended hospital experience. In a comparison of the data reported separately by the two physicians in this chapter, it's well to bear in mind this difference in their experience as it properly accounts for some of the differences in number and kind of defects reported. It was most fortunate for the investigation that two such competent examiners were available. Both took a genuine research interest in the outcome and worked with the most painstaking devotion. Examination Schedule and Procedure The examination schedule was planned at a conference between the examining physicians and an advisory committee of the Stanford University Medical Facility. It was based in large part upon a schedule which had been used for some time by Dr. H. K. Faber of the Stanford Pediatrics Department. It is intended to provide for an examination of approximately one hour duration, about equally divided between history and examination proper. The section of the schedule pertaining to history has been given in the preceding chapter. The section pertaining to the examination follows. A printed form is displayed on the page titled Physical Examination. Conditions of Examinations and Procedure Dr. Moore, all examinations were made in my office, Hollywood Medical Group. Appointments were made for 10 and 11 a.m. and for 2 and 3 p.m. As nearly as possible, the time in each was an hour, including the history. A worksheet was used and copy made at night. 60% of the examinations were made in the afternoon. First, the history was taken, child not being present, then the physical examination was made, following the order of the examination blank. The child was stripped to the waist. Genitals were regularly inspected by me in case of the boys and by a nurse in case of the younger girls. The older girls were not examined in this respect. Dr. Bronson. Examinations were made daily each afternoon of the week and on three forenoons. The average time, including write-up, was nearer an hour and a half than an hour. The history was taken in the order called for the blank, and statements were written down at once, with remarks. Frequently, additional facts and history were added during the examination. At the point of habits in history, the child started to undress. Urine specimen in office was obtained, while the child was undressing behind screen. The examination began with the child wrapped in a sheet, lying down. The back and extremities were examined in standing posture. Young child nude, older with posterior view nude, except a few males, adults, who were not stripped. The order was as follows. General impression, skin, head, eyes, nose, neck, chest, abdomen, genitals, neurologic, mental, endocrine glands, urine, blood pressure, back, extremities, bones, joints, muscles and tendons, ears, mouth, blood. The child dressed just before the examination of ears and mouth. Nearly all of Dr. Bronson's examinations were made in a private office in San Francisco, though a few were made in a psychological laboratory at Stanford University. Dr. Moore examined the children who lived in the vicinity of Los Angeles, Dr. Bronson those of the San Francisco Bay region. One extended conference of the physicians and advisory committee was held before the examinations began, and another after each physician had examined about 50 or 60 children. Unfortunately, owing to the distance by which the two centers are separated, 500 miles, more frequent conferences were not possible. The data from the two sources are doubtless somewhat less comparable than they would have been had more frequent detailed comparison of procedure been possible. General Impression Apparent Nutrition Dr. Moore recorded in terms of actual weight using Wood's scale. Dr. Bronson recorded according to personal impression as she did not weigh the children. As the height weight index has been treated in connection with the anthropometric measurements, Chapter 7, it does not seem worthwhile to present in any detail the records of the examining physicians on this point. Dr. Moore reports 40% of his boys as normal, 29% as overweight, and 31% as underweight. Dr. Bronson reports 36% of her boys as normal, 21% as underweight, 12% as below par, sometimes adding such descriptive terms as flabby, nutrition poor, etc. She reports 20% as overweight, 5% as undernourished, 1 with feminine distribution of fat, and 10 with indefinite description 
as nutrition only fair, etc. Of the girls, Dr. Moore reports 31% as normal, 34% as underweight, and 35% as overweight. Dr. Bonson reports 31% as normal, 16% as underweight, 6% as under par, 6% as undernourished, and 38% as overweight. According to the above figures, between a third and a quarter of these children are underweight or undernourished. The school reports summarized in the preceding chapter show 15.1% with fair and 2.6% with poor nutrition, as compared with 16.8% fair and 7.2% poor for a control group. Phases. Dr. Moore reports 97.5% of his cases as normal, bright, or very bright in appearance. Three cases are reported as dull in appearance and two as having adenoids phases. All of these are boys. Dr. Bonson reports 95% of her cases as normal. She reports known cases as adenoid phases, 2% circles under eyes, and 1 phases of chronic intestinal indigestion. Two additional cases are underlined without description. Colour of skin. Dr. Moore reports one seven-year-old girl as very pale, one 13-year-old girl as having flushed cheeks, and one nine-year-old boy as pale, all others as normal. Dr. Bronson reports five girls and four boys as yellow or sallow, two girls as florid, adding that one of these has blue nails. She reports one girl and seven boys as pale, and underlines two other cases of that description, all other cases are checked as normal. Colour of mucous membrane. Checked as normal by both physicians in all cases. Metabolism tests. Dr. Moore secured metabolism tests of 93 subjects, 47 boys and 46 girls, selected at random from the gifted group. The age distribution of these subjects was as follows. The table is displayed on the page, comparing age, boys, girls in total. The tests were made by Mr. Calvin Van Schack, MS chemist and bacteriologist. The procedure is described by Dr. Moore as follows. The subject was ordered to eat a light supper the evening previous to the test and report to the laboratory as conveniently as possible in the morning with no breakfast, medication, water or other intake of any kind. On arrival, careful inquiry was made regarding this point and the test was deferred in those instances in which there was acknowledgement that anything had been eaten. Inspection was then made for tight or uncomfortable clothing or hair arrangement, bladder was emptied, temperature and pulse were noted, and the subject was then isolated at bed rest for at least 30 minutes, under as quiet conditions as were possible in a busy group office. In most instances, better control was established by keeping out parents and companions throughout the entire procedure once the subject was turned over to the laboratory. Following this, the subject was transferred to the metabolism room and put comfortably to rest. The metabolimeter was demonstrated on the operator and the procedure was explained in so far as it could be appreciated. In most subjects, confidence, relaxation and enthusiasm with a spice of competition was obtained quite readily. Now there were a few who were somewhat hesitant when it came to the final steps. None were so apprehensive as to account for a marked pathologic rating. Those who showed definite instability were privileged to hold the mouthpiece and nose clamp to themselves during the dummy test. The subjects were then allowed to rest alone until at ease and with a pulse rate practically the same as to when it was first taken, usually about 15 to 20 minutes. The test was then run for 5 minutes, after which a rest was allowed of from 3 to 5 minutes, depending on the subject. Some of the smaller subjects became tired and experienced showed it, but not to run the test in such cases longer than five minutes at a time. If this second test showed two great variants from the first, a third was made, but this was only essential in two or three instances. A few showed rates sufficiently high to warrant suspicion that food had been taken from these were repeated in a later date with more satisfactory results. A few frank abnormals were reported, but with practically the same readings on the checklist. All inquiries as to age and taking of height and weight were deferred until the tests were completed. The Sanborn portable metabolism was used throughout, and careful attention was given to see that the soda lime was fresh and dry and that leakage was avoided. The temperature of the water and apparatus was noted before and after test. Allowances were made for variations of barometric pressure 
and a reliable stopwatch was used for timing. The only outstanding difficulty encountered was due to inability to adapt the usual form of mouthpiece accompanying this instrument to some of the ill-formed mouths, necessitating special modifications. The following stands were used for interpreting the rates. A table is displayed on the page displaying ages, sex, and all standard accepted. Careful consideration was given each individual case to the regularity of respiration, bodily movements, avoidance of tests during premises, instability, etc. The mean rating of boys was 108.2, standard deviation 13.87. That of girls was 111.9, standard deviation 14.12. Following are the numbers below 90, between 90 and 110, and above 110. A table is displayed on the page, listing boys, girls in total, compared to hyper, above 110, normal, 90 to 110, and hypo, below 90. Dr. Moore writes, I believe these figures to be fairly correct. The tests were made by a careful man who was interested in the work. The results seem to indicate that nearly all of these subjects are either normal or hypers as far as metabolism is concerned. Normal means within 10% of the way of the norm for age, height and weight. When the metabolism ratings of these 93 children were compared with their IQs, no significant correlation was formed, although the average IQ is slightly higher for the hyper group than for either of the other groups. The figures are as follows. A table displayed on the page comparing mean IQ for boys, mean IQ for girls, compared to hypo, normal, and hypo. Skin. Conditions of the skin, including vasomotor disturbances, are summarized in the following table. Table 70 is displayed on the page, conditions of the skin. The amount of disagreement in the reports of the two physicians is very marked. Dr. Moore records 85.7% of his cases as normal. Dr. Bronson, 35.1%. Whether slight acne is recorded as an eruption, whether slightly clammy hands is recorded as a vasomotor disturbance, whether skin that is somewhat moist or dry is recorded as abnormal, seems to be largely a matter of the personal equation. Questions addressed to a physician brought the following notes regarding stannis. Dr. Moore, eruption includes acne, eczema, and in particular. Moist, only when apparent to the touch. Dry, only a scaly condition. Turcor, normal unless the case of malnutrition. Sweat, a tendency to respire and droplets during examination. Vasomotor, extreme readiness or cyanosis of extremities. Dr. Bronson, eruption, pityeresis, abla, due to exposure to sun, etc. Is probably not so frequent in Bay Region as in Southern California. Acne vulgaris is common in adolescence. One instance of psoriasis. Dry, malnutrition, especially if due to a chronic illness, produces a dry, rough skin. Turgor, refers to tone or feeling of the flesh. It indicates water content. For example, in a diarrheal baby, the tissue turgor is much diminished. It is not a term of much significance with older children. Sweat, not infrequently, especially in adolescents. The sweat dipped in the axilla during examination. This is most frequent in the nervous type. Vasomotor. A good test of this is the tache cerebral. A line drawn with a nail across the chest produces a red mark, which persists for a considerable time. Blushing is also a sign of vasomotor instability. Dr. Moore reports only two cases of a normal shape of head. One seven-year-old girl with large head and one 11-year-old boy with long, narrow head. He reports bosses for two eight-year-old girls, a table twins. No other cases of abnormalities are reported by Dr. Moore for any of the items in this section. Dr. Bronson reports eight girls and 17 boys as having squarish heads, and four girls and five boys with other abnormalities of shape, making a total of 11% with abnormalities of shape. She reports oily, dry, or coarse hair for 24 girls and five boys, or 9% of her cases. Depression of the fontanelle for 14 girls and 26 boys and other abnormalities of the fontanelle for four girls, making a total of 44, or 14% of all her cases. Urban sutures for one 11-year-old boy, and bosses for 13 girls and 18 boys, or 10% of her cases. Unhealthy scalp conditions for 19 girls and 12 boys, or 10% of her cases. 
The latter conditions are recalled chiefly as dandruff, very dry, very dirty, etc. No significant age differences are noted in the reports of either physician. Hearing. The watch test was used, ordinary Waltham watch, disturbances are recorded, but because of varying acoustic conditions, noise, buildings, etc., these can be considered as only approximately correct. Each physician set a normal range for hearing, also ranges for rough groupings under the following heads, decidedly defective, somewhat subnormal, normal, superacuity. No significant age differences were found. Dr. Moore reports one boy as having decidedly defective hearing in both ears, and two girls as having decidedly defective hearing in one ear. Dr. Bronson reports two boys with decidedly defective hearing in both ears, and one girl with decidedly defective hearing in one ear. Dr. Moore reports 16 boys, 11.5%, and 26 girls, 18.3%, as having somewhat subnormal hearing in one or both ears. Dr. Bronson, 11 boys, 6.2%, and 5 girls, 3.8%. Dr. Moore reports 122 boys, 87.8%, and 114 girls, 80.3%, as having normal or above average acuity of hearing in both ears. Dr. Bronson, 165 boys, 92.7%, and 126 girls, 95.4%. The score reports only 2.3% of gifted with hearing somewhat defective, poor or very poor, as compared to 5.9% of the control group. Ear conditions. Examination of a tympanic membrane was made by Dr. Moore in all cases except seven boys and eight girls. All of these had excellent hearing, hence percentages are based upon total groups. Membrane is reported normal for 133 or 95.7% of the boys, and for 134 or 94.4% of the girls. Abdomalis were recorded as follows. Both drums dull, reflexes obliterated, 1. Drums or canals obscured by wax, 4. One or both drums retracted, 5. One or both drums thickened, 2. One or both drums dull, 2. Dr. Moore reports one boy and one girl with scar left by mastoid operation, and one ten-year-old boy is having probable mastoid trouble at present. He reports no cases of ear discharge. Tympanic membrane was not examined by Dr. Bronson unless there was reason to suspect an abnormal condition. She notes abnormalities, drum thickened, waxen canal, dull reflexes, etc. in 19 cases, 6 girls and 13 boys. Mastoid normal for all girls. Two boys have scars as a result of operation. She reports three cases of ear discharge. Vision. Dr. Moore tested the vision of all his subjects using the Snellen chart. No attempt was made to determine the nature of the visual defects owing to a lack of suitable office room. Vision tests by Dr. Bronson's subjects had to be omitted. Below is a summary of the findings of Dr. Moore. In this summary, where the vision was unequal in the two eyes, the mean is used. There were 15 such cases among the boys and 21 among the girls. Table 71 is displayed on the page. Visual acuity. Of the 64 children with vision, 10 out of 15 or less, 33 boys and 31 girls, 26 wear adequately corrective glasses. Several others wear glasses which do not correct or have glasses which they do not wear. The score reported 20% of gifted group and 16% of control group as having subnormal vision. Eye disorders. Both physicians regularly made note of eye conditions other than vision. Here again, the personal equation of the examiner enters, as Dr. Bronson reports four and a half times as many abnormal conditions as Dr. Moore. In the summary given in Table 72, the sexes have been combined. Dr. Bronson. Blepharitis, a slight crusting of the eyelids, is very common in children, especially in those under par or who have refractive error. Dilatation of the pupils during examination with light in the face is another in which the cause was organic disease. Strabismus, this is definite and the figures should be correct. Dr. Moore, blepharitis not reported unless causing symptoms. Strabismus, all cases reported showing any apparent deviation. Conjunctival injection. Very mild cases so common they were not reported. Table 72 is displayed on the page. Eye defects other than vision. 
Lips, gums, and tongue. Dr. Moore reports no abnormalities of lips, gums, or tongue. Dr. Bonson reports lips normal in 78% of her cases and upper lip short in 19%. Gums are recorded as normal in 75% of all her cases. Gingivitis is recorded for 12%. Spongy gums for 5%. In 8% of her cases, the gums are described as unhealthy, sore, etc. One 12-year-old boy is reported as having receding gums. Abnormal conditions of the tongue are reported for 8 cases. These are large papillae, 3, fissured, 2, coated, 2, large tongue, 1. Soft palate. Dr. Moore reports no abnormalities for the girls of his group. In the case of one boy, the soft palate is much elongated. In another, narrow. And in another, the ovola is missing. Dr. Bronson describes the soft palate as high and narrow in eight cases, four girls, four boys, as high three cases, one girl, two boys, as broad in two cases, one girl, one boy. One ten-year-old boy has an extra uvala. Hard palate. Dr. Moore reports only one abnormality. This is a high arc for an 11-year-old boy. Dr. Bronson reports a total of 116 abnormalities, 47 girls and 69 boys as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing abnormalities to percent of total group. The above figures show that when two exceptionally competent and well-trained physicians examine the hard palates of children, one may report many times as many abnormalities as the other. We have no reason to suppose that abnormalities of hard palate are actually more numerous in the Bay cities of California than in Los Angeles. Second dentition. The number of first teeth and permanent teeth was recorded by both physicians for each child. The following figures show the main numbers for each age. Table 73 is displayed on the page, Progress of Second Dentition. It will be noted that the sex differences in mean number of permanent teeth are not very marked. In Dr. Moore's group, the boys have the larger number of permanent teeth before age 7, and the girls a significantly larger number at 10 and 11. In Dr. Bronson's group, the boys have a slightly larger number below 8, and the girls a larger number at 9, 10, and 11. Condition of teeth. A summary here is for Dr. Moore's group only, as Dr. Bronson omits report for 54 of her 310 cases, and statistics on the remainder would therefore be ambiguous. Table 74 is displayed on the page, condition of the teeth. The dental conditions of these children are very much better than have usually been reported for unselected school children. This is probably due in part to better habits of personal hygiene and to better dental care. Nose. Nasal obstruction and peculiarity of nasal form were noted by both physicians, with the results shown in Table 75. Table 75 is displayed on the page, Frequency of Nasal Obstruction. Pharynx and Tonsils. The two physicians have not recorded their examinations in the same manner. Dr. Bronson has reported the present condition of the pharyngeal cavity. Dr. Moore, the presence or absence of adenoids. Dr. Bronson does not, as a rule, report removal of adenoids. Dr. Moore reports satisfactory removal of adenoids for 55.40% of all boys, with imperfectual removal in the additional 3.6% of the cases. He reports 36.7% of the cases as having no adenoids, and 3.6% with adenoids which are large or pathological. He reports adenoids removed for 37.3% of the girls, which includes one imperfect removal, non present in 57.0%, and large or pathological adenoids in 5.6%. Dr. Bronson's figures for condition of pharynx are as follows. Normal, boys 36.5%, girls 40.9%. Granular, boys 18.5%, girls 21.2%. Catarrhal, boys 17.4%, girls 9.9%. Acutely inflamed, boys 15.7%, girls 18.2%. Underlined without explanation, boys 11.8%, girls 9.9%. The outstanding fact in Table 76 is a large number who have undergone tonsillectomy, more than 50% of the entire group. In this case, physicians agree fairly closely 
The school reports about 44%, the home blank about 49%. Probably not more than 10% of unselected school children in most cities of the United States have had tonsils removed. Table 76 is displayed on the page, condition of tonsils. A striking fact in the above figures is the small proportion of tonsils not removed, which are entirely normal. Condition of thyroid. Conditions of the thyroid were reported by the physicians as follows. A small table displayed on the page, with normal, slightly enlarged, and hyperthyroid compared to the results obtained by Dr. Moore for boys, girls, and total percentages, and Dr. Bronson in boys, girls, and total percentages. There were no cases of hyperthyroidism below 9 years, and only two cases of slightly enlarged thyroid below 8 years. The ages 10 to 13 show the highest incidence of thyroid trouble. Dr. Bronson reports that army records show more than the usual amount of adolescent goiter in the Bay region, which is in harmony with the above figures. In view of the possible influence of thyroid activity upon mental development, it is interesting to compare the IQs of the hyperthyroid cases with those of the gifted group as a whole. There were 14 boys and 24 girls reported as showing appreciable hyperthyroid symptoms. These gave a mean IQ of 156 for the boys, standard deviation 13.5, and 146 for the girls, standard deviation 18.9. Of the above 38 cases, 15 reported as true hyperthyroidism. These gave a mean IQ of 157, standard deviation 13.2. As the mean IQ for the entire gifted group is 152, standard deviation 10, the difference between the hyperthyroid cases and the total group is not statistically significant. Of course, it is necessary to bear in mind the fact that our gifted group, all of whom are within the top 1% of the general school population, represents a very narrow range of intelligence as compared with unselected children, and this might very well mask a true correlation of appreciable amount between intelligence, and degree of thyroid activity. However, if the correlation were very large, we would expect to find the percentage of hyperthyroid cases in our gifted group larger than it is. Comparative data on the frequency of hyperthyroidism among the general child population of the cities covered in the survey are, unfortunately, not available. Both Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson are inclined to believe that it's probably somewhat lower than our gifted group. The expectation that the incidence of hyperthyroidism should be higher among the gifted than in the general population rests upon two facts. One, the well-known connection between creditism and thyroid deficiency. Two, the supposed relationship between thyroid activity and the production of the microsplenic and macrosplenic body types. The microsplenic type is believed to be associated with greater thyroid activity and Nakariti finds that it also tends to be associated with greater intelligence. It should be noted, however, that Nakariti claims but a small correlation between morphologic index and intelligence. Condition of the cervical glands Conditions of the cervical glands were reported as follows. A small table displayed on the page comparing glands normal, enlarged tonsils present, enlarged tonsils removed, Enlarged no statement and total enlarged with percentages obtained between boys, girls, between Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson. The incidence of enlarged cervical glands showed no marked or consistent age differences. It will be noted that the reports of the two physicians agree fairly closely. Cornell makes the following statement regarding the incidence of enlarged cervical glands among the general school population. Because of the great frequency of adenoids and decayed teeth in childhood, the secondary effect, cervical adenitis, is correspondingly frequent. About three-fourths of young school children possessing palpable small glands or kernels. The proportion of a gifted group is a little over 40%. Chest deformities. No statistics are more unsatisfactory than those that relate to the frequency of growth defects. One school visitor may report several times as many as another in examining children of the same school population. The reason, of course, is the indefinite terminology used. Deviations from the ideal human form occur in every degree, and which degree shall be taken as worthy of notice is largely a matter of subjective judgment. In Table 77, it will be seen that Dr. Moore reports 
83.6% of his cases as free from deformities of the chest. Dr. Bronson only 31.6%. Dr. Moore reports an average of 0.24 deformities per child. Dr. Bronson 1.36. Table 77 is displayed on the previous page. Chest deformities. Chest expansion was not measured. The intercoastal angle was checked by Dr. Moore as normal in all cases. Dr. Bronson reports intercoastal angle as follows. Obtuse, boys 36.5%, girls 50%. Acute, 11.8%, boys 15.9%, girls. Right, 50.6%, boys 31.8%, girls. No report, 1.1%, boys 2.3%, girls. Respiration rate. This was taken by Dr. Moore with child in sitting position, by Dr. Bronson with a child in recumbent position. Both physicians took the record near the middle of the examination hour. The means and standard deviation by age are given below. Table 78 is displayed on the page, mean respiration rate by age and sex. Dr. Moore's records for each sex run lower than those of Dr. Bronson at almost every age. This holds both for the mean and for the standard deviation. Since Dr. Moore's records were taken with child sitting, Dr. Bronson's with child laying down. One would have expected a difference in the opposite direction from that which was found. It is possible that one examiner may arouse more excitement in the child that would be caused by another physician. Table 78 shows a marked decrease in respiration rate with age, but no very consistent sex differences. Lung conditions. Dr. Moore reports one 11-year-old girl with possible tubercular lesion and seven boys with abnormal percussion sounds. Of the latter group, he reports two is possibly due to chest deformity. One is due to an old pleurisy, negative to tuberculin test, another which x-ray showed mottling and peribronchial thickening with some calcified glands, negative to tuberculin test. One with asthmatic condition one which may be a cause of latent tuberculosis, and one in which X-ray showed inactive tuberculosis. In another case, X-ray of the chest showed some calcification and enlarged bronchial glands, so there is a possibility of latent tuberculosis, although percussion sounds were normal, and bovine tests were negative. Of these total cases, 96.8% are checked as normal for all lung conditions. Dr. Bronson reports rails, or bronchi, for 8 girls and 21 boys. She finds no tubercular conditions, but reports one boy and one girl with generalized bronchitis. One girl and one boy is asthmatic, one girl with acute bronchitis, and one boy with bronchial asthma. Of her cases, 89.4% are checked as normal for all lung conditions. Heart Dr. Moore reports three cases of functional cardiac murmur among boys and three among the girls. He reports among boys four cases of abnormal heart rhythm, two of arrhythmia, one extra systole, and one respiratory rhythm. Among girls, one case of arrhythmia, and one in which the first sound is not clear. He records 95.7% of all his cases having normal heart conditions, exclusive heart rate, and he reports no cases of serious heart trouble. Dr. Bronson reports one boy and four girls having heart affections of probably congenital origin. One boy and one girl is having had heart affected by rheumatic fever, the girl is said to be well at present except for a slight disturbance of the heart rhythm. One boy and two girls is having acquired heart disease from other causes, and 20 boys and 35 girls is having functional cardiac murmur. She reports disturbances of the heart rhythm for 17 boys and 17 girls. For all of these cases except two, both girls, the report is respiratory rhythm, which she considers as a probable vasomotor origin. The other two cases are arrhythmia, 1, and extrasystole, 1. She reports very rapid heartbeat, 128 for one girl. First sounds rather poor for three boys. She records 78.6% of her boys and 59.8% of her girls as normal for all heart conditions, exclusive heart rate. In all, Dr. Bronson reports more than five times as many deviations from the normal for the heart as are reported by Dr. Moore. Pulse rate. The pulse rate was taken just before or just after respiration rate, by Dr. Moore with child sitting, by Dr. Bronson with child lying down. 
The distributions are irregular and the variability very high. For this reason, the median and 1090 percentile range are used instead of the mean and sigma. The range is not given for the ages 2 to 6 and 14 to 16, owing to a small number of cases at those ages. Table 79 is displayed on the page, pulse rate by age and sex. Table 79 indicates that there is a reduction of 12 or 15 in pulse rate from 6 to 14 years, and there are no marked or consistent sex differences. In general, the figures agree fairly well with those for unselected children. Diaspine sign. The diaspine sign refers to conditions of the bronchial glands. When subject with enlarged or calcified bronchial glands pronounces the vowel E, the sound is audible at lower vertebral positions than when the glands are normal. A stethoscope is used. Physicians do not always agree on the limits of normality with respect to the diaspine sign. Dr. Moore considers the spine below the third dorsal as of possible significance. Dr. Bronson considers the condition normal if the spine sign is not below the fourth dorsal. If at the fifth or sixth dorsal, she considers the glands possibly enlarged. If at the seventh or below, definitely enlarged. Other physicians whom we have questioned have shown similar differences of opinion. The following summary of findings for the gifted group shows a marked sex difference in favour of the girls. No consistent age differences were found. Comparative figures for unselected children are not available. A small table is displayed on the page, comparing symptoms to percentages acquired by Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson. Abdomen. Dr. Moore reports 89.2% of his boys and 87.3% of his girls as entirely normal as far as abdominal conditions are concerned. This includes five cases in which the appendix has been removed and recovery was normal. For 14 girls and 10 boys, he reports liver as more than 1.5 cm below coastal margin. This condition is probably of little significance, since in no case was a liver more than 2 or 3 cm below the coastal margin. Three boys and one girl have tenderness over McBurney's point. One girl has pinworms in the rectum, one girl and one boy have fecal masses on the colon and one boy, small external hemorrhoids. Dr. Bronson reports only 46.6% of her boys and 51.5% of her girls normal as regards abdominal conditions. For the remaining 159 cases, she records a total of 265 abnormal conditions, relatively five times as many as reported by Dr. Moore. These are classified as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing symptoms between girls, boys, and total. Dr. Bronson reports appendix removal with normal recovery for four boys and five girls. Genitals Dr. Moore reports 94.2% of his boys and 38% of the girls who were examined as normal in all respects so far as the genitalia are concerned. However, examination of the girls was made in only 46% of the cases. Of those examined, abnormal conditions were found in 11 cases, or 16.9%. This should not be taken as representative, as examination was made in many cases because of suspected abnormal condition. The 11 cases all showed vaginal discharge as the active symptom. Microscopic examination of the smear was made in 8 of these cases with negative results in 6. In one case, diphthyroids were present. In one, streptococcus and micrococcus catarals. For the boys who reports one case of undescended testicles, one of tight foreskin, one of infantile penis, 12-year-old boy, one case in which the testicles were inclined to retract into the ring. He reports two cases of inguinal scrotal hernia and two cases with scars from former hernia. Of the boys, 62.3% have been circumcised. Dr. Bronson reports 50.5% of her boys and 52.9% of her girls normal as regards genital conditions. Examination of the genitals was not made for 32.5% of the girls, nor for 3.9% of the boys. She reports 15 cases of undescended testicles, including cases of testicles in canals, and 8 additional cases in which the testes are either very small or very large. The scrotum is described as very small in 9 cases, and very large in 4 cases. In 8 cases, minor abnormalities of the penis are reported. 
In 15 cases, the word genitals is underlined without explanation. 48.9% of the boys have been circumcised. Dr. Bronson reports abnormal conditions of the genitals for seven girls, a total of 12 symptoms reported. This is 7.9% of the number examined. Conditions were as follows. Irritated condition of external genitalia, 7. Large clitoris, hymen intact, 2. Circumcised because of smegma, 1. Discharge, probably gonococcal, 1. Swelling of external genitalia, 1. Spinal deformities. Spinal deformities and defects of posture were reported as shown below. Table 80 is displayed on the page, defects of posture. It seems that the differences between the reports of the two physicians are here due in part to a difference in nomenclature. Cases of the kind which Dr. Bronson records as fatigue posture are by Dr. Moore recorded as slight kyphosis. Dr. Moore reports somewhat more than Dr. Bronson as free from all kinds of spinal deformities. Both report only a small number of cases as marked defect. The literature of school hygiene contains innumerable reports on the percentage of school children having spinal deformities, but the results show such a wide disagreement as hardly to be worth quoting. One of the most careful studies, that of Shoulder, Weath and Combe, of 2,314 school children of Lausanne, Switzerland, gave 24.6% with scoliosis and 5.8% with kyphosis or lordosis. The Lausanne figure for scoliosis is considerably higher than that found for old gifted. On the other hand, statistics on spinal deformities in colleges not infrequently show from 60% to 80% with defects of posture. Lloyd T. Brown, for example, reports 80% of half heart freshmen as having unsatisfactory posture. Extremities Dr. Bronson recorded 17% of boys and 9% of girls as having bow legs or knock legs in moderate degree, and 3.3% of boys and 3.8% of girls in marked degree. Dr. Moore reported no cases under this heading. Dr. Moore records 10% of boys and 12% of girls as having either beginning flat foot, some pronation with low arches, or three cases marked flat foot. Dr. Bronson records 62% of boys and 48% of girls as having one of these conditions. However, pronation accounts for more than three-fourths of her positive cases. She records only five cases of marked flat foot in 310 subjects. Dr. Moore reports six other children with minor abnormalities of the fetal legs. Besides a serious case of arthritis to four men's, Dr. Bronson, 22 additional cases, all minor except one showing after effects of infantile paralysis. Dr. Moore reports one boy and one girl whose hands show some trophic disturbances. One girl whose arm and hand and leg muscles are atrophied from arthritis to foremans, and one girl whose arm and hand are paralysed from infantile paralysis. Dr. Bronson reports 16 boys and 13 girls with minor deformities of the arms or hands, such as incurred fingers, clubbed fingers, etc. Subtracting duplications, more than one condition reported for the same child. Only 18.5% of Dr. Bronson's boys and 23.5% of her girls are recorded entirely normal as regards extremities. Of Dr. Moore's cases, 87% of boys and 84.5% of girls are recorded as normal. It should be noted that these classifications do not include facimotor disturbances, all of which were tabulated under skin. Bones Dr. Moore reports all boys as normal. He reports two girls, identical twins, as having deformities due to rickets, and three other girls with minor abnormalities of the bones. Dr. Bronson reports 18.5% of boys and 15.9% of girls as having enlarged epiphysis or abnormalities of the diaphysis. The conditions he reported do not include those which have been reported under deformities of the chest, spine, extremities, etc. X-ray photographs were secured by Dr. Moore for 57 gifted cases selected at random. The measurement of these by Dr. Baldwin have been presented in Chapter 7. Joints Dr. Moore reports 100% of his boys and 98.6% of his girls as normal. Dr. Bronson reports 32% of her boys and 27.3% of her girls as showing hypotonicity of joints. In addition, she reports loose elbow joints for one boy.
loose knee joints probably due to displaced cartilage for another, and apparently no socket at right hip for a third. One girl has the left femur out of socket, causing one inch shortening, and two have stiff finger joints. The word joints is underlined for that explanation for 14 boys and 10 girls. Muscles and tendons. All of Dr. Moore's boys and 97.9% .9 of his girls are reported normal. Dr. Bronson reports 70.2% of her boys and 81.1% of her girls is normal. Practically all of the deviations from normal, which she reports, are minor conditions, described chiefly as muscles not well developed, etc. Neurologic conditions. Neurologic conditions were reported as shown in Table 81. Here the differences between the two physicians are very great indeed. Nearly three times as many are reported, entirely normal by Dr. Moore as by Dr. Bronson. However, the physicians agree in finding tics and habit spasms far more frequent among boys than among girls. This is supported by the home and school data. Table 81 is displayed on the page, Neurologic Conditions. Mental symptoms are reported as follows. A table is displayed on the page, comparing excitable, irritable, excitable and irritable, and recorded as normal, compared to the percentages for boys and girls for Dr. Moore and Dr. Bronson. Endocrine symptoms. Dr. Moore reports for boys 14 other cases of possible endocrine disturbances, such as overweight, tremor of spread fingers, etc., and for girls, 16 cases. Dr. Bronson reports 9 cases of possible endocrine disorder among boys, and 19 among girls. In all, 8.2% of the gifted boys and 11.3% of the gifted girls are reported as having endocrine symptoms. Conditions of urine. The procedure followed by the two physicians is indicated in the following statements. Dr. Moore, albumin test with 3% acetic acid, a few drops in cold urine, then gently heated to the boil to differentiate nuclear and serum albumin and the phosphates. A few drops of the acid added during the heating process, sugar tests with Benedict solution, indican test not called for in examination schedule with HCL, KCLO and chloroform. Dr. Bronson, two specimens, one bought from home, first morning specimen, other office specimen. Trace of albumin in office specimen might easily be less frequent because a rather large proportion of my patients were examined in the morning except on Saturdays. The procedure followed in testing was as follows. 1. Heat urine to boiling. Look for cloudiness. 2. Add about 1.5 to 1 cc of dilute 5% acetic acid. Heat again and look for cloudiness in heated portion. Albumin in PM specimens does not mean kidney disease. It most frequently occurs in, in cases of extreme lordosis and is due to inference with a circulation in the left kidney only. Table 82 is displayed on the page, results of the urine tests. Hemoglobin. The Talquist test was used. Procedure is indicated in the following comments. Dr. Moore, the book used as one patented June 1902 and sold by E.D.W. Pennock, Philadelphia. The second drop was used and read as soon as dry, usually in 20 or 30 seconds. Dr. Bronson, Alas, there are several firms putting out Talquists. Mine is the authorised signed Talquist. It is a colour reading, and even in the acid hematin method, which takes a lot of blood and time, the standard in hospitals is always varying. The lack of objectivity in the haemoglobin test is indicated in Table 83, in which it will be noted that Dr. Moore reports only about 1% is below 75, as compared with approximately 25% reported by Dr. Bronson. Dr. Moore's records were made in such figures as 79, 83, etc. Dr. Bronson's in round numbers by intervals of 10 as 60, 70, 80, etc. In order to allow comparisons, Dr. Moore's data have also been grouped in intervals of 10. Table 83 is displayed on the page. Results of hemoglobin tests. Blood pressure. Dr. Moore, the first half of the cases were done with arm at side, both lying and standing. The last half with arm extended, both lying and standing. In the former, often found a rise in pressure on standing, in the latter, usually a fall. Dr. Bronson, I took the pressure until constant, with a child lying down. The child got off the table and I took the pressure again quickly, this time with Peyton's arm extended towards me, 
or on my knee, in the case of youngest patients who do not hold arms steady. I think the effect of position is of little significance as a test of vasomotor stability. A few seconds in getting the second reading makes much difference, especially in children. Table 84 displayed on the previous page, blood pressure by age in MM. The blood pressure records are summarized in Table 84. Table 84 shows no marked or consistent differences between mean records found by the two physicians. The only consistent sex difference is the tendency of girls to a slightly higher average blood pressure at the ages 12 to 15. The increase with age is marked as would be expected. In the records of Dr. Moore's boys, recumbent position, the Pearson correlation of blood pressure with age was 0.41. In four comparisons out of 10, table 84, for the standard deviation is significantly greater for the age group 12 to 15 than for the age group 9 to 12, and only one in case significantly lower. The following comparative data for girls are taken from Burlage. Table 85 is displayed on the page, blood pressure norms for Ithaca school girls. Systolic readings, sitting position. Blood pressure records are likely to be considerably affected by the emotional factor. Excitement may increase the readings by as much as 30 mm. The records of Burlage were apparently obtained under very favourable conditions. The nurse and school physician who took the records were known to the children, and it was felt that the emotional factor was reduced to a minimum. Burlage's records run a little higher than those for our gifted group for ages 12 to 15, but slightly lower for ages 9 to 12. The conclusion seems to be warranted that gifted children show no significant deviation from unselected children with respect to blood pressure. Summary Medical examinations were given to 783 gifted children, of whom 591 belonged to the main experimental group. The data for these 591 cases have been analysed, yielding the following results, among others. 1. Tests show 6 cases, about 1%, with decidedly defective hearing, and approximately 10% with hearing somewhat defective. 2. Vision tests show 10.8% of boys and 4.9% of girls with 1030 vision or less. 3. The main number of permanent teeth present at 8 years is approximately 11 for boys and 12 for girls. This is perhaps slightly better than normal. The main number before 8 years is higher for boys than for girls. After 8, it is appreciably higher for girls. 4. Between the ages of 8 and 13 years, one or more dental cavities, filled or unfilled, are found in the case of about three-fourths of the boys and two-thirds of the girls. In this age range, the mean number of unfilled cavities per child is approximately 1. 5. Somewhat more than half of the entire group have undergone tonsillectomy. Only about a fourth of the remaining subjects have tonsils which are entirely normal. 6. Hyperthyroidism is found in 6.1% of cases. In this group, there is no significant correlation between hyperthyroidism and IQ. 7. Approximately 43% of the subjects have enlarged cervical glands. 8. About one half of 1% showed symptoms of active or probable active tuberculosis. 9. Mean respiration rate decreases from 21 at age 8 to 18 at age 13, according to Mr. Moore's records. Dr. Bronson's records show a decrease from 23 to 20 in the same period. 10. Mean pulse rate decreases from 83 at 8 years to 81 at 13, according to Dr. Moore's records and from 89 to 83 according to Dr. Bronson's. 11. Dr. Moore records the dyspain sign as present below the sixth dorsal, indicating enlargement of the bronchial glands in 14.4% of boys and 9.9% of girls. Dr. Bronson's figures are 5.6% for boys and 4.6% for girls. 12. Abnormalities of the genitals were rare. 13. Urine tests gave results entirely normal in two-thirds of Dr. Moore's subjects and three-fourths of Dr. Bronson's. There was only one case of marked sugar content. Indicanuria was present in approximately 9% of the cases tested. 14. Using the Talquis hemoglobin test, Dr. Moore finds about 99% of his subjects above 75. The corresponding figure for Dr. Bronson is approximately 74%. This difference may be partially accounted for by the greater amount of sunshine in Los Angeles where Dr. Moore's subjects reside. 15. Metabolism tests of 93 random cases, chiefly from 10 to 13 years of age, 
showed 91.4% normal or above. 16. The blood pressure records are read closely at all ages with the norms of Burl age front selected children in Ithaca, New York. For the ages 9 to 12, they are slightly higher than Burl ages, and from 12 to 15, slightly lower. 17. Marked kyphosis is reported for 2% of the subjects, marked luridosis for 1.3%, and marked scoliosis for but one subject. 18. Comparison of the records of the two physicians shows that the personal equation enters largely into the reports upon skin conditions, eye conditions, other than vision, conditions of the lips, gums and tongue, abnormalities of the heart palate, deformities, heart disease, despite sign, nervous symptoms and haemoglobin. Respiration and pulse records are also subject to constant error due to the personal equation, but to a less degree. On some of the points mentioned in this paragraph, one highly competent examiner will report several times as many cases of defect as another examiner of equal competence. Medical examination methods are less objective than those customarily employed by psychologists in psychometrics. 19. Notwithstanding occasional disagreements in the results, the examining physicians are in accord in the belief that on the whole, the children of this group are physically superior to unselected children of corresponding age in the school population. Dr. Moore, in regard to a general comparison of this group of unselected children, it is my opinion that major and minor defects are much less common in the former. I do not have suitable figures on which to base a comparison as to the relative incidence of various defects, but I have a strong conviction that other things being equal, there is a direct correlation between physical health and mentality in children when studied in groups. In my opinion, the physical superiority of the gifted group is indicated by the higher average of nutrition and by superior stability, physical and mental. Dr. Bronson The examinations of the gifted group were the most satisfactory of any series of examinations I have conducted. The quickness of these children in comprehending what was desired of them in the various tests was a delight. As a whole, there was unusual ability to concentrate attention, and self-consciousness was less noticeable than in the average child. The home care, cleanliness and health habits, such as diet, hours of sleep, etc., indicated superior intelligence on the part of the parents. There were, of course, exceptions to all these points. Physically, also, the gifted child ranked above the average child of the community. Interest in games and outdoor sports was, I should judge, about the same as that of the ordinary child. The greater number of the defects recorded in my reports were minor in degree and such as are found in all civilised peoples. If our standard were as strict as that which we apply to blooded stock, we would find a physical perfection in the human race very rare after early infancy. End of section 9《of Genetic Studies of Genius》Volume 1 — Mental and Physical Traits of a Thousand Gifted Children by Lewis Terman This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Leon Harvey Chapter 10 — School Progress and Educational History Age Grade Status from tables 86 to 88, showing age grade status at the time the children were located, it will be seen that if we use the commonly accepted standard and call a child retarded, who has reached the age of 8 years and is below the second grade, or 9 years and is below the third grade, etc., then there is not a single child in the gifted group of 616 who is retarded. Even if we use a standard which is stricter by a half year, there is still only one retarded. If we call each child accelerated who has reached the low first grade and is not yet six years old, the high first is not yet six and a half, the low second and is not yet seven, etc., then 84.5% of the boys and 82.5% of the girls must be classified as accelerated. The percent of acceleration increases relatively little after the age of seven years, which means that most of the extra gain is made before that age. Tables 87 and 89 show the status of the same 616 children in relation to mental age. Here the situation is strikingly reversed. If we now call a child retarded who has reached the mental age of 7.5 years and is below the second grade, 8.5 years and is below the third grade, etc., 
then all but four of the boys and all but two of the girls are retarded. Table 90 gives the distributions of chronological ages and mental ages by even ages and even grades for the sexes combined. In this case, the lines indicate the somewhat more conservative norms of grade location used by Ares, Strayer and others. Even on this basis, all but 12 of the children are below the grade normal for mental age, while not one is retarded with respect to chronological age. It will be noted that the discrepancy between mean chronological age and mean mental age is 2.8 years in the first grade, and that by the fifth grade the discrepancy is increased to nearly 5 years. Table 86 is displayed on the page, age grade distribution of boys. Table 87 is displayed on the page, mental age and grade distribution of boys. Table 88 is displayed on the page, age grade distribution of girls. Table 89 is displayed on the page, mental and grade distribution of girls. Table 90 is displayed on the page, summary of grade location by age and mental age. School progress quotient. By comparing the age of a child who is in a given grade with the average or median age of the school population in that grade, it is possible to compute a school progress quotient. This was done for all of our gifted children who were enrolled in school grades above the kindergarten at the time of the test. The standard of comparison used was the median ages of the children enrolled in various grades of Oakland in 1921-1922 at midterm. These standard ages were as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing grade to median age. The progress quotient, PQ, of a given child is obtained by dividing the standard age for the child's grade by the child's age reckoned as of the middle of the term. The PQ distributions are given in Table 91. Table 91 is displayed on the page, School Progress Quotients of Gifted Children. The average progress quotient of 114 means that the typical gifted child is accelerated in school, as compared with unselected children, to an extent equal to 14% of his age. This would amount to about one grade of acceleration at age 7, or two grades at age 14. It will be noted that the amount of acceleration of the gifted group reckoned thus is somewhat greater than that indicated by the net gain from skipping. See page 273. This difference is largely accounted for by the earlier entering age of gifted children as compared with normal. The typical gifted child is about 48% of his age above the norm in intelligence and about 14% of his age above the norm in grade location. The difference between 48% and 14% is 34%. From one point of view, we might say that the typical gifted child is underpromoted to the extent of 34%, or approximately one-third of his age. This would mean a retardation of three grades at age 9 and four grades at age 12. It is, of course, conceivable that considerations having to do with social training justify a good deal of underpromotion of gifted children. But as far as mere ability to accomplish is concerned, it will be shown in Chapter 11 that some two-thirds of the underpromotion found with this group is unjustified. Teachers' Ratings on Quality of School Work The school blank, which was filled out for the gifted and also for a control group of unselected children of the ages 8 to 13, asked for a rating of the child's work in each school subject. It will be recalled that the children of this control group were selected from the schools attended by the gifted children, and on the arbitrary basis, which required that they be of exactly normal age grade status. The ratings were secured by the use of the instructions shown in the blank on page 259. Mean ratings were worked out for all ages, and for the sexes separately, to see whether there was any tendency for ratings to increase or decrease with successive years of chronological age. As no such tendency could be observed, ages were combined. However, only the 8 to 13 year old gifted children were included, as these were the only ages represented in the control group. Table 92 gives the age mean for each school subject for each sex and intelligence group. It will be remembered that the plan called for ratings ranging from 1 high to 7 low, with 4 as representing work of average quality. School rating blank is displayed on the page. The school subjects were then listed again, in the order of greatest difference between the mean ratings for the gifted and control groups, Table 93. In the difference values, an abrupt break will be noted 
after number 15, agriculture. The subjects preceding this are those which call primarily for abstract thought, or, as in the case of public speaking dramatics, self-confidence, the ability to adapt oneself to changing circumstances, and quickness of mental processes. Table 92 is displayed on the page, mean ratings on schoolwork in the various subjects. It is clear that gifted children do work of superior quality in those subjects which require abstract thought, but they do only slightly better than average in those subjects which depend primarily upon manual dexterity or special talent. Table 93 is displayed on the page. Order of school subjects with respect to difference in quality of work of gifted and control groups. Even in these subjects, however, they excel the control group to some extent. It is little surprising that reading and arithmetic do not rank somewhat higher than they do in the amount of difference shown between gifted and control groups. In the above comparisons, it should be remembered that the rating is made in comparison with other children of the same school grade, which ordinarily means that the gifted child is being compared with children one or two years older. This should more than counterbalance any possible halo effect entering into the readings. Correlations, Pearson's R's, between the various groups were computed for mean ratings earned in the different subjects. In working these correlations when the sexes were compared, cooking was paired with shop work, and manual training with sewing. The results are as follows. A small table displayed on the page comparing the gifted and control groups. The striking fact is a high correlation between gifted boys and gifted girls. 0.891 as compared with the low correlation for all other pairs. Giftedness is evidently far more potent than sex in determining relative sex in the different school subjects. Table 94 shows for each subject the percent of ratings which were high, 1 or 2, and the percent which were low, 6 or 7, as would be expected. The difference between gifted and control are more obvious in the extremes than in the means. Additional information on subjects in which weakness was shown was obtained from the questions given below. If child is especially weak in any subjects, give reason. If any reason is known to you, school blank. 2. 8. The following percents were reported. Weak in one or more subjects. Gifted boys, 22%. Gifted girls, 15%. Control boys, 30%. Control girls, 18%. The gifted are weakness in the subjects would require manual dexterity. Writing, art, and handwork account for 68% of the weaknesses reported for the gifted as against 16% for the control. The controlled children are most often weak in the subjects requiring abstract thought. Arithmetic, reading, English, and history account for 61% of the weaknesses reported for the control as against 17% for the gifted. Girls more often than boys were weak in arithmetic and history and boys more often than girls in art and reading. This agrees fairly well with the distribution of low ratings in Table 94. The number of weaknesses reported was not large enough to give reliable rank orders of the subjects for the sex and intelligence groups. Table 94 is displayed on the page, percent of high and low ratings on school work in the various subjects. The reasons given by teachers for weakness in the various subjects were tabulated separately for the gifted and controlled groups by sex and subject as follows. A table is displayed on the page comparing the reasons stated with gifted and control. Is child's mental ability very even, ordinarily even, rather uneven, very uneven? Underline. Home blank 2, 20. School blank 4, 2. Table 95 is displayed on the page, evenness of ability. Outstanding facts in the above table are the following. 1. A high percentage of gifted, as compared with control, are rated as very even. The ratio is almost 3 to 1. 2. The school rates 5.6% of the gifted, as compared with 10.4% of the control, as either rather uneven or very uneven. This is the ratio approximately of 1 to 2. 3. Girls are rated as very even more than boys, and someone less, often as very uneven. 4. The ratings of school and home on the gifted degree very closely with regard to numbers reported in each category. The above data have only suggested value, as many discrepancies and inconsistencies were found. 
In chapter 12, it is shown on the basis of test results that gifted children have about the same tendency to unevenness as unselected children of corresponding school grade or of corresponding mental age. Question 4, 3 in the school blank, and 2, 21 in the home blank, asking in what respects ability was especially strong or especially weak, was so frequently misunderstood that the results could not be used. Could child do schoolwork and average ability? If promoted to a higher grade now, and given a certain amount of coaching on the subject matter skipped, if so, in what grade is highest? School blank 2, 5. The results are given in Table 96. Table 96 is displayed on the page, Extra Promotion Merited. The most striking facts brought out are, 1. In the judgment of the teachers, 82% of the gifted group are prepared to do the work of a higher grade, as compared with 40% of the control group. 2. At the extra grade advancement, which these 82% of gifted children are said to merit, is 1.4 half grades, or about 3 quarters of a grade. The corresponding figure for the 40% of the control group who are said to merit extra promotion is 0.5 of a half grade, or 1 quarter of a grade. If overpromotion had also been taken account of, the difference between the two groups would have been even more pronounced. The teachers were not asked to report on those children who, in their opinion, were already advanced beyond their ability, since the gifted group, 82%, are reported able to do work of a higher grade, while of the control group only slightly over 40% are so reported. It follows that, to take an extreme illustration, even if no children were correctly graded, only 18% of the gifted group could be graded too high, while of the control group nearly 60% might be Educational History The data on educational history have come chiefly from the Home Information Blank, which devoted two pages to the subject. Such reports cannot, of course, be taken as entirely accurate for individual children, but for the group as a whole, they are believed to be fairly dependable. There is every evidence that, as a rule, the blanks were filled out with painstaking conscientiousness. In some of the blanks, a few of the questions were not answered but the percent of total for whom that question is answered is usually 85% and 95%. As the home blank was not filled out for a control group, the only comparative data available are such as may be found in educational literature. It will be understood that the figures given in the following pages relate to the 643 children of the main experimental group. Did child attend kindergarten? When and how long? Home blank. 2. 1. Reports for 314 boys and 258 girls. Answer is yes for 62.4% of boys and 60.1% of girls. Of 351 who had attended kindergarten, the length of attendance was stated for all except 14. The mean length of attendance was 5.9 months for boys and 5.5 months for girls. This is slightly more than half a school year. Age of entering school above kindergarten. Grade first entered. Home blank 2-2. Two, two. The first part of this item was answered for 541 cases, the second part for 533. As shown in Table 97, the mean age of entrance was about six and a quarter years. Table 97 is displayed on the page, age of entering school and grade first entered. Name and location of schools child has attended, including kindergarten. Home blank 2, 5. The ranges and means of the number of schools attended by children of the different ages Sexes combined are as follows. A small table split on the page comparing age, range, and mean. The one child who attended 11 different schools in 6 different cities in 3 different states was at the age of 11 years 3 months, finishing the work of the low 7th grade with decidedly better than average standing in all major subjects. His poorest work, according to the teacher's report, is in writing and physical training, in each of which he is graded as low average. He has attended school above kindergarten a total of five years and has skipped three half grades. He did not learn to read before starting to school and has had no home instruction in any of the regular school subjects, although over the past five years he has had private lessons in French in addition to his school work. The teacher reports that he might safely be advanced another year in school. Such cases, there were several others, almost as striking as this one, suggest that changes of schools, which so often reported in educational literature, as one of the main cases of retardation, may be a very minor factor compared with native ability. Gifted children are doubtless able to adapt themselves more readily than normal children to a new environment, and it is even possible that the benefits which the children of our group have received from such changes in the way of broadened experience and interest 
outweigh the usual disadvantages. This might not be true of normal children. The data on name and location of schools attended were secured primarily for use in the special study of individual cases and need not be summarized here. Average number of school days missed in a year, rough estimate. Any long absences, how long? Reasons for regularity, home blank 2, 6. The results are as follows, the average estimated number of days missed. A table displayed on the page comparing the number who answered, total range of days missed, median, mean, and standard deviation for boys, girls, in total. The question regarding long absences was answered for 521 cases. For 55% of these, it is reported that no long absences have occurred. For 45%, absences varying in length from two weeks to one and a half years are reported. Of long absences reported, the length of 22% is not stated. In 57% of the cases, the absence was less than three months. In 15%, from three to six months. And 6% over six months. A slightly higher percentage of long absences are reported for boys than for girls. Reasons for irregularity are given in 223 cases as follows. A table split on the page comparing the reason, illness, illness in family, travelling, change in schools, head of class, miscellaneous, compared to the number of cases and percent. Has attendance been very regular? Fairly regular, rather irregular, very irregular, underline, school blank 4, 7. The data from this question are available for the school group, as well as for the gifted. The results show no significant difference between gifted and control, or between boys and girls. A small table is displayed on the page, comparing the control for boys and girls, and the gifted boys and girls, between cases reported, and percentage for regularity. Liking for school, very strong, fairly strong, slight liking, positive dislike, underline. If school has been disliked at any time, why? Home blank 2, 7. Small tables displayed on the page comparing gifted boys and girls, and all gifted, with cases reported and the percentage of liking. Only 5 of the 564 children in the gifted group are reported as positively disliking school. Very strong liking for school is more common among girls than among boys. The reasons for dislike, however, disclose no sex difference. The following reasons are reported. Disliked teacher, 39 times reported. Daily monotony, Eight times reported. Change of school, three times reported. Work too elementary, six times reported. Work too difficult, two times reported. Timidity, two times reported. Miscellaneous, including distance from school, overcrowded conditions, prefers to play, dislikes compulsion, etc. Eighteen times reported. These seem to be entirely normal reasons. Describe child's attitude towards school. School blank two, seven. In order to treat the heterogeneous mass of descriptive matter, including under-answers to this question, it was necessary to condense and categorize the replies. In deciding upon categories, the principle followed was, first, to adhere to the original wording wherever possible, and secondly, where answers were too long to permit this, to select the key word of the sentence, an adjective as a rule, and to categorize under this. The responses to this question are probably quite as much subjective as objective and indicate the teacher's attitude toward the children as much as the children's attitude toward school and the teacher. They are nonetheless interesting on this account. It will be noted, Table 98, that the sex difference is somewhat greater than the intellectual difference. Other points of interest are 1. The excessive gifted to over-control described as excellent, enthusiastic, eager to excel, or inattentive. 2. The excess of control over gifted described as lacking interest or showing unsatisfactory attitude. 3. That undesirable attitudes are twice as prevalent in the control group as in the gifted group. 4. That no gifted girls are described as inattentive, but that five gifted boys are so described. Table 98 is displayed on the page, Attitude Towards School, as described by teachers. Did the child learn to read before starting to school? At what age? How? Amount and kind of help. Home blank. 2. 12. Of 300 boys for whom report was made, 44.3% learned to read before starting to school. Of 252 girls, 46.4%, the more or less exact age of learning to read, is reported for 246 cases. Table 99. Probably the way in which the question is worded accounts for the fact that less than half the parents gave the age of learning to read, 
For the most part, those who reported that the child did not learn to read before starting to school did not answer the second part of the question. Since so little precise information is obtainable as to how long a period elapses after entering school before the average child may be said to have learned to read, and still less information as to what would be the corresponding time for gifted children, any statistical work based upon such information as we have would be extremely inaccurate. We can say, however, that at least 113, 20.5% of the 552 children learn to read before the age of 5, 34, 6.1% before 4, and 9, 1.6% before 3. Table 99 is displayed on the page, Age of Learning to Read. On the last part of the question, Amount and Kind of Help, answers were received for 197 children. This question applies only to the children who are reported as having learned to read before entering school. In a large majority of cases, only incidental or casual assistance is reported. In five cases, the child had a private tutor, and in no case for more than a half hour daily. In 17 cases, the child is said to have taught himself, without the knowledge of any member of the family, until it was suddenly discovered the child could read. By playing with books, pictures, or newspapers is a rather frequent answer. Very informal assistance from some member of the household, usually the mother, is reported for 129 cases. In many cases, it is specified that this help was given only in response to urgent solicitations on the part of the child. Underline each half grade skipped, 1B, 1A, 2B, 2A, 3B, 3A, 4B, 4A, 5B, 5A, 6B, 6A, 7B, 7A, 8B, 8A, home blank, 2, 3. Underline each half grade repeated, 1B, 1A, 2B, 2A, 3B, 3A, 4B, 4A, 5B, 5A, 6B, 6A, 7B, 7A, 8B, 8A, home blank, 2, 4. A small table is displayed on the page comparing boys, girls and total to the number of cases reported, percent who have skipped, percent who have repeated, mean net gain in half grades, median net gain in half grades. The mean net acceleration is based upon the number of half grades skipped minus the number repeated. By the following figures it will be seen that the mean net acceleration increases very little after the age of seven years. A small table is displayed on the page comparing Ages to mean net acceleration of boys, for girls, maximum net acceleration for boys, and the maximum net acceleration for girls. The important fact in the above figures is that the average net gain by skipping grades is only about one school grade, and that nearly all of this gain is made before the age of eight years. After eight years, the net gain is more likely to increase with girls than with boys. The above figures agree very well with the data presented in the first section of this chapter. Have you encouraged the child to forge ahead in school, allowed him to go his own pace or held him back? Why? Home blank. 2. 9. This question was answered by 550 parents, of whom 396 gave reasons for their attitude. The data are as follows. Have encouraged child to forge ahead? 106 or 19.3%. Have allowed child to go his own pace? 392 or 71.3%. Have held child back? 52 or 9.4%. A table is displayed on the following page with three sections, reasons given for encouraging rapid progress, reasons given for allowing own pace, reasons given for holding child back. There may possibly be some significance in the fact that only 51% of the first group give a reason for the course which they report they have followed, as compared with 75% of the second group and 96% of the third group. It is clear, however, that a large majority of our subjects have not been subjected to hothouse methods, and that this factor does not account for their school acceleration or for their high scores in the intelligence test. Average number of hours a week devoted to home study of school lessons during the last year. Home blank 2, 8. Reports were received for 271 boys and 221 girls. Tables 100 and 101 give the results separately by age and sex. It is interesting to note the marked sex difference and the large number of cases in the zero column. It would appear that home study has not played a very large part in the almost universally good school records of these children. The mean for the entire group is less than two hours a week. The variability, however, is unusually large. In general, the girls do more than twice as much home study as the boys. 
Table 100 displayed on the page. Hours a week in home study of school lessons. Gifted boys. Table 101 is displayed on the page. Hours a week at home study of school lessons. Gifted girls. Private tutoring. Out of school. Home blank. 2. 11. After the question were blank spaces for recording information on tutoring and music, drawing, painting, dancing, language and other subjects. The information called for included age at which the instruction was taken, hours a week including practice, and a rating of the ability shown as very superior, superior, average, inferior, or very inferior. Of the 597 in the main group for whom home blanks were received, private tutoring was reported for 338, or 56%. For the girls, the proportion was 72%. For the boys, 44.4%. Those who had private tutoring devoted to it an average of 6.5 hours a week, including practice. Failure to reply to this question was taken to indicate that no private tutoring had been received, as this interpretation seemed valid in most cases. The above figures, however, may be somewhat too low. Even so, it would take a considerable stretch of the imagination to ascribe the superior intellectual development of these children to the results of private tutoring. Following is a detailed summary of the reports. Table 102 is displayed on the page, Amount and Results of Private Tutoring. In the following spaces, put down a rough guess at the average number of hours a week of instruction child has received from members of the household, at the ages indicated. Home blank 2, 10. After the question were spaces for such records for ages, 2 to 3, 4 to 5, 6 to 7. Kinds of instruction mentioned after the question were telling stories or reading to child, teaching to read and write, number work, and nature study. This question has been answered so incompletely as to make statistics misleading. Parents in many instances report that it is impossible for them to make even an approximate estimate, as the time spent in this way was so incidental and varied so much from day to day. In a large percentage of cases, the question has been left unanswered. In the meantime, it worked out for those answering the question, omitting those cases for whom it was not answered. The figures would be too high. If the cases for whom the question was not answered were counted as zero, the mean would be too low. In the 595 blanks which have been returned, the largest number of replies to the first part of the question, telling stories or reading a child, at any of the three age periods, for which the report is asked, is 380. The second part, teaching child to read to write, the largest number of replies is 151. To the third part, number work with child, the largest number of replies is 146. To the fourth part, nature study work with child, the largest number of replies is 98. These figures seem to indicate that the majority of cases failure to reply should be interpreted as indicating that no time was spent in this way, since the above order corresponds roughly, at least, to what one would expect in the way of negative responses. It is probable, however, that such is not always the case, and that to interpret the entire group of failures to reply in this way would be to introduce a considerable element of error. As child shown very superior ability with respect to a. general intelligence, age when first noted, how shown, similarly for music, arithmetic, or mathematics, science or nature study, mechanical ingenuity, drawing or painting, dramatics, dexterity and handwork. Home blank 2, 19, table 103, gives the results for the 614 children for whom home blanks were received, 334 boys and 280 girls. The yes and no columns giving percents of total are perhaps the most significant. Among the outstanding facts are the following. 1. Girls more often than boys have shown superior ability in dramatics, music, and dexterity in handwork. 2. Boys more often than girls have shown superior ability in mechanical ingenuity and, to a slight extent, in arithmetic or mathematics. Apart from general intelligence, superior ability is most often shown in arithmetic or mathematics in the case of both boys and girls. 4. In 8% of cases, both boys and girls, the parents definitely state that they had not observed any indications of superiority in general intelligence. This rather surprising fact is probably accounted for by the highest standard of intelligence which prevails in the home. Table 103 is displayed on the page. A portion of gifted reported by parents as showing various kinds of superior ability. The reports regarding age at which superior abilities were first shown are summarised in Table 104. 
1. The sex differences are here relatively small, but the lines which superior ability is noted somewhat earlier with the boys than with the girls include music, arithmetic or mathematics, drawing or painting, and dexterity in handwork. These girls tend to show superior ability earlier in general intelligence, science or nature study, and mechanical ingenuity. 2. Considering both sexes, the order shown by the various abilities for precocity is first, general intelligence, may in about 3.5 years, second, music, may in about 4.9 years, third, all their abilities, mean from about 5.75 to about 6.25 years. Table 104 is displayed on the page. Age when various superior abilities were first noted. 3. The sex differences in variability with respect to the age at which the various abilities are noted are too small to be very significant and not uniform in direction. The descriptions which the parents give of the early indications of superiority are usually couched in such general terms as to be less enlightening than one could wish. However, the tabulations are given for what they may be worth. The miscellaneous group includes all the indications which were not mentioned for as many as 5% of the children in either sex for whom the special ability had been noted. Table 105 displayed on the page, early indications of superior ability. The table is divided between eight sections comparing boys and girls. General intelligence, music, arithmetic or mathematics, science or nature study, mechanical ingenuity, drawing or painting, dramatics, dexterity and handwork. What theories or ideas of child training have guided your educational efforts with a child? Please answer fully. For example, indicate what principles or rules have guided you in regard to each of the following. A. Answering child's questions. B. Stimulating desire to learn. C. Other matters you have considered important. Home blank 2, 16. This question is of interest only as showing general trends of thought. Replies have been rather loosely categorised, and the categories are arranged in order of frequency of occurrence. No further statistical treatment seemed worthwhile, as the chief value of the question lies in its import for the individual child, rather than for the group as a whole. No age or sex divisions seemed advisable. Several replies have often been given to the same part of the question, especially part C. Therefore, the total number of replies does not coincide with the number of children for whom the question was answered. Many parents failed to answer the question at all. Many others answered part A only. A few answers in cases where the meaning was not clear were thrown out. Table 106 is displayed on the page. Summary and Conclusions 1. The average gifted child enters school above the kindergarten at six and a quarter years. Three-fifths have previously attended a kindergarten. The average length of such attendance has been a little more than half a school year. Low first grade is skipped by 21% of the children, and the entire first grade by 10%. 2. According to the usual standards, about 85% of the gifted children are accelerated, and not one is retarded. The average progress quotient is 114, which means that the average gifted child is accelerated 14% of his age. The average PQ is somewhat higher than this for the younger children, and somewhat lower for the older. Approximately 85% have skipped one or more half grades, as compared with 4% who have repeated. The main net gain from skipping is one full grade. According to the testimony of the teachers, the average gifted child merits additional promotion to the extent of 1.3 half grades, or about two-thirds of a grade. In all, 82% are said to merit some additional promotion. 3. The discrepancy between mean age and mean mental age of gifted children in the first grade is 2.8 years. In my grade 5, this has increased to nearly 5 years. 4. Teachers' ratings of schoolwork show that the gifted children, as a rule, are doing work of superior quality in the grade where they are located. The superiority is greatest in thought subjects, as near zero in such subjects as penmanship, sewing, manual training, games and sports. 5. Two and a half times as many gifted as controlled children are rated as very even in mental ability, but twice as many of the gifted group are rated as very uneven. The girls are rated as uneven somewhat less often than the boys. 6. Our gifted children have, on the average, attended two different schools by the age of 8 years, and three by the age of 11. 7. 
The mean estimated number of days of absence from school during a year is 12. 8. Only 1% of the gifted are reported by parents as having a positive dislike for school. With 4% more, the liking is slight. It is very strong with 54% of the boys and 70% of the girls. 9. According to the school reports, less than half as many gifted as controlled children display an undesirable attitude towards school. 10. Nearly half of the gifted children learn to read before starting to school. At least 20% and probably considerably more learn to read before the age of 5 years. At least 6% before 4 and at least 1.6% before 3. Most of these learn to read with little or no formal instruction. 11. Roughly 70% of the parents say they have allowed the child to go his own pace in school. 20% have encouraged rapid progress and 10% have held the child back. 12. The average gifted child does about two hours of homework per week on school lessons. Somewhat more than half the group have private lessons in such special subjects as music, drawing, painting, dancing, language, etc. Those who take such lessons devote an average of six and a half hours a week to them, including practice. 13. Parents reported indications of superior ability in arithmetic in the case of almost half of the group. The proportion was about a third for music, and so at less for dramatics and drawing or painting. The parents of 8% report that they have never observed in their children any indications of superior general intelligence. For the others, the average age at which intellectual superiority was first noted was about three and a half years, 3.7 for boys and 3.25 for girls. Musical ability first appeared at an average of five, and the other special abilities had an average age of six. 14. The indications of superior intelligence most often noted were quick understanding, insatiable curiosity, extensive information, retentive memory, early speech, unusual vocabulary, etc. 15. Very few of the parents have carried out any systematic scheme of child training, but a majority have encouraged the child by answering his questions and taking interest in the things which concern him. 16. Although the home environment of the gifted children has been, on the whole, above the average, nothing has been found to warrant the belief that the superior intellectual attainments of a gifted group are in any considerable degree the product of artificial stimulation or forced culture. End of section 10